Introduction to The Red Rain, The True Story of an Adventurous Year in Russia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynette Calkins, Monument, Colorado. The Red Rain, The True Story of an Adventurous Year in Russia by Kellogg Durland. Introduction. The Russian Revolution is one of the vital issues of the world today. The political revolt, presenting as it does so many unique and dramatic developments, tends to distract the attention of the world from the broader, deeper, and certainly not less important phases of the movement which are found in the social and economic upheaval. The working out of these forces, political, social, economic, in one stupendous movement, constitutes one of the great revolutions of history. Revolution implies absolute change. Whether civil war or intense parliamentary struggle, or both, is the method of accomplishment, is of small consequence. The ultimate outcome is the same. The present movement of the Russian people toward a changed condition of life is but the manifestation of underlying forces of history and destiny to which all nations must yield. Revolution in Russia during the first quarter of the twentieth century is as inevitable as the bursting of a Pele or a Vesuvius, as inexorable and pitiless as an earthquake or the passing of ancient empires. Revolutions are not made. They are not built upon the propaganda of a political or economic cult. They do not depend upon the will of men, whether rulers or parliaments, as do wars. Revolutions are the result of internal unwholesomeness, disease rooted in the body politic, too deep to be poulticed out by ameliorating reforms. The Russian Revolution would be viewed as a world catastrophe were it not that the disease— of which the revolution is but a symptom, is infinitely more of a world menace. That disease is autocracy. Autocracy is a system of government incompatible with 20th century civilization. Reforms which are reconcilable to Russian autocracy are inadequate to meet the present needs of the Russian people, and the meeting of these needs necessitates reforms of such far-reaching and radical a nature that autocracy cannot admit them and continue to exist. Further, certain reforms and fundamental requirements are now so demanding and so acute that autocracy cannot much longer stand out against them. The period of transition from autocracy to constitutionalism, republicanism, or whatever the ultimate form of government accepted in Russia shall be, we call revolution. The word has no arbitrary meaning. It simply designates a period of national upheaval and struggle. In this sense, the Russian Revolution may be said to have come to a head on Bloody Sunday, January 22, 1905, and will culminate only with the capitulation or overthrow of autocracy. The abyss toward which the Russian government is now tending is but the nemesis of history. The constitution which was wrung from the hands of the emperor on the 30th of October, 1905, when the rising tide of revolution threatened the very palace gates, is being gradually modified and withdrawn piecemeal, and if the emperor has his way, not a vestige of it will long remain. The fundamental rights of men, which it pretends to guarantee the Russian people, are as non-existent in the Russia of 1906 as they were in 1806, before the first faint mutterings of the coming storm had been heard. Not one, but all, of the guaranteed rights of that manifesto have been withdrawn under so-called temporary laws and regulations, and under the cloak of military law. The rights of free speech, writing, assemblage, inviolability of person and home, still remain utopian dreams of a distant day. This manifesto clearly and unequivocally guaranteed, quote, freedom of conscience, freedom of speech, freedom of association, freedom of public assembly, and real inviolability of personal rights, end quote. And yet, of the approximately 486 members of the First Duma, the chosen representatives of the Russian people, one, Professor Herzenstein, 
has been murdered by the Black Hundred, one priest excommunicated, two members have been beaten, ten are in hiding, five have been exiled, twenty-four are in prison, thirty-three have been arrested and searched, and one hundred and eighty-two are under indictment on the charge of treason. An obviously anomalous situation. Quote, if a strong central government becomes disorganized, if inefficiency or idleness or above all dishonesty once obtain a ruling place in it, the whole government body is diseased. Close quote. No modern state, save Turkey, is more universally honeycombed with official inefficiencies and corruption than Russia, and even Turkey's central government today represents more solidity than the Russian. The only possible justification for despotism of any character is in its actual power and in its fruits. Military despotism in Russia not only broke down, but was hopelessly shattered by the inglorious and ignominious war with Japan. The hold that autocracy once maintained on the Russian people then loosened. It has been steadily weakening ever since Tsushima and the fall of Port Arthur, followed by the shadow of Mukden, which passed westward across the empire. Dishonesty and corruption stamps every one of Peter's fourteen bureaucratic ranks. The war disclosed an enormous extent of thievery in all departments of the service. Especially sensational revelations came to light in connection with the Red Cross, where the funds were most flagrantly misappropriated, a portion of the spoils even going to the Grand Dukes. So recently as January 1907, the Assistant Minister of Interior, Gorko, was involved in one of the most outrageous scandals in all the annals of Russian corruption, namely the misappropriation of a large percent of one of the all-too-inadequate appropriations of money for the relief of the starving peasants. A state eaten with official rottenness, an emperor attempting not only to rule but to do the thinking for 142 millions of people, an economic condition of such a character that annual famine falls like a pall over vast areas, in the winter of 1906-7, to taking within its grasp 30 million of men, women, and children, an army spotted with disaffection, a navy almost chronically mutinous, a people held in artificial tranquility through the terrorism of martial law, which now spreads over four-fifths of European Russia, a critical financial situation, impending bankruptcy within, and the largest foreign loan in history to eventually meet, these are some of the elements of the Russian situation of the present time, which must be met by reforms involving changes so complete as to amount to revolution. At the beginning of 1907, probably 90% of the people of Russia were opposed to the present government, for during the past two years, even the peasants have had opinions of their own, based on their loss of faith in the little father. But reigning circles have all of the organized armed force of the country at their command, and so peculiarly effective is the system of discipline employed that against the unarmed population even of overwhelming superiority in point of numbers, this position is tenable for a surprising time. On the other hand, a trifling incident might turn the scales on a night. In a phrase used by Professor Milyakov, the Russian situation today presents, quote, an incompetent government opposed by a thus far incapable revolution, end quote. The government, unable itself to administer or to rule, is yet able to disorganize the ranks of revolution and to terrorize into inactivity a large portion of the country. The revolution, at the same time, while unable to muster open organization of fighting strength sufficient to overthrow the government, is able to harass and embarrass the government at every point and gradually to force it further and further into an impasse from which it can never emerge. During the year 1906, according to official figures, more than 36,000 people were killed and wounded in revolutionary conflict. Over 22,000 suffered in anti-Semitic outbreaks, most of which were promoted by governmental agents. Over 16,000 so-called agrarian disorders occurred. 
political arrests were so constant that during at least two months of the year, January and July, the aggregate number of men and women dragged from their homes and imprisoned or exiled was estimated at 25,000 per month. Late in the summer of 1906, Premier Stolypin inaugurated the Drumhead Field Courts Martial, which became immediately so active that according to an official statement issued on March 5, 1907, 764 persons had been executed, an average of five daily. These figures loom large indeed when it is recalled that in France, during the Terror, only 2,300 heads fell from the guillotine block, and that during the entire French Revolution, only about 30,000 lives were sacrificed. Here is a clear indication of constant activity on both sides. In spite of this loss of life, this spent and often misspent energy, unnumbered crimes against generations unborn, it must be admitted that the progress of revolution is never comparably swift to the movement of wars. By the very nature of revolutionary struggles, they must drag. In England, the revolution lasted from 1640 to 1689. In France, twelve years of constant conflict and struggle were followed by decades of unrest and periodic disturbance. In Italy, the fight dragged on from 1821 till 1870, and so will the Russian Revolution be prolonged. Compared with the revolutionary movements of history, however, Russia is making rapid progress. The stupendousness of the Russian situation, with a heterogeneous population of 142 million of people scattered over an empire which includes one-sixth of the territory of the world, makes an almost unreckonable problem, infinitely more vast and more complicated than the situation in France in 1789. There are many available books in English, French, and German which present the conditions of Russia on the eve of revolution. The task which I assume is to present a picture of Russia in revolution. The year 1906 may be accepted as a typical revolutionary year. Between January and December of that year, I traveled through every section of European Russia, Poland, and the Caucasus, and a part of western Siberia. Of the spectacular and dramatic events which characterized the year, I witnessed not a few— but the really significant features of the year are the not less intense phases of the social and economic disturbances, and these I aim to make clear to the average reader. In thus attempting to present, as it were, a cross-section of the revolution, I undertake not so much a difficult task as one which demands peculiar opportunities and advantages. To forestall natural queries, therefore, I may be permitted to state that my own point of view has been uniquely varied. Shortly after my arrival in St. Petersburg, influential friends, affiliated with the court, made it possible for me to join a group of fourteen Cossack officers who were about to journey through the Caucasus. Most, if not all, of these men had formerly been officers of guard regiments and had been temporarily assigned to a Cossack regiment for the war, in order that they might have opportunity to distinguish themselves, thus paving the way for speedy promotion." The commander of the regiment, who was the chief of our party, was an aide-de-camp to the Tsar. My particular host was a Georgian prince who has since rejoined his regiment, which is attached to the person of the empress. To be an officer, or even by birth a member of the court party, does not naturally preclude liberal or even revolutionary sympathies, but it so happened that all of the officers who made up this little company were staunch supporters of the Tsar and of autocracy. All that I witnessed of race clashes, of the pacification of insubordinate villages, the devastation of districts which should have been fertile and prosperous, of pillage and loot, and the violation of the laws and customs adopted by civilized nations for international warfare, I witnessed, as it were, from the inside. Protected by the officer's uniform which I wore, I rode with the Cossacks, entered their barracks freely under circumstances where any ordinary traveler would not have been permitted to have passed the lines. I was even accorded the privilege of using my camera at will. Through Great Russia and the provinces, I passed as an ordinary traveler, provided with the usual letters of sanction and permits from central and local authorities, but without special introductions. In St. Petersburg and Moscow, during the session of the First Duma, 
I cultivated the acquaintance of the intellectuals, who at that time bade fair to be a dominant force in Russia, men of the type of Professor Paul Milyakov, Maxim Kovolevsky, Dr. Loris Melikov, and other thinkers and scholars who would, if they could, lead Russia through her period of regeneration and reorganization by confining the struggle to the halls of Parliament, dreading as they do and distrusting bloodshed and civil war. After the disillusion, I affiliated almost entirely with the avowedly revolutionary parties. I cultivated members of the military organization and with them visited the barracks at Kronstadt and elsewhere where I witnessed conspirative revolutionary meetings of soldiers and sailors. Through the courtesy of a local governor, I was permitted to visit in prison the most noted terrorist of the year in Russia, Marie Spiridonova, and later, through my revolutionary connections, I established communications with the more active fighting organization known to the world as the Terrorists. With their introductions, as well as with the introductions given me by the constitutionalists of the Duma, in the late summer and early autumn I traveled eastward through Great Russia, across the tremendous famine belt, past the Urals, and entered Siberia, returning to St. Petersburg across Perm, Vyatka, and Vologda, provinces of northern Russia. My sole aim during all these journeyings was to acquire as nearly as I could an accurate picture of Russia in revolution. My purpose now is to present as nearly an accurate and truthful a picture of what I saw and of what I learned as possible. When one has witnessed at close quarters the devastations of villages by the army, when one has seen with his own eyes unarmed men, women, and children of tender years shot by soldiers, torn and maimed by swords and bayonets, when one has acquired absolutely an overwhelming proof of official responsibility for massacre, when one has seen homes burned indiscriminately and merely suspected revolutionists exiled without even the forms of a trial, one cannot speak with any degree of sympathy for the government which stands behind all of these things. Yet I strive to the uttermost to be fair to that side and to present as cogently as one can the elements of truth to which the government still clings. The point of view throughout is that of an American who is not unmindful of the dramatic elements of the fight, nor of the picturesque and frequently romantic environments of the struggle. At the same time, it is of one whose deepest interest lies in the social and economic causes which lie at the bottom of the whole vast movement, and whose previous training has fitted him to watch with a clearer perception, perhaps, than is usually given to the casual traveler or newspaper correspondent, the progress of the social and economic development through this period of storm and stress. End of the Introduction to the Red Rain The True Story of an Adventurous Year in Russia Section 1 of The Red Rain, The True Story of an Adventurous Year in Russia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynette Calkins, Monument, Colorado. The Red Rain, The True Story of an Adventurous Year in Russia by Kellogg Durland. Chapter 1. Into the Shadow. The wave of revolution which swept over Russia in the year of grace 1905 culminated in a series of insurrections during that week of December which is celebrated throughout the Western world in sacred memory of the birth of the Prince of Peace. As the dawn of 1906 crept reluctantly across the torn and disintegrating empire of the Tsars, there was inaugurated a reign of reaction unparalleled since the melancholy days of 81, which followed the assassination of Alexander II. Russia named this period of shadow the Repression. The people called it the White Terror. Into this lugubriousness, whatever it may be called, I was about to enter. In Berlin I lingered a day or two, even when a bright northern sun fell not unkindly upon the German capital, I could not wholly shake off the disquieting feeling that I dare say most foreigners experience when about to cross the Russian frontier for the first time. Hordes of Russians were pouring into the city. 
It seemed that every family who could spare the railroad fare was sending its most beloved members across the borders of the land of ominous promise. According to the Berlin police records, as many as 10,000 sometimes arrived in a single day. The good Herr proprietor of the guesthouse, where I was quartered, came to my room to implore me to reconsider entering the country at so disturbed a time. In his hand he brought, for my edification, and as a warning, a copy of the following notice which was being posted throughout a certain district I would pass on the way to St. Petersburg, commanded by one Colonel Jablonsky. A fleeing Russian had smuggled it out to help him dissuade rash travelers about to enter his country. I, the manager of the movements of troops, request that energetic measures be taken. Bullets and bayonets must be widely used without any fear for the consequences if any agitators be seen. If the workmen do not let the locomotives go from the depot, shoot them. Traffic must be established by evening. I repeat again, do not spare bullets and bayonets. The machinists who live at the government quarters are to be asked three times to accompany the locomotive, and if they only open their mouths to demur, shoot them on the spot and turn their families out into the street. Manager of the Movement of Troops, signed Jablonski. There may have been more bark than bite to this Jablonski, yet his proclamation suggested anything but a peaceful railway journey. Toward ten o'clock that evening, my luggage was transferred to a cab, and as I appeared in the hotel doorway, my friend, the Herr proprietor, once more came forward. Today it is quiet, yes, but tomorrow. And the expressive shrug of his fat German shoulders eloquently vouched for his genuine concern for my welfare, or his pocketbook, who shall say which. The luxurious comfort of the wagon lits soon dispelled the nervousness created by my stay in Berlin, and the next forenoon, as we rattled across the snow-screened plains of the north, I serenely accepted the counsel of a Russian fellow-traveller, and deliberately ripped off the binding of a certain forbidden book which I carried, that I might wrap the printed pages about my body, next to my underclothing, to escape its confiscation. The book was Peter Kropotkin's Russian Literature, which I thought I might find a useful book of reference. The last station in Germany was passed at noon, from here on, our speed was noticeably lessened. We rolled noisily past the frozen fields which lie in the narrow strath that marks the dividing line between the two countries. An ice-bound creek running through the strath was crossed by a small trestle. Close by this miniature bridge, a Russian soldier in the characteristic coarse brown coat presented arms. As I looked out upon him, I laughingly touched my cap in salute, and his peasant face broke into a broad grin that fairly beamed of friendliness. That smile softened my crude, preconceived notion of Russian soldiers many degrees, and during the thousands of miles that I was presently to travel in the frozen kingdom, I always remembered the smile that greeted me when I first crossed the border, and it was rarely indeed that I did not find a cordial response where I spoke a friendly word or extended a friendly hand. At Weirbalen, we changed trains, passed the customs, surrendered our passports for examination and visa-ing, and submitted to whatever other routine the officers required. Gendarmes swarmed everywhere. The prominence of their arms excited my interest. Swords clanked noisily at their heels, striking the ground with each step they took. Large revolvers were attached with threatening convenience to their belts, and always outside of their handsome gray winter coats. The delay here was characteristically tedious. Hours were consumed in dispatching business which, after all, was slight in bulk, but unduly weighted by red tape. Aside from the dangerous literature which was securely fastened about my body, I had nothing dutiable, so I thought I could safely expedite the examination for myself in order that I might be an unharassed spectator on this, my first Russian scene. To accomplish this, I innocently offered a customs inspector a small piece of silver which was vehemently refused. Mr. Inspector informed me in a loud voice that he could not think of taking money from an individual for doing what the government paid him for doing. A moment later his back was turned, and a thin ugly hand stole between two of my grips, and the half-closed fingers twitched expressively toward the palm. The man's eyes were on his superior. I dropped a modest coin into his hand, and the same instant a Russian standing next to me dropped a much larger coin, gold in fact, into the same palm. 
the man started in visible surprise and excitedly snapped shut my bags without so much as glancing at them. As he did so, he muttered something to me under his breath, in Russian, which I could not understand. But my neighbor, he of the lavish tip, said, sotto voce, take two of my bags along with yours. The meaning of this was not at the moment clear to me, but I meekly complied with the request and ingenuously submitted the stranger's grips to the checking officials as if they were my own. Had the man been an absolute stranger, I might not have followed his directions so readily, but he was the same man who had showed me how to carry my book so as to escape detection. Not till the train had actually left the Virbalin station did the man come to claim his luggage. Then he lingered to talk a while, and we became friendly to the point of confidence. Darkness had settled deeply down over the outside world before he left my compartment, and we were running across wide, open fields, occasionally broken by forests of fir, into which the engine belched bright sparks from the soft sticks that in Russia are burned instead of coal. My companion watched the sparks scattering against the trees and settling on either side of our steel pathway, and made some allusion to the sparks of liberty that even then were scattering across all Russia, settling around and in every town and village from the Baltic Sea to the waters of the Orient. The man's eyes flashed, hardly less bright than the darting flecks of flame outside the window. He found a sympathetic listener, and it was then we warmed toward each other, and he told me the contents of the bags that I, so innocently, had smuggled safely into the country. They contained hand grenade models, files of high explosives, and several innocent browning revolvers. I cannot say that I regretted then, or have I since, this my first humble service to the revolution. On this train destined for St. Petersburg, there was no other American traveler, but there were several Russians who spoke in English, and any number who understood French, so that I had intercourse with many of my fellow passengers, in addition to the revolutionist who now called me comrade. The French Revolution brought into popular usage the word citizen, but the Russian Revolution has popularized the word comrade, and comrade is surely the warmer, the hardier, and the more inspiring. What do you think about the plans for the Duma? I asked of an army surgeon who spoke English. I do not think, was the reply. The Dutch have a proverb, nothing thought, nothing done. I have learned not to think in this country. Later on, I succeeded in drawing another man into conversation on the subject. In the midst of the discussion, a gentleman entered our carriage, and as he sat down directly opposite us, I thought to include him in the conversation, so told him the drift of our talk. He stared blankly at me a moment and said, Is there good sledging in Petersburg now, do you think? I saw the point and changed the subject. A few minutes later, he leaned close to me and said, I should beg your pardon but I left the adjoining carriage because the passengers began to talk about politics. Once I was in a theater in Petersburg witnessing a performance of Hamlet. I had a seat in one of the galleries. Two peasants presently came in and sat near me. They removed their greatcoats and their boots. They made themselves comfortable for the evening. But when Hamlet was trying the blade of his sword for the duel, one peasant said to the other, "'Tomorrow morning at five o'clock we leave Petersburg to return to our homes.' Is this not so? Yes, replied the other. Then we must get out of this, added the first. For see, they are going to fight. They now have their swords out, and if we do not get away, we shall be held as witnesses. And they left the theater. Those peasants were wise. Having an American passport, I did not feel it necessary to be as wary as the peasants, and, being anxious to get as many expressions of opinion as possible, I soon went into the adjoining carriage to occupy the space left by this man who had told me the story. In the carriage I found a Polish opera singer, a fiery young man in the uniform of a student of jurisprudence, a merchant of Archangel, an attaché to a Russian embassy in a European capital, and an army officer. I had not been long there when the opera singer and the student grew very free in expressing their determination to spare no effort to overthrow the present government. Now the time is not quite ripe, they said. Not today, but soon. The Duma? There will be no Duma. There cannot be a Duma. The government has not the money, and even if it had, it could never be. Russia will be aflame before the Duma meets. 
The student was a very intense fellow. His voice fairly rang with the determination of a man consecrated to a cause. "'My word,' said the officer to me, "'these two will be arrested this very hour if the gendarme appears. That student chap cares not whether he dies today or tomorrow.' "'Bravo!' I cried, curious for the officer's reply. Instantly his face sobered. "'Hush, man! Do you forget you are now in Russia?' I laughed unbelievingly, and the attaché who was sitting next to me and who had been listening said, Let me tell you a little story. Once I was in a village church when an old woman suddenly made a scene in the gallery. She was carried downstairs and into the air, where a crowd gathered about her. What is it? What is the matter? We all asked her. Amid her tears and with shortened breath, she said, I was in the gallery. I had no prayer book, so I asked the sexton to give me one. He went downstairs and handed one up to me from below. Well, he stood on the floor and handed me the book, and I was in the gallery. That would be impossible, woman, we said. No man could reach that distance. But I say he did. He did hand it to me, protested the woman. At last an old body on the edge of the crowd exclaimed, It could not be the churchman. It was surely the devil. The excited one grew calm then, and after a minute said quietly, Perhaps it was. It is so hard sometimes to tell who is man and who is devil. Remember that, sir, as long as you are in Russia, it is hard to tell who is man and who is devil. The discussion raged hot till near midnight. Only the officer remained silent. He could not speak. He dared not then. He listened intently, and his eyes often glistened with interest. At last he took from his grip a bottle of liquor and a traveling drinking cup. Filling the cup, he held it high above him, and in a voice that sounded to me full of hollow mockery, shouted, Vive la Russie! The carriage suddenly fell silent. The student evidently hesitated whether to speak his defiance or not. I felt confident that the officer was heart and soul with the sentiments of the student, so I ventured to murmur distinctly, but not too openly, Vive la Revolution. The glass was near his lips, but at my words he paused, and leaning toward me whispered, That is better, but not so loud, please. And then this man, the Russian wearing the uniform of the Tsar, drank to the toast, not of La Russie, but La Revolution. Punctually at 8.30 the next morning, we rolled into the so-called Warsaw Station in the quiet capital, and I drove directly to a hotel where friends awaited me. Outwardly, St. Petersburg preserved that appearance of calm which makes the city one of the most charming in Europe. I arrived on Sunday. The bells of St. Isaac's and the Kazan Cathedral, and a score of lesser churches, but not lesser bells, clanged and boomed through the crackling frosty air. Myriad little sledges drawn by little horses scurried through the streets, and on the Morskaya that afternoon aristocracy drove, as madly, as carelessly, and as undisturbed as it drove that memorable Sunday, just one year before, when, in the Winter Palace Square, just close by, Father Gapon's procession of unarmed workingmen were fired upon by the troops of the Emperor, their little father, as though they were an enemy upon a battleground. Impending doom may have dimmed, but it did not darken the brightness of the city. Whatever of foreboding may have possessed the hearts and minds of the people, there was an outward show of gaiety that was a revelation to me, until I remembered the ball at which French officers danced on the eve of Waterloo, and the festivities of Port Arthur, which continued even after the little yellow men had begun to pelt the fatal hand grenades straight to the heart of Russia's military prestige. That night, in company with an American friend, I dined at Palkin's restaurant on the Nevsky Prospect. A Romanian orchestra in native dress was playing a wild gypsy air when we entered, but as we sat down, the music, in a great burst of ecstatic sound, ceased. My companion remarked, We are already recognized as Americans. Now watch. Almost instantly, the swarthy players began the familiar strains of the Star-Spangled Banner and followed it with the stirring tune of Dixie. At the close, we acknowledged the attention of the orchestra and the leader made us a proper bow. American airs are always popular in Russia, and Americans were being especially courted at that moment. Talk of an impending bankruptcy was in the air.
Negotiations were then underway for floating a new loan in Europe, but these had not progressed far enough for anyone to be sanguine. Indeed, the revolutionists and the liberals were still hopeful that the government would find a new loan in Europe impossible. Consequently, in official circles, the possibilities of finding money in America were being considered. There were not above two score Americans all told in St. Petersburg at that time, 1906, counting the diplomatic corps, correspondents, and businessmen, so it was an easy matter to treat all with rare courtesy. Why do they not play the Russian national hymn? I asked of my friend before we left the table. Because the national air of Russia, like the Marseillaise, is prohibited, he replied, and thereupon he told me of how, a little while before, he had been one night in a famous St. Petersburg restaurant called The Bear, when, during the playing of the national hymn, a guard officer had shot and killed a man ostensibly because he lolled over the back of his chair instead of standing erect, squarely on both feet. The police authorities, fearing further disturbance of a similar nature, immediately prohibited the playing or singing of the national air. It was nearly midnight when my friend and I returned to our hotel, but there we found other friends still up. Hardly had we laid off our greatcoats when the door was thrown open and in rushed a common acquaintance, a Russian, tremendously excited but radiant. He had been with a group of intellectuals in a home just around the corner. Suddenly the police appeared and placed all present under arrest. Only our friend escaped, and he threw some clever ruse. While he was still relating to us his experience, we heard the sound of singing in the street below, and as we went to the window caught the words of a favorite revolutionary hymn. My blood stirred in my veins when I learned that the singers were being led away to prison, and I thought then, as I often thought later, after wide experience in Russia, that few things on earth are more thrilling than the sound of voices under such circumstances, brave men and women marching through frozen streets, often half-clad, to prison, or tied to Cossack saddles being dragged to tortures, and fearlessly, gloriously singing the words of freedom. Sleep was slow in coming to my pillow that first night I spent in St. Petersburg. My mind was in a whirl in the vain endeavor to shake free of the conceptions of Russia gained before ever I crossed the frontier. Already I realized that, while Russia might be just as bad as most foreigners think it, it is bad in a different way and whatever dangers may exist for the traveler in the interior, St. Petersburg, at least, was as secure, to the stranger, as Berlin, Paris, or New York. One week later, the confusion of impressions was even greater. Reports had come in during these seven days of clashes between the military and the people in 48 provinces. The atmosphere of uncertainty was more intense. Conditions seemed to be ripe for almost any kind of a disaster, imperial insolvency, barricade fighting in the streets, army or navy mutiny, general insurrection. And yet nothing of consequence actually happened. The cabinet crisis grew more acute, it is true. Witty, who has been called more of a stratagem than a man, was said to be in perpetual deadlock with Mr. De Novo, his unscrupulous minister of interior. And those who had access to the premier told of how this greatest of Russian political adventurers would sit at his desk in silent despair, toying with his glasses, frequently snapping them in two, sometimes a dozen pair a day. The second morning after my arrival, I was accorded an interview with Mr. Timurasurov, whose demission was just announced because of his liberal tendencies. Mr. Timurasurov had been for many years an admirer and supporter of Count Witte whom he several times spoke of to me as a great man. But he now believed that witty secretiveness and lack of decisiveness, even of ordinary courage, was ruining his power and perhaps blasting his career. A Bismarck goes straight through his difficulties to the goal that he has before him. Count Witty goes around his, said Mr. Timurasarov. The deposed minister also dwelt upon the impractical method of administration then in vogue, under the existing system, each minister reports directly to the emperor, and the prime minister has no way of knowing the character of the report of his individual ministers unless they choose to tell him, which, in the case of Witty, they seldom did. Witty, consequently, preserved a holy silence before his ministers in regard to his own policies. 
a premier who consistently declines to share with his cabinet information upon which he bases his policies naturally fails to obtain unanimous support. I would say to Count Witty, said Mr. Timurasaroff, how can I subscribe my name to that which I know nothing about? You, sir, the premier would reply, are occupied with your own department, your own ministry. You cannot know all the cards, a favorite phrase with Witty. If I do not know all the cards, then show them to me. I am not merely head of my ministry, I am also a member of your cabinet. This witty never would do, and in the attitude of mutual suspicion, each member at sixes and sevens with the premier and with the other members of the cabinet, all working individually and often at cross-purposes, in this blind but truly Russian way, the witty ministry staggered on to its fall. Similarly, is Russia as a whole reeling toward the abyss? A ministry falls a thousand times more easily than a dynasty, but a dynasty following the same mad tactics that wrecks ministry after ministry must sooner or later collapse also. Follies that pass understanding are laid to the door of the house of Romanov, and after the revolution had once broken over Russia, Every serious person knew that the time element was all that remained as a subject for speculation. This is a big factor, however. The moment marked by this X stands elusively in the distance, and between the present and it are weary miles that a nation must tramp, miles marked by many a mirage which, like the vision of an oasis in the desert, cruelly deceives the faint and exhausted traveler. One week in St. Petersburg was enough for me to realize all this. The beginning of the end might be tomorrow, or, with equal likelihood, it might be years away. The temper of the people was such that nothing would be a surprise. St. Petersburg seemed to reflect the atmosphere of Moscow, which still cowered and quivered from the severe and bloody repression that followed the magnificent fight her mere handful of armed citizens maintained on the barricades for nine days against disciplined troops. Suggestive messages distorted and censored by government officials, kept coming in from different parts of the empire, the most disquieting, perhaps, from the Baltic provinces, for there General Orloff, the butcher, was pressing on with his expedition of pacification. Telegrams from Raja and other Baltic towns, which leaked through the censor, were one mournful chronicle of the pacification. At the Star of Gulban, twenty peasants are shot dead, at Tirsen, six, and at Sipolina, two. At Novopelbaj, an estate is burned down. At Staropelbaj, a beautiful school building has been destroyed by shells. At the Volosts of Saukin and Note, 13 people were shot dead by the dragoons, and 20 peasants were whipped by the Rosgi. Troops set fire to the library of one landlord, and all the books were burned, he himself arrested, and his daughter punished by Rosgi. In Wender district, when the people were burying a number of the Volost who had been shot by the dragoons, the cemetery was surrounded by the troops and about 100 peasants taken and punished by Rosgi. In the government of Kurland, 20 estates are burned down, the inhabitants of which are mostly arrested. In Asorsky Volosta, a teacher, Mr. Stapran, a student and an organist and an officer, a deserter, were arrested. The first three were shot and the latter sent to Jakobstadt. In Wenden, the shooting of members of the new Volosny Pravleni is still going on, though the chief of the Wenden army, General Schiff, absolutely declared to the members of the Volosny Pravleni that none of them will be shot any more without trial. However, at Pibalga, the troops shot 20 people and burned 10 estates. At Bausk, the dragoons shot Messrs. Blankenstein, Pitts, Rasman, and Friedman. They had orders to shoot in all 16 men and hang a woman dentist, Rachel Wolp. Not finding her at home, the dragoons destroyed all her property. When they did not find Mr. Mickelson, they tortured his wife. The latter took her baby in her arms and declared that she was prepared to die, but the dragoons left her alone and came the next day to torture her again for hours. However, they could not force the unfortunate victim to tell them where her husband had hidden himself. And so on, through a column, sometimes through two columns. Especially significant telegrams were daily pouring in from the Caucasus. There, the wildfires of revolutionary activity were fiercely sweeping from the Black Sea to the Caspian. There, the Cossacks, the bulwark of Tsarism, were in constant action. One week to a day after my arrival in St. Petersburg, I met in the Cave La Grave, a French restaurant much frequented by foreign newspaper correspondents, a friend, 
a gentleman of the court who inquired are you interested in cossacks would you like to visit the caucasus with a party of cossack officers the infinite possibilities that such an opportunity as this offered fairly overcame me my friend continued my officer brother's regiment whose commander is an aide-de-camp to the emperor has just returned from manchuria fourteen of the officers with a proper escort are about to make a long journey through the disturbed country in connection with the disbandment of their regiment which had been drafted for war service only if you care to join them i will telegraph them to wait for you the telegram was sent that night found me speeding south toward the unconquered and unconquerable caucasus where the flower of the russian army was hopelessly struggling to quench the flames of revolt with blood the blood not only of men but of women and children End of chapter 1section two of the red rain the true story of an adventurous year in russia this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. the red rain the true story of an adventurous year in russia by kellogg derland chapter two among officers of the tsar Prince Andronikov, sometime lieutenant of the Terskoy Kubansky Cossack Regiment, presently attached to the person of the Empress, received me in Vladikavkaz with a graciousness known only in the East, charming formality blended with cordial warmth, and I at once felt at home. The Prince was in the uniform of the Cossacks of the Mountains, a kilted outer garment of grey, loose-fitting but well-cut, offered a pleasing background to what was to me a startling array of sidearms a saber a dagger a revolver and a row of rifle cartridges across the breast you will be one of us across the caucasus he said in exquisite french our regiment is indeed honored it was noon hour when i presented myself to prince andronikov and the officers of his regiment were about sitting down to lunch. I was introduced to a score or more of them, charming fellows all, science of some of the noblest families in Russia. The commander of the regiment was Count Shuvolev, who bore the distinction of being an aide-de-camp to the Tsar. Russian officers enjoy the privilege of maintaining their headquarters in the hotels, if such there be, in the vicinity of the place where their troops are stationed. The hotel accommodations of Vladikavkaz, being somewhat better than of the average town of similar size, I found my officer companions all most comfortably quartered. I was received with profuse cordiality, and the charm of personality of all of them possessed me from the first moment. They all spoke excellent French and several perfect English, one indeed spoke English absolutely without accent, and with a vocabulary far richer than my own. They apparently looked upon my joining them as schoolboys look forward to a frolic, for, of course, my advent was celebrated in true Russian military fashion, by a dinner, which to my still un-Russianized stomach seemed to go on and on, rivaling the famous brook of poetry. When I had wrestled to master the names of my companions, and had told them all the incidents worth recounting of my journey from St. Petersburg, a captain, Count Cherimatyev, carried me off to a military tailor to have me measured and fitted for the Cossack uniform I was to wear on that long and eventful journey through the mountains. This uniform is extremely picturesque, and far more comfortable than any military uniform I know, although its quaintness and exaggerated ferociousness suggests a time long gone by. A long, loose undergarment called a bishmet, tight-fitting around the neck, clinging to the body, and ending with a kind of a short skirt effect at the bottom. Above, another loose garment called a cherkaska, riding trousers and loose circassian boots made of goose skin. The color of the cloth used in this uniform 
depends entirely upon the taste of the wearer. I chose black, though the Russians frequently prefer crimson or gray or brown. The hat surmounting this uniform, called a papaja, is made of lamb's wool somewhat coarser than astrakhan, with a top of cloth colored blue or red, according to the regiment to which the officer belongs. Our color was blue. Across the breast of the Cherkaska is a line of cartouches which ordinarily are of metal, and being purely for ornamentation are empty. Originally, however, this was the regular rifle cartridge belt, and the soldiers to this day carry their cartridges here. The invariable accompaniment of the Circassian uniform is a dagger worn suspended from the belt exactly in the middle of the body. These daggers are often highly and beautifully ornamented with silver and gold handwork by the Circassians of the Caucasus. At the left side hangs the Cossack saber, which differs somewhat in form from the swords worn by officers in other branches of the army. The handles of these sabers, as well as the scabbards, are, like the daggers, generally richly ornamented with carvings and beaded metalwork. On the right hip, the revolver is carried. Although these Cossack officers spend most of their lives on horseback, they wear no spurs. When I had been amply measured, had selected the materials for the different garments of the uniform, and bought a pair of goose-skin riding boots, Captain Sheremetyev took me to an arms shop to buy me a saber. Here we met with a piece of rare good fortune. The proprietor brought out a beautiful Circassian handwork Cossack sword that had been made expressly for a certain Cossack officer who had been killed only the day before. He would sell me the weapon at a reasonable price. I bought it with avidity, being indeed fascinated by the exquisite workmanship of the ornamentation and the excellent temper of the blade. I had speedy assurance that I had made no mistake in purchasing it, for that very night an officer offered me exactly double what I had paid for it. That night I dined alone, by preference, for I wanted a simple meal, and retired early to rest from my long journey across the empire from St. Petersburg. About one o'clock in the morning, a vigorous pounding at my bedroom door startled me into instantaneous wakefulness. Lighting a candle, I turned the key and opened the door to a police officer accompanied by several gendarmes. With profuse apologies in valuable French, the officer begged me to grant him the permission of examining my luggage and my papers. With all the graciousness I could master, I assured my visitor that the unaccustomed privilege of a midnight search was a pleasure and a joy. I begged him to permit me to assist him in any way I could. After a superficial survey of my really innocent documents, he turned suddenly and said, Now, monsieur, where is your revolver? I have none, sir, I replied. The officer looked incredulous for a moment, then said in surprise, do you mean you have come to the Caucasus without a revolver? Yes, I replied, I have. Though, as I am soon to adopt Sir Cash and Dress, I presume I shall be equipped with a revolver. The officer was puzzled at this until I showed him my credentials and explained to him my reasons for coming to Vladikavkaz. Immediately his manner toward me changed completely, and in a tone of real concern, he told me that I must permit him to loan me one of his own revolvers until I secured one of my own, for he should feel very badly if any harm were to befall me while I was the guest of their city, especially as I was to travel with the officers of the Terskoy Kubansky regiment. Taking a thirty-eight caliber American revolver out of an inner pocket, he laid it on the table and very courteously said, I know it is late, monsieur but may I trouble you to accompany me to my office that I may give you extra cartridges. Extra cartridges? I exclaimed. But this weapon is loaded. Surely I shall not be needing more than seven bullets before morning. Pardon, monsieur. You are now in the Caucasus. It is always best to be prepared for anything. You will return here in half an hour, and you shall have an escort. 
To me, the idea of getting out of bed at 1 a.m. to visit police headquarters for extra cartridges seemed preposterous, but I was gently coerced into assent. A mounted escort surrounded our carriage all the way to the headquarters, and when I returned with the cartridges, the escort clattered behind my cab. Early next morning, Andronikov called for me to present me to the Governor-General of the Territory of the Terek, the Ataman, as the chief of a Cossack district is called. This interview was one of the oddest experiences I had ever had. The roomy reception hall of the official residence was crowded with people, mostly peasants awaiting an audience with the Ataman to present one or another grievance. The acting aide-de-camp recognized my friend and we were received without delay. The general was an oldish man with a brief gray beard and metallic gray eyes whose glitter was emphasized by the strong glasses he wore. He was thick-set and heavy, not above medium height. The prince was received with marked respect, and when he had made his formal salutations, he presented me as an American correspondent. He got no further. The general pushed back his chair, and stepping toward me, asked in apparent anger if I knew a Mr. S., an American merchant in a certain town in Siberia. I had never heard of the gentleman. "'Americans are not white!' he exclaimed. "'They are not true!' Just what the general's grievance was against Mr. S. I could not discover, but his tirade against Americans in general, and Mr. S. in particular, was heartfelt and prolonged, and neither Andronikov nor I seemed able to turn the general to other topics. Suddenly he paused in his wrath, and, looking me straight in the eye, asked, "'You are a correspondent?' I replied affirmatively. That is bad, he answered emphatically. You remember Mr. Blank of the London Times? The name was familiar to me, for this man had been asked to leave Russia for his plain speaking. The general then vented his feelings in regard to this man and towards correspondence in general. Poor Andronikov, my host, grew more and more confused and embarrassed till I suffered for him. Suddenly, for the third time, the general changed the subject. This time he hurled his invectives against the Jews. The Jews are at the bottom of all of Russia's troubles, he cried. If we could settle the Jews, we would tranquilize Russia. I hastened to assure him that I was not a Jew, though in America there were many people who welcomed the Jews from Russia. You are not a Jew, but have you a courier? I told him no but I expected to secure one that day. And don't get a Jew, he warned. If you do, you will both be killed. As he went on, in his bitterness, I realized again how deep-rooted is this hatred of the Jew in the minds and hearts of certain Russian officials, and why the responsibility for Jewish massacres is so seldom fixed. The general strode back and forth like a caged tiger. Twice he came so near to me that his breath was on my cheek. My discomfort was great, and I was beginning to lose my temper. I wished heartily I had not come. At last I had an inspiration. Interrupting the general without apology, I exclaimed, Your Excellency is quite right. The problem of the Jew is a tremendous one. The firm and courageous way that you, sir, look at this vast question and the strength with which you approach it fills me with admiration. I shall tell the people of America about you, sir. America knows how great is Russia's problem. I pray your excellency permit me to send a photograph of yourself to America. A photograph in this uniform, sir, with those medals on your breast. This uniform? Put in the general... You like this? Ah, but you should see me in my other uniform. I would I might, I replied with feeling. I pray your excellency to permit me to come when you are wearing it. Wait, he shouted as he disappeared from the room. For a quarter of an hour the prince and I waited. Then the door was opened by an orderly and the general entered, clad in a magnificent uniform. It was Circassian in style 
and in color a rich royal purple. The prince and I both spent ourselves in admiration till the general resumed his seat and began to discuss the object of my visit. His whole attitude was altered from this on, and I found him most kind, affable, and courteous. He did all that any man could to help me and make easy my journey. He expressed satisfaction that I was interested in the Cossacks when I asked him to tell me about this branch of the service. Who were the Cossacks? What were they? I did not know, although no word is more commonly on the lips in connection with Russia. Cossacks are the bravest, the truest we have, he said. It is a source of regret to all who know the Cossacks that so little is known about them in their home life, for the stories of the pogroms, the massacres, give so false a view of the Cossack as he really is. I want to know him as he really is, I replied. That is why I have come so far at this time, and why I am so eager to travel with a party of Cossack officers through this marvelous country of the Caucasus. If you wait until I have received some deputations, I will tell you much about them, and then plan a trip to some of their villages for you, said the general. Andronikov and I were both intensely relieved at the general's change of manner, and I was deeply grateful for the opportunities he presented to me. Long afterwards, when Andronikov and I would sometimes meet, in St. Petersburg and elsewhere, we would always have a hearty laugh over our reception at the hands of this crotchety old general, and how he melted into winsome affability when we played on his ridiculous vanity. While the deputations were being presented, Andronikov and I remained in an adjoining room, Andronikov examining the various war trophies with which the room was stored, souvenirs for the most part of battles in the long, not yet ended war to subdue the tribes of the Caucasus and bring the many peoples of that extraordinary region under the Russian yoke. I was silently framing questions about the Cossack that I would put to the general when I got back to him. In regard to this strange friend of the Tsar's, I suppose I knew about as much as the average reader, but certainly no more, and my notions were all vague and shadowy. I had heard war critics condemn him as practically useless in battle, though useful for scout duty and skirmish work. I had heard it said that he makes a skillful artilleryman, but with a rifle is a notoriously poor shot. But then he is not a proper military man. Scientific soldiering is not his métier. Irregular cavalry, military people call him when he is mounted. Regular Cossack officers are apt to be snubbed and looked down upon by other officers because they are not subject to the same rigid tests that regular army officers must submit to, and the discipline which is traditional with soldiers has never been imposed upon the Cossack. The Cossack is not a soldier in the ordinary sense, though he is the main prop of the army. He is not a proper thoroughbred Russian, though he is a loyal servant of the Tsar. Cossack life and Cossack government is entirely independent, and the only official in the bureaucracy whom the Cossack recognizes is the Minister of War. The Cossack has all and more that the most radical revolutionists in Russia desire. The Cossacks, perhaps, are the largest body of practical communists in the world. Their land, their hunting grounds, their fishing preserves, their timber tracks are held in common, and no Cossack may fish or shoot or cut wood save by the order and permission of his community. At the same time, his individual freedom is beyond that of any people living under the protection of civilization, exempt from every obligation except one, service in arms. Their service is unique in system as well as in kind. Popularly, the Cossack is a modern Caliban. To the world at large, he is pretty much an enigma, but mostly a thing of evil. To the Mujik and the Jew, the very name Cossack is a synonym of horror, a word instinct with terror, with plunder, rape, massacre. The looting of shops, a game by the way, and the burning of houses, a night's sport. 
to the Tsar and the government of Russia, the name Cossack is very different, a word almost sacred. The Cossack is the bulwark of Tsarism, the guardian of autocracy. Without the Cossack, reactionary mandates would long have been impotent. Where there is a dangerous frontier to guard, the Cossacks are employed. Where martial law is prescribed, the brunt of the enforcement is left to Cossacks. Where a province or town is in revolt, the Cossacks are sent. And where people are shut down and cut down in numbers, unarmed men, women and children, it is generally the Cossack who is charged with the responsibility. Because the Cossack is so important to the Russian government, because he is so feared by the people at large, because of the uniqueness of his past in history and in modern life, and the originality of his mode of living, I wanted to form his near acquaintance. I wanted to know him, not merely as the war correspondent knows him, in the saddle, in the field, in the barracks. This, but this and much more, in his stanitsa, in his home, among his fellows and his neighbors. With the officers of the Terskoy Kubanski regiment, I would doubtless see a good deal, and from the inside. But I desired much more than this, and the old general, in suggesting that I visit some of the villages, gave me just the opportunity I desired. When Andronikov and I were recalled to the audience room, I inquired of the general as to how long the Cossacks had been in the territory which he at present administered. He gave us a clear and concise account of Cossack history, telling us who they were, their several branches, and concluding by an extravagant recital of their virtues. The general spoke in French, and I made no notes while he was speaking, but what he told me was full of interest. As nearly as I could remember it, the general's narrative was as follows. The origin of the Cossacks dates back to the latter Middle Ages. The dominions of the kings of Poland and Tsars of Muscovy were not sharply defined, and between the territories was a wide stretch of debatable land. Here settled various bands of people who were, for one reason or another, wanderers on the face of the earth. Some were outlaws and brigands, some were temporarily Bedouin, some were poor, all were in the nature of squatters. They either took the name or were dubbed Kazakh, a word which in Tartar means freebooter, and in Turkish light-armed soldier, and the modern Cossack is largely a combination of these elements. As the population of these debatable lands along the Dnieper increased, they spread out and took possession of other rivers, the Don and the Volga. In due course, a system of simple government developed among them as a matter of convenience and necessity. This form of government has been perpetuated in nearly its original form almost to the present day, and much of it is still preserved without change. As they increased in numbers, they found an occupation. From time immemorial, the Tartars have invaded the provinces of what is known today as southeastern Russia, and so, to protect their agricultural population along the steppe borders, the kings of Poland and Tsars of Muscovy established military cordons, buildings, forts and palisades from which to beat back the invading bands. It was soon learned that the Cossack people who occupy the steppes beyond these cordons best knew how to cope with these semi-civilized Tartars. And so the forts and redoubts were manned by Cossacks, who lent their services for pay to the kings of Poland or the Tsars of Muscovy without prejudice. Thus their organization and their independence gained recognition. Thus too, guerrilla warfare early came to be their regular occupation. Being given to a degree of lawlessness themselves, they were at times not averse to mingling in friendly intercourse with the peoples whom at other times they were paid to fight. Though originally the Cossacks came mostly from Moscow province and from Poland, they have mixed with the surrounding races till they have little ethnological unity. It was once common for the Cossacks to kidnap Tartar and Caucasian women, and thus there were introduced dark streams of blood which are still visible in the race. 
They have also mixed with the Mongolian Kalmaks from the country east of the Volga and taken on many of their characteristics. Nevertheless, they have all continued to call themselves Christians and to nurture enmity against the Mohammedans. When the Tsars of Russia became supreme, the Cossacks pledged their allegiance to them. If, however, it better suited their conveniences to disregard the wishes of the Tsar, they consulted only their own inclinations. They did not contribute to the royal coffers, but became allies rather than subjects, allies who served for pay. On the other hand, the Tsars were not eager to claim them for subjects, and when the Cossacks on the Turkish frontier enkindled the wrath of the Sultan, Russia repudiated them altogether, and they were left to make their own defense against the Turks. The Cossacks of the Dnieper and the Cossacks of the Don were the first of the large bodies of semi-military communities to gain recognition of Poland and Russia, and the Cossacks of the Don still maintained preeminence over all the others. In spite of their treaties with other states having regularly organized and disciplined armies, the Don Cossacks never troubled to introduce military organization among themselves. They lived by shooting, fishing, trapping, and marauding. To foster the martial spirit of all, agricultural pursuits were prohibited on penalty of death. As war is scarcely a perpetual occupation, laziness and drinking came to be fixed habits adopted in the interims of peace and maintained as deep-rooted characteristics. The Dnieper Cossacks, or Zaporovians, as they were called from a word meaning people living beyond the rapids, lost their holdings during the reign of Catherine II for very excellent reasons. During Peter's wars with the Swedes, these people allied themselves with the army of Charles XII of Sweden. The government thought to punish them by depriving them of their independence. The Dnieper people resisted until Catherine forcibly broke up their communities. Some fled to Turkey. Others were given the territory of the Kuban. The Volga Cossacks, who had also sold their services to the enemies of Russia, were less obstinate and accepted the dictum of Russia and removed to the Terek, where the original mountain or border Cossacks were already established. Here Catherine assured them that they would be left free and unmolested as long as they served Russia's interests against the marauding tribes of the Caucasus. And from this time to the present, these Cossacks of the Caucasus have rendered signal service along this most difficult frontier. The general concluded his story with a tremendous eulogy of the virtues of Cossacks, all of which I listened to, but reserved my judgment upon. As we were about to take our leave, I ventured to ask the general if I might not bring a photographer with me the next I came to photograph him in his magnificent purple uniform. For an instant I almost regretted having said this, but the childish delight of the man at the suggestion banished my fears. An hour was set for the next forenoon, and with this Andronikov and I left. The remainder of the day I spent with my officer friends in convivial leisure. In the early evening I went to my room to make arrangements with a man who spoke several of the languages of the district to serve as my orderly and courier. About nine o'clock we were interrupted by a rapping at the door, followed by the entrance of a handsome young fellow in Circassian dress. Suspended from his belt was the usual dagger, beautifully ornamented with silver. There was an attractiveness about the fellow that completely captivated me before he had spoken a word. There was a clearness and frankness of expression in his bright brown eyes that inspired immediate trust. He was not tall, but he carried his shoulders well, and one felt the dashing spirit that must live under his dark, though scarcely swarthy, skin. He bowed with that graceful dignity which sometimes characterizes Eastern peoples. I motioned him to a seat. He bowed again, thanked me, but remained standing. My courier talked with him for some minutes, then, turning to me, said, This man is an Ingush who has come to you on a strange errand. 
It seems that in his village he has won the title of champion sword dancer. He says he can do remarkable things with swords and daggers. Passing through town today, he heard that an American was here, and so he has come to you. Yes, I am an American, I replied. But what can I do for the champion sword dancer of an Ingush village? My interpreter smiled as he replied. He says he has heard that in America there are café chantants where sword dancing would be paid for very well. He wanted to know if this is true, and if you will tell him the way to New York. From the threshold of Asia to the vestibule of America seemed a long, long way to me that night. But instantly it occurred to me that this man offered the very opportunity I had been looking for. To explore the Ingush, the Circassian, the Kabardine, the Ossetian villages that lie among the mountains, at the same time I was visiting the Cossack villages. So I told my interpreter to tell him that if he would take me safely through the district which I indicated and bring me back to Vladikavkaz, I would outline the journey to New York with the probable cost, and that I would provide him with adequate introductions to people in the city who would befriend him upon his arrival. Also, I would pay him well, five rubles a day, for his services, and a bonus at the end of the trip if all went well. There was no doubting the man's keenness to get to New York, and money in anything like the amount I offered him seldom comes to a Circassian of his station, at least earned money. That the man hesitated and appeared in doubt as to whether he would accept my proposition or not aroused my wonder. At last he spoke. He says it is very perilous, my courier translated. At that I knew I could rely upon him. If he considered my risk in view of the offer I made him, I was confident in his sincerity. Of course I had explained to him that I would assume the complete disguise of the Circassian, and that I would assume all the risks of the journey, provided he did all that I could reasonably expect him to do to forestall unnecessary danger. After further pondering, my interpreter translated, He would like to see you in Circassian dress before he answers. We thereupon procured a complete outfit, which I put on. The man surveyed me critically from all sides, and finally, smiling broadly, came toward me with extended hand. His grasp was warm and firm, and had any lingering suspicion of the man remained in my mind, it would have then vanished. It was decided that we should not go on horseback, but rather in a wagon, as it would probably be simpler for them to screen my identity if I were reclining in a cart than if I were astride a horse. My gouge from this moment on was fertile in suggestion. He knew just where to procure the horses. In telling me where they were to be had, he related the following incident. There is a custom among the Circassians, still in vogue, that when a man chooses a wife and the match fails to meet with parental approval, the bride is stolen in the night. My Circassian friend had found a girl in a neighboring village, the queen of all the girls he had ever seen. He determined to take her to wife. The girl had already told him that he was her prince, but the family would not sanction it. Therefore my friend had scoured the country for the swiftest horses in all the region. A friend, a driver in the town, had four horses that he vowed could not be overtaken. In the night they drove into the village where lived the Circassian bride-to-be, and, pausing before her house, my friend had rushed to where he knew she was awaiting him, and gathering her in his arms sprang to the wagon, and the four horses were urged to their utmost. In twenty minutes they had put eight versts between them and the village, and I might have the same horses and the same driver for my expedition. The following day my interpreter, whose caution seemed to me quite excessive, begged me not to depend too absolutely on my brigand friend. He believed him to be honest, but it might be as well not to have this driver. And instead he suggested a man, whom he knew was the assistant ataman, or sub-chief, of a Cossack stanitsa, remote in the territory of the Terek. And to reach this stanitsa we would pass through the Circassian and Ossetian villages I desired to visit. 
our final arrangement was made with him. We rumbled out of Ledikafgaz the second morning after I made the acquaintance of my brigand guide, for he was a brigand. The road selected led directly into the mountains. Kazbek, higher than Mount Blanc, rose immediately before us. At the outset we started through a valley running southeast and northwest at an angle of about 45 degrees to the east of the famous Route Militaire de Georgie, which crosses the Caucasus from Vladikavkaz to Tiflis. After ten versts, the road became a mere trail, and as we ascended and passed the snow limits, even this was lost to my eye. Several times that day we passed through villages of Circassians, mere hamlets, a handful of houses in each. One street of stone and mud, whitewashed, built with the usual roof of thatch and mud. Back of these houses, another row, and back of these, scattered huts. Cattle and pigs roamed familiarly in the spaces which separated the huts. The most striking feature of the Ossetan villages were the large, curious-shaped water jugs carried by the women, seemingly fashioned of pewter. These jugs are large and are carried on the backs of the women to and from the springs and rivulets which are their water sources. There was nothing to attract the notice of the people in a springless cart jolting along the rough road, an armful of hay spread over the board bottom and three men, apparently natives, sitting thereupon. The dress of the people in all these villages was invariably characteristic. The silver handiwork of the Circassians is full of individuality and fame throughout southern Russia. The belts of both men and women, the bracelets and ornaments of the women, the daggers and other arms of the men were all noticeable. The bride of my brigand friend and guide interested me greatly when we finally came to visit his home. She was nineteen and did not look a day older. She spoke no Russian, only her native dialect. She proudly exhibited a mat worked with silver and golden thread and a little wall watch pocket of elaborate design, which were intended as gifts to one of the chief men of her village, the chief of one of the brigand bands, my guide explained to me. I was also shown a pair of baby slippers which she had worked for the youngest born of another important villager. She herself was buxom and attractive, and it was in no wise difficult to understand why my guide had set out upon his nocturnal expedition to capture her. Sometimes we stopped for refreshment at houses where either my brigand guide or our Cossack driver was acquainted. At these places the food given us was generally coarse, as might be expected, but on the whole not bad. Coarse black bread a kind of bread made of maize which tasted wholesome enough, and a pastry which consisted of two crusts, similar to a New England pie crust, but soggy, and filled with raisins and preserved grapes. This seemed to be a delicacy highly appreciated, for there was evident pleasure and satisfaction on the part of the housewife who had made this pastry when we appreciated it by consuming many helpings. In dress, in manner of living, the Circassians are perhaps the most pronounced types of any of the peoples inhabiting this polyglot district. A Caucasian will never suspect a Circassian of belonging to another tribe or race. If nothing else, the ornaments and the manner of wearing them distinguish them. The belts, for example, which are almost universally worn, are rich with silver ornamentation and hangings, and often washed in gold. These things offer a striking contrast to the poverty of the lives of the people, but in the Caucasus silver has small value. During the next two days we traversed a rough and rocky road. More than once we forded streams full with water. Once the old roadway had entirely disappeared. Apparently it had been washed away by a recent freshet. There was naught for us to do but drive into the stream and follow its course for close on to a hundred and fifty yards. The flow of water was strong and swift, and it was deep to the body of our cart and flush with the horses' bellies. The water was straight from glaciers and cold like snow water.
the swift-running, tawny Cherik had been left far below and to the west. The trail passed into the forest, where the chill of winter struck at our marrow, and we closed our burkas tighter about us. Suddenly the forest ended abruptly, and the open revealed the high valley and the snowy mountain now overtopping us. Here the Cossack country begins, shouted my Cossack driver as we passed on to the plateau. As if in joy at coming once more unto his own, he lifted his rifle and, pointing to a tree fifty yards behind us, fired. The bullet sped true. Presently the trail forked with another trail, and the two became a rough road. A verst farther on, the road passed under a crude wooden arch supported by gate posts and entered the village. A Cossack Stanitsa, the first Cossack village I had ever visited. And, as it happened, this particular village had never before within memory of the oldest Cossack there been visited by any stranger. End of section 2《Section Three of the Red Rain: The True Story of an Adventurous Year in Russia》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Courtney Miller.《The Red Rain: The True Story of an Adventurous Year in Russia》by Kellogg Durland. Chapter Three: At Home with Cossacks, Part One. There is nothing straggling about a Terek Cossack Stanitsa. The houses run as a line, east and west, north and south. A paling defines the line. Without the pale is the steppe and the forest. Within is the village. There are no scattering houses to mark that the village is near. The fence surrounding the village, like a crawl, is broken at either end of the village by a huge double gate. A sentry stood by the right gatepost as we entered the village of Terek, in the province of Terek. Over under the arch the wood seemed lost in a stretch of bog. Mud, black and oozy, tempted heavy pigs from the house yards where they are wont to wallow. Pigs are not confined to pens in Russia. They run loose like dogs and chickens. But this is Russian and not characteristically Cossack. Narrow paths edged the house fences and people passing on foot worked slowly along this less muddy marge, sometimes clinging to the fence lest a misstep land them in muck, ankle-deep, or, not improbably, knee-deep. Our wagon clung to the narrow pathway also. A wheel once sunk in the soft black depths of the road would be difficult to free. Turning to the right, near the center of the village, we approached the great square, which, so I soon learned, is invariably the heart of the villages of the mountain Cossacks. The distance from side to side was fully two hundred yards. In the square, somewhat to one side, the church— a large, white church with domes and turrets painted green, and these surmounted by crosses of gold which caught the glint of the sun and seemed to crackle with flashes of golden light, like some heliograph left exposed but uncontrolled. The largeness of the square in so small a village amazed me, and I wondered why so large a free space was left. There was no paving here, but the earth was hard and trampled as by the hoofs of many horses. As we drew nearer, a neat iron railing painted green, set upon a brick foundation and encircling the church, caught my eye. A furious clanging of bells, wild, loud, disordered, proved distracting. Then the church doors seemed to belch forth people, women and girls mostly, with a few old men. The girls were bedecked with color, as bright and varied as girls in an Italian village. Gaudy yellows and deep oranges, startling reds and soft blues, kerchiefs, scarfs, and aprons, the horses were stopped that I might watch the procession. It was a pretty sight. Twenty or more came in a party toward the street where we were halted, and I hastily made ready my camera. They passed us within a few yards, and I stepped to the ground that I might gain a better focus. As I looked into the finder, a piercing shriek from one of the girls startled me, and looking up I saw the entire group start madly down the road. Whether they mistook my camera for an infernal machine I do not know, but their alarm was genuine. Some young Cossacks who were standing near laughed boisterously and pursued the girls and brought them back. When they had been made to understand what it all meant, they were highly pleased, and they stood round in all kinds of groups to be photographed. When I secured as many pictures as I wanted, 
We continued across the yard, and passed two high, heavy wooden doors that barred the entrance of a yard. This was the home of my guide. A comely buxom girl of about seventeen, with red cheeks and eyes as blue as my guide's, threw open the great doors, and we drove into a confusion of sledges and carts, broken hayricks, horses, cattle, pigs, and dogs. A more untidy yard I never saw. Cows and pigs adjusted themselves according to inclination. Mud, filth, straw littered the whole place. The yard was a small enclosure, a paling ten feet high on the side where we entered. On the right, a house of stone and mud, whitewashed, with a thatched roof, an ornamented ridgepole, and elaborate gables. A single place to look upon. On the left, a similar house. Immediately ahead, opposite the entrance, a crude shed with simple plank and railing stalls for horses and cattle. Two strong housewifely women stood on the porch of the house in the light, watching our entrance. Their sleeves were rolled up above the elbows, and their arms were folded. Heavy, muscular arms, developed by constant toil. They greeted us kindly, even warmly, and bade us enter. Within I started in veritable surprise. The little kitchen with its Russian oven and sleeping box above for the young and the aged in one corner, a home-fashioned bed in another, was as clean as a drawing room. Scrubbed, dusted, polished, the big brass samovar on the table shone like a door plate. Three icons were secured to the wall in one corner, next to the ceiling. Before them, the perpetual light was burning, the oil cup suspended from a nail driven into the ceiling. After the filth and mud of everything in the yard and the village, the cleanliness of the three simple rooms which made up the house was marvelous. They were models of household industry. If it had developed that this condition was due to any special reason, or was in any way exceptional, it would not merit this notice. But our coming was not announced. In the afternoon, I visited many houses in the village with my guide, who is now my host, and in nearly every one I found a similar degree of cleanliness. During the following days I visited homes in other stanitsas, and cleanliness within the house, if not universal, was at least the rule. Since then I have been in so many Cossack homes that I know a typical one. Of the Turek and Kuban Cossacks, my host's house was fairly representative. In design and arrangement, in cleanliness, in the food we ate, it was neither better nor worse than the average. It was typical. Hence the minute details of my visit here may be taken as a description of an average household. In nearly every Cossack house in the Don country, as well as the Caucasus, one room is set apart as a sitting room or living room. This room is left spotless. Flowers brighten the windows through the winter, and often tidy muslin draperies screen, or partially screen, the beds. Icons, elaborate according to the riches of the household, adorn the walls, one invariably across one of the corners and close to the ceiling and others on the walls on either side of the centerpiece. The ever-present samovar with its cheery companionableness is always in evidence. An hour after our arrival, my host and all his family were transformed by a change of costume. The rough, homemade coat and worn shirt and the ancient cartridge belt all disappeared, and instead he donned a cream-white trikaska, trimmed with blue. It was a very long garment and hung to his ankles. This was evidently reserved for very special occasions. Indeed, it could not be worn many times without becoming hopelessly soiled. He also brought out a special dagger and attached it to his belt. It bore an elaborate ornamentation in handworked silver of Circassian design and workmanship. Most of the arms worn by the mountain Cossacks were obtained from their Circassian neighbors. In the afternoon, my curiosity regarding the great square was appeased. My host sent for his friend, the riding master of the Cossack recruits, and he, desirous of doing what he could for the stranger, proposed a Yugotovka, or exhibition of horsemanship. At this I expressed my interest, and a messenger was sent to summon the young Cossacks left in the Stanitsa. They are famous horsemen, the Cossacks, and from their very cradles are trained to the saddle. The dexterity of some of the riders was re quite remarkable. The first exhibition was a so-called attack. The riders divided into two ranks and charged each other at full gallop, separating just before they met, barely enough for the ranks to go through each other. Once two of the horsemen miscalculated and the horses came fairly together, one of them going over like a horse of wood. The riders remounted and continued their sport. After the men had got well limbered, they went on to more difficult feats, leaping from the saddles while the horses were going at a full gallop, and then remounting, springing from one horse to another, riding double one rider carrying another who was supposedly wounded, snatching up coins from the ground while a crowd of men, women, and children stood by urging the horses to greater speed. 
the interest in these performances soon became most intense and i found myself quite unconsciously cheering as lustily as if it were a varsity football match one trifling incident revealed the trait of cossack character that would scarce find approval in england or in america a young cossack reaching for a coin on the ground almost succeeded in grasping it but he lost his balance and fell to the ground amid the loud jeers of the people jumping to his feet he ran back to where the coin lay picked it up and ran off with it the crowd laughed uproariously at this and did not call to him to come back with the prize thus unfairly captured a moment later another rider failed completely in snatching at another coin which was thrown down and he threw himself from the saddle and secured the money this was a little strained it seemed to me so i asked a man near me why the crowd did not protest and he answered once a cossack gets his fingers on money he never lets go it does not matter how he gets it there were several accidents in no case was the slightest sympathy manifested toward the injured man once when a man fell from his horse and was stepped on the crowd laughed and even jeered as he dragged himself off in another instance a young fellow of not more than twenty lost his balance while reaching for a coin on the ground as he fell his foot slipped through one of the stirrups and he was dragged several yards and in full view of us all the horse stepped squarely on him the crowd laughed uproariously at this and one old woman toddled up to him and handed him a rag with which to wipe the blood from his face but she did not offer to assist him the poor fellow was left quite by himself and after a few minutes i saw him climb slowly onto his horse and canter off that evening i inquired about him and was told that he was all right the men expressed surprise that i should have thought of him about nine o'clock however he was brought in to me he is much worse than we thought said the men who brought him and there is no doctor within twenty versts they laid him on the bed and upon examination i found the print of a hoof clearly on the man's face his nose being crushed flat to his cheeks he complained of his chest so i loosened his clothing and found another hoof print this one not so clearly outlined nor was the skin bruised but there was swelling and inflammation and as nearly as i could discover two ribs broken the nose i could do little about it looked to me as if a very considerable amount of skill and certainly instruments would be needed to set it right the ribs i was able to set however and with poultices and massage to reduce the inflammation and relieve the sharper pain i found this injured cossack every bit as susceptible to human pains as the rest of men and every bit as appreciative of the little relief which i was able to give him their games are of the roughest and thus are they trained to that bigger game which is their life the war game but their feelings and sufferings prove them normal the government of the country as well as their local customs encourage the most brutal sports and roughest treatment of men for the crueler and more callous they are the better soldiers they do make each cossack stanitsa is provided with a government riding master who drills young cossacks in rough riding all young cossacks eligible for military service are obliged to spend one month each year in rigorous training so that when the call to arms comes to them they shall not be like new recruits a cossack soldier is never a recruit really he enters the service hardened by the experience of much training and with the blood and spirit of the cossack free and easy soldiering urging him to meet the expectations of his masters during the two days that i lingered at this village i found the meals were jolly times though the food was neither delicate nor varied the women did not sit at table with us though in other houses i sometimes saw the women and men eating together nor did the children have places with us the season being lent when a strict fast is prescribed there was no meat on the table black bread cakes of maize and chopped cabbage were the chief foods followed by a kind of pie or tart this consisted of an upper and lower crust with preserved grapes between tea was drunk freely likewise a light beer before meals vodka it must not be gathered from this however that moderation in drinking is the rule when i asked several men if they were fond of drink they laughed and replied we drink vodka at birth at every feast during every fast at every marriage and every meal there appear to be no sentiments whatever with regard to temperance there is a famous cossack ballad ascribed to a cossack leader named davidoff which runs happy he who in the strife bravely like a cossack dies happy he who at the feast drinks till he can't ope his eyes one man explained to me when i was questioning him about cossack massacres of jews that when the cossacks were called upon to do particularly disagreeable work that it was customary for them to get drunk first vodka looks like simple water or gin the taste to me is of wood alcohol it is gulped rather than drunk as is an ordinary beverage consequently vodka drinkers seek only the effect it is slightly warming though not so strong as whiskey 
being only 40 or a little over 40 percent, alcohol. The effects are marked. First, a warming, then a numbing, dulling sensation. In excess, it produces wild hilarity and jocularity, and intensifies the passions. In later stages, it besots. Vodka drinkers soon become overpowered by sleep. This is why so many drunkards in Russia lie about the streets. Overcome by drowsiness, they sink into sleep wherever they fall. The Cossack looks upon excessive drinking as his prerogative. Drink and plunder were what his ancestors fought for, and in this the Cossack of today has not much altered. In the Don country, the Cossacks are a distinctly inferior race to the mountain Cossacks. There I saw excessive drinking among women as well as men. In the Turek and Kuban, I saw none. This does not mean that it does not exist, but simply that I did not see it, and, therefore, it is probably less common. End of chapter 3, part 1. Recording by Courtney Miller. Section 4 of The Red Rain, The True Story of an Adventurous Year in Russia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Courtney Miller. The Red Rain, The True Story of an Adventurous Year in Russia by Kellogg Durland. Chapter 3. At Home with Cossacks, Part 2. In the late afternoon, my Cossack host announced that it was time for him to attend the local Duma meeting, and I was invited to accompany him. It was held in a small building at one corner of the Great Square, and was attended by all the males resident in the Stanitsa, and then at home. There are always many young men absent from the Cossack Stanitsa, owing to the military obligations which fall upon them all. The meeting was conducted not in the building but in the yard behind. As nearly as I could follow the proceedings, they were as follows. The ataman, or chief, who was elected by popular vote, stood upon the steps of the building and addressed the meeting, which was gathered about him. The ataman announced the topic to be discussed and stated his views. He then retired, and little knots of men discussed the matter with greater or less vehemence. Standing apart, the scene looked like a score of little meetings in one. After a lengthy wrangle, a vote was taken and the matter ended. It was all very primitive, but very like a New England town meeting. In main features and principles, I could discover no difference. One matter that came up for discussion was the cutting of wood from the Stanitsa forests. My host was one of those elected to do this work. The land belongs to the Stanitsa. When a lad becomes of age, he is given his share. This may be used by him as he chooses, either for agriculture or grazing. The lands owned by the Cossacks originally were so vast that each Cossack had more than enough for his needs. But of late, the Stanitsas have been growing more rapidly, and there has begun to be complaint from the Cossacks that they have not had enough land. The average amount held by each Cossack is several times greater than that held by the common peasants, or musics, but in many places the Stanitsas have been obliged to reallot the land, and to cut down the individual allotments in order to supply those just coming of age. In some sections, the land thus allotted is held through life, and at death it reverts to the Stanitsa, the provisions made for the widows. In other places, it is reallotted at the end of every few years, or even annually. Greater system exists among the Turek and Kuban Cossacks owing to the penalty of death which was long imposed upon the Don Cossacks for engaging in agricultural pursuits. This was many generations ago, and only the effects are now found in the economic organization of the Don Cossack life. When the Don Cossacks were increased by serfs and others who fled, or emigrated, from Russia, people who had been accustomed to till the soil, this old idea gave way, and more and more the Cossacks of the Don have been engaging in husbandry. Today there is a large export of grain from the Don country as a result of the cultivation of the steppe by the Cossacks. The splendid physique of the men, the strong wholesomeness of the women in my host Stanitsa, won my complete admiration. I have never seen a better average of the human animal. The weak or sickly, if they existed, remained at home and out of sight. There was, too, a geniality a cordiality, which little suggested the proverbial brutality of the Cossacks. On the Sunday afternoon, the young people of the Stanitsa congregated together at one corner of the great square and sang folk songs. They have rare voices, the Cossacks, and from across the square the sound of their combined voices was thrilling. The picture they presented was a gay one, for the girls without exception wore dresses and scarves of bright colors. 
My host was as good as his word in taking me to call among his friends. We went into houses in every quarter of the village, drank tea, and, through my interpreter, I told them about that far-off place which to them was but a mysterious name, America. The stories of darkest Africa which were told me as a child never fascinated me more, nor seemed more wonderful than did the things they heard about America seem to them. In every house I remarked upon the cleanliness of the interior. The floors in the crudest houses were scrubbed and polished, and the assortment of holy pictures near the icon was in some instances quite astounding. They were always pleased when I noticed their icon and holy pictures. I tried never to lose sight of the fact that I was among Cossacks, but I must confess that this often required an effort. The kindliness of the men, the hospitality of the women, was constantly giving the lie to the traditions of these heartless people. Whenever I could, I asked the men to tell me of their exploits, their soldiering, and of massacres and pogroms that they had taken part in. They would always relate these experiences in a matter-of-fact way, emphasizing that they did what their officers told them to do. Their disputes with their own neighbors, the Circassians, Ingosh, and other Caucasian tribes, they viewed differently. These half-civilized people who lived by brigandage and raiding, they deemed it a mere matter of course to kill whenever they got the chance. On the other hand, they regretted that they were sometimes sent to massacre women and children, but, as the writing master explained to me, it was the will of the Tsar. That is one of the terrible things of Sardom. In the name of the Tsar are perpetrated the foulest deeds ever conceived by the diabolical minds of men. It is a point of honor with us, said the writing master, to obey. We are given our lands free. We have much freedom and many privileges, and in return we give our services. It is not our business, these massacres and pogroms. It is the Tsar's. He gives us what we want, and we in turn give him what he wants. If your officers commanded you to run through school children with your saber, would you do it? I asked. The men colored perceptibly as he answered. Certainly, I would obey. Others in the room hastened to add that they would not do such things of their own accord, but only at the command of their officers, whom they are sworn to obey, or unless they were well plied with vodka. The morning I left the Stanitsa, a snowstorm was raging, and our progress down from the Cossack Plateau to the plain below was slow and labored. Part way down we passed another Cossack Stanitsa, and at the suggestion of my blue-eyed driver, we halted here for a time to rest the horses and call on two or three of his friends. One man was building himself a new house. For the materials and workmen whom he was hiring he was paying five hundred rubles, two hundred and fifty dollars. This brief experience among the Cossack villages I later followed up by visiting other villages in different parts of Russia, in the Kuban, in the territory of the Don, in Orenburg, and in Siberia, and my conclusions in regard to Cossacks in general are summarized pointedly. The Cossack is a survival of medievalism, kept alive only by a government which finds it to its interest to employ medieval methods against its own subjects. After the Russo-Japanese War, the Cossack will never again be relied upon in regular warfare. He won't do. But as a particularly severe and drastic policeman, he is better than anyone. Where there is an unarmed mob to quell, or crowd to disperse, where there is a village to pacify, there send the Cossack. If the job happens to present difficulties, dole out vodka to the Cossacks, and they become daredevils. But devil-may-care methods are no longer effective against a regular enemy. The Cossack is not scientific, and therein he fails. His hour has struck. Another generation will know him not. For several hundred years, the Cossack has continued to maintain his own, but for such methods as his, the 20th century has no place. I found the Cossacks of the Caucasus splendid raw material for the development of good citizens. They are physically strong and good. They have dash and daring. Their home life is clean. They have a superstitious loyalty to God and to the Tsar, so long as the government continues to give them their land free and attempts to exact no other tax from them than their military service, which they now render because it is a tradition among them. The Cossacks are, today, as much of an unconquered people as the tribes of the Caucasus, or of Central Africa, but they are not of the same aggressive character as the other Caucasus people. They must be conquered by diplomacy. The Cossacks will not submit easily to a yoke, and not at all to a yoke which gives them no interest or occupation in life. Today, Cossack towns have neither mills nor factories. They are purely rural communities. They cannot subsist on this alone, and the young Cossacks who are ready for military service will not readily change their outlook and take up the peaceful pursuits of the farm. The wandering spirit is in his blood, 
as much as in the blood of the gypsies. Yet he is so purely a survival of the past, maintained until the present time by so absolutely an unnatural system and combination of circumstances, that the continuance of his existence is unthinkable. My observations would indicate that the Cossacks have all the elements of a strong and wholesome people. Their cruelty is the result of generations of encouragement on the part of the Russian government. In one city, at the time of the barricades, a fear-crazed mob rushed forward with bared breasts, yelling, Here we are! Strike us down! And the Cossacks made answer, Why do you taunt us? We also are men! And rode past them without cutting down a single man. The Caucasus Cossacks, I found, were not only men of manly feelings, but of exceptional physique. Surely they will lend themselves to civilization. Their land cannot be taken from them without a struggle. Submit to the regulations of civilized people immediately they never will. The problem is one that Russia's next regime will have to work out. But the organization of the Cossacks, as perpetuated down to the present time, is without doubt one of the shrewdest and strongest pieces of interior administration ever adopted by a nation. If Russia were not torn from every center in the empire, the Cossacks would maintain peace indefinitely. Without the Cossacks, Russia, long ago, would have been overwhelmed. The Cossacks are the only branch of the army that can be relied upon absolutely, and they because they are now in possession of everything that the revolutionists are clamoring for. Freedom, liberty, all the shibboleths of revolutionism are commonplaces in the life of the Cossacks. And when the time comes for this medieval institution to go under, it cannot be hoped that it will surrender without a struggle. So long as the House of Romanov holds supremacy and autocracy, the Cossacks will continue to flourish. If this regime is overthrown, the next will have the Cossacks to cope with. The Cossacks will die hard. But die they must, or at least the institution of Cossackdom. And the Cossack must be saved to lend stamina and strength to the upbuilding of a strong state in Russia, whether constitutional monarchy or republic, and the individual Cossack turned into paths of productive labor. During the two following days I passed through countless villages of the various tribes of the North Caucasus, and if this preliminary excursion did nothing more, it, at least, disclosed to me the tremendous difficulties of civil administration in this wild region, and above all else, the utterly blind, fanatical policies that have been pursued by the Russian government during the last twenty-five years, which is the period when her armies just began their sanguinary march into this ancient corner of the world. What these people need is not military subjection, but education, enlightenment, and contact with civilization, and an administration based on the principles of humanity and the enlightenment born of learning and culture. But it is outside of my present purpose to suggest what ought to be or what might be. It is rather my restricted duty to give the picture of the scene as I found it unfolded before me. All these different villages of the many tribes of Caucasia, living in their backwardness and their idleness, knowing not the advantages of education, consequently craving it not, crude in their superstitions, quaint in their customs, bold and medieval in their attitude toward their fellow men. On the south slopes of the Caucasus, as well as here on the north slopes, are these villages found. Though instead of being Circassian, Cabardine, and Ossets, they are Mingrelians, Kurds, Georgians, Gurians, Persians, Medo-Persians, Tartars, Armenians, and other tribes spilled out of Asia. The crying need universally throughout the region is for a wise administration, making for increased enlightenment and education, instead of which is maintained the brutal iron regime of militarism. Upon our return to Vladikavkaz, I donned my Cossack uniform, which was awaiting me, rejoined my friends the officers, and the second day thereafter we began our journey eastward to the oil city by the Caspian Sea. During the first days that I appeared on the streets in uniform, I could not get over the sense of bewilderment and surprise occasioned by the salute I received from every soldier whom I met. For it is a rule of the Russian army that an officer shall be saluted at all times. Had any one of these soldiers stopped to speak to me, the hopelessness of my predicament would have overcome my wits, I am sure, for at that time I knew scarcely any Russian at all. I certainly could not have understood or answered a single sentence. I was saved the embarrassment of such a situation, however, through the fact that the discipline of the Russian army is such that no soldier would think of addressing an officer until he was spoken to. Secure in this knowledge, I did not hesitate to go among the men, even when unaccompanied by one of my officer friends. End of chapter 3, part 2. Recording by Courtney Miller.
Section 5 of The Red Rain The True Story of an Adventurous Year in Russia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rita Boutros. The Red Rain The True Story of an Adventurous Year in Russia by Kellogg Darland. Chapter 4 Under Martial Law. The officers occupied the first-class compartments of two cars attached to a regular train, run from Moscow to Baku and Tiflis, and the escort of some forty-odd Cossacks who accompanied our party were relegated to a fourth-class car somewhere at the rear of the train. The first two cars immediately behind the engine were filled with political prisoners who were being transferred from one prison to another. For the most part, conversation among the officers was on topics very remote from the political situation of their country, remote even from the business in hand. Whenever I cared to bring up the subject, however, my questions were always readily and frankly answered. They accepted the revolutionary situation as unfortunate and unhappy but a situation to be solved through military measures rather than through political concessions or altered civil administration. I shared a compartment with a dashing young captain, the son of one of the most distinguished families in Caucasia. The father of my friend was at one time the viceroy of the region. In discussing with him his own personal sensations when combating the revolutionary activity, I was startled to have him tell me that, nowadays in shooting at a human being, he felt precisely the same as he used to feel when, as a younger man, he used to shoot deer in the mountains. The people here, he added, are all deserving of what they get. Thereupon he dilated upon the wicked ways of the Tartars and the Armenians, whose constant feuds were then spattering Baku and Tiflis, and much of the country which lies between, with crimson stains. This same officer, who spoke with such carelessness of the taking of human life, had all of the instincts and the fineness of a man of refined and poetic temperament. At night, for example, I found him sitting at the car window, hour after hour, entranced with the marvellous beauty of the night, the snow-capped peaks of the mountains, fast receding from us as we sped toward Dagestan, the glorious vault of blue studded with bright but cold metallic stars. And as I asked him why he did not sleep, he answered, I am fond of sleeping, but not in the night-time. This beauty attracts me more than my couch. The next morning I awoke before the sun. Our way lay close to the shores of the Caspian. My companion was up before me, and insisted that I come to the window to watch the beauty of the scene about to be revealed. Presently the whole east was bathed in startling brightness. It was as though the sea tossed crimson waves out there, where water met sky and as the brilliant colors fell toward the dropping heavens, the atmosphere caught their gleams and held them. In another moment sky and sea were indistinguishable one from another, for over all was spread the increasing depth and height of color. Behind us still lay the ashen somber light of dawn, reluctantly yielding to the brilliance of coming day. The degree of appreciation that I found in my friend of this perfect manifestation of nature filled me with wonder and admiration. He was touched to the depth of his being by the glories of the beauty we beheld. Afterward I thought often of the man's emotion at this time, when I came into contact with that other side of his character, which presented only adamant hardness when he turned to the restoration of order in that district which was then as it had been for months past in the throes of bitter conflict in my heart you see he remarked one day i am a soldier and i cannot look upon our political situation save from the standpoint of an officer the armenians in baku as indeed throughout this whole region, have small reason for loving Russia. 
Russia, in her treatment of these people, has builded herself a monument of ingratitude. Without the support of the Armenians, Russia never would have conquered, even nominally, the Caucasus. Not only did Armenians serve in the ranks, but some of the best generals Russia has ever had have been Armenians, notably General Loris Milikov, who was at one time the minister to Alexander II, and who is popularly supposed to have drawn up the constitution which that monarch might have granted to his people at the time of his death. But having used Armenians to serve its own ends, Russia began, a few years ago, to alter its policy toward them. The changed policy began on the 25th day of June, 1903, when Mr. von Plev issued a now historical decree declaring that as the property of the Armenian Church was badly managed and used for political purposes, the state of Russia must interfere and take control of that money. In view of the fact that this money belonged not to the Armenians alone, but to the whole Orthodox Church, of which the Armenian is a part, this was considered an affront to the entire Church. This arbitrary high-handed measure converted the whole Armenian population into Russian revolutionists at a single stroke. Prince Galitsyn, the then viceroy of the Caucasus, maintained a regime of unprecedented severity toward the Armenians, arresting and punishing them by the hundreds, and inaugurating an era of governmental terrorism which had never before threatened these people. From that day until now, the Armenians have maintained a constant guerrilla warfare against Russia and Russian soldiers. Added to this is the bitter race hatred encouraged by the Russian authorities between the Armenians and the Tartars, which has again and again been traced directly to the Russian administration, for where races are warring one against the other, a military regime finds the complete subjugation of both peoples simpler. Riot, destruction of property, bloodshed, murder were all a part of each day's work in Baku. The vast oil wells, which are the mainstay of the city, were burned, the great tanks wrecked, and on every hand mountains of wreckage and debris were patrolled by Cossacks. Near to the station as we alighted from the train, a murdered Armenian was lying in the gutter. Blood still oozed from his head. What immediately struck me was that no one gave him the slightest heed, Passers-by stepped over the corpse as if it were the carcass of a dog. My Armenian courier alone seemed troubled. He remarked, The trouble, sir, here in the Caucasus, is all due to the Russian government. The Russian government first stirs up the fights, and then it does not allow us to finish them as we would. How would you manage it? I asked. Manage it, sir, he replied. Give the Armenians guns, leave them alone, and in ten days there would not be a Tartar left north of the Persian frontier. Although naturally peaceful, the Armenians are good soldiers and strong fighters. They shoot well and are by no means cowards, although by nature they prefer the peaceful walks of life. In this respect they are different from the Georgians, their near neighbors, who are natural warriors, proud of their prowess and of the distinguished officers that from time to time their race has produced. Not only was the Armenian church robbed of its treasure, but at the same time the Russian government deprived the Armenians of their national schools, thus treading upon the finest flowers of nationality and forever engendering the hatred of the Armenian people. During the long and biased administration of Prince Galitsyn, the Armenians were constantly persecuted, while the Tartars were allowed greater liberties. The Tartars were not slow in appreciating this situation, and a depot for the importation of arms was established that they might prepare themselves for the uprising soon to take place. As nearly as can be gathered, the plan upon which the Tartars were acting was to slaughter all of the Armenians in eastern Caucasia. The authorities unquestionably were aware of this plot, 
but did nothing whatever to prevent it during all of the preliminary stages. Indeed, the authorities themselves frequently circulated reports that an Armenian Tartar war would presently break out, and the Tartars were constantly spurred on to greater activity by the reports that were allowed free circulation, that the Armenians would one day attack them. That this plan did not culminate was due probably to the turn of events in the Far East, for when Russia began its retreat, beaten at every point by the little yellow men of the Mikado, every nationality held in subjection by the Tsar began to count anew upon the realization of the dreams of nationalism. The removal of Prince Galitzin from the Caucasus in July 1904 doubtless saved the situation there, for Count Vorontsov Dashkov, who followed as viceroy of the Caucasus, was a man without the strong prejudices of his predecessor, and did much to reconcile the Armenians, although it was under his regime that the frightful massacres of February, March, and May 1905 occurred. The massacre of February 19, 1905, was only one of a whole series of massacres planned by the Russian administration. The details of this dastardly affair are still unforgotten, and inasmuch as no one knows when there may be another, the whole populace is kept in a state of almost perpetual panic. Prince Nakashidze, a Georgian nobleman, one of the lieutenants of Prince Galitzin, who had assisted in the confiscation of the Armenian church property, was at this time governor of Baku. A group of Armenian journalists waited upon the governor and heard from His Excellency's own lips a strange theory of a hypothetical feud between the Armenians and the Tartars which might result in a pogrom or massacre. The dangers of such an outbreak, he declared, lay in the fact that he did not have troops enough at his command to suppress any such trouble and that the police could not be relied upon, owing to the fact that so many of them were themselves Tartars. It was afterward pointed out that the report of the governor of the outbreak which actually took place corresponded almost word for word with the supposition advanced by Prince Nakashidze to the journalist previous to the massacre. The massacre actually occurred as a result of a trifling incident. The body of a murdered Armenian named Babayev was being carried off in funeral procession past the Tartar quarter of the city. The sight of this procession aroused the Tartars, and the incident which had led to the death of this man, a purely personal vendetta affair, was taken as an excuse for an attempt to massacre all the Armenians in the city. The Armenians defended themselves for a time, but owing to the fact that the Tartars were in superior numbers and much better armed, the casualties among the Armenians were very heavy. During this attack of the Tartars upon the Armenians, the authorities refused absolutely to bestir themselves or make the slightest effort to end the fight. Prince Nakashidze practically turned a deaf ear upon the delegation of Armenians who appealed to him for help, declaring he had no troops at his command, although there were two thousand men stationed nearby, which could easily have been employed to quell the disturbance in its early stages. According to the stories gathered at the time, and which have never been contradicted, it appears that the governor himself took pains to openly encourage the Tartars, and to stimulate them to greater activity in the fight. The massacre went on for four days, until both sides were ready to quit through sheer exhaustion. In the meantime, some 350 men and women had been killed, and very many wounded. Although it was recognized everywhere that the government was directly responsible for this massacre, the amount of race hatred which was occasioned by this attack has not to this day subsided, and probably will not disappear for years to come. Periodic outbreaks occurred from that time on, and at the time that our party passed through Baku and around the easterly spur of the Caucasus, 
and turned our faces toward the Nuka district and on to Tiflis, we passed through regions devastated and bare, now placed under military guard, heavy Cossack patrols guarding the piles of debris, for actually more attention was given to guarding the wreckage than had previously been given to guarding the lives of the people. There was nothing to detain us in Baku. A condition of utter lawlessness prevailed so far as the people were concerned, and even more outrageous lawlessness on the part of the military. It is always so under martial law. A diary of daily events in the Caucasus for the five weeks I was there would fill a large book. I can only speak of significant events and incidents which throw light on the whole confused situation. Among ourselves, the officers of my party, there was ceaseless merriment and good fellowship. We lived comfortably, we dined well, we whined much. We were as happy and carefree as though we were on a holiday. About us were the most horrible conditions, dire poverty, distress, a veritable carnival of all the elements of wickedness and suffering of which this world knows. For the hopeless people of Baku, I envied the nomads of the Dagestan hills, who tended their cattle and sheep along the steep hillsides, knowing nothing of and caring nothing for anything in the world save their own daily bread. At least they were not a part of the perpetual brawl of the town. At least they were not yet belabored by Russian police or military oppressors. Sometimes we saw long camel trains creeping across the sands of Nuka from Persia, lying just below the southern horizon. The dreamy leisureliness of the plodding camels, the calm indifference of the merchants, afforded an illusion of relief from the hostile atmosphere through which we moved. From a hilltop out of Baku, we looked strainingly through the haze to the snow mountains of the South Caucasus, one peak of which is called Ararat. No longer does the dove fly forth from this ancient mountain to return with a sprig of olive. The waters of the earth no longer threaten this region, but the terrible tides of men, waves of oppression, oceans of misery, seas of shame, ever and always menace all who here pitch their tents. It is the oldest region of the world, if the scriptures be true. Yet, in reality today, it is the least civilized. Here, Christianity first took root. Yet today, the entire region is given over to cruel and diabolical practices worthy of pagans and barbarians. Tiflis lay torn and battered on both banks of the river Kerr, revealed by the lifting of the early morning mists, as our train crept slowly down from the heights to the center of the town. Tiflis, the ancient capital of Georgia, has been the battleground of many a fight and conflict ever since it was first established by Vectang Goroslan, king of Georgia, in the 5th century. Occupying as it does a point of considerable strategic importance, commercially as well as geographically, it is one of the cities of the world which must ever remain a natural capital, whether vested with the rights of empire or not. It commands the highway from the Black Sea to the Caspian, the main route to Persia, and the only road which leads over the Caucasus to Europe. The Tartar and Persian quarters of Tiflis were in a frightful mess. The Tartars, as Ivan, my indomitable Armenian courier, explained to me, had taken possession of a slight elevation near their section of the city, and begun firing upon the Armenians, whose quarter was a little way removed. Between the Armenian quarter and the hill occupied by the Tartars was the Persian quarter. The innocent Persians, unhappily, received many of the bullets from both sides, with the result that most of the Persian merchants had fled in panic. The fighting continued for several days until the Russian troops came up and fired indiscriminately upon the three sections, using light artillery. 
I photographed some of the demolished houses, securing one or two interesting pictures of the walls of houses which had been burst through by solid shells. All the time I remained in Tiflis, Ivan was suspicious of my associates, the officers. Bloody Russians, he called them, and he had no use for them whatever. Being one of the race who had been victimized by Russian treachery so often since the confiscation of the church property and the abolition of the schools in 1903, he could no more put faith in any man representing the government of the Tsar. He was most thoughtful of me, however, and after we had got to know each other better, he proved himself measurably loyal. Early in our acquaintance he had taught me how to use my dagger, for he insisted that since I carried a dagger I should know how to handle it when occasion demanded. He told me how to grasp the handle with my hands and to thrust it into the bowels of my opponent, giving it the right twist so as to make short work of my enemy, after the manner of his own countrymen. But, sir, he added, you are to use it this way only when you are forced to meet your man face to face. It is better for you to get behind your enemy and to plant your dagger between his shoulders when he is not looking. Ivan's fighting ethics were built upon a wholly practical basis. He knew no other standard. In this he was like all the peoples of Caucasia. Besides the demolished foreign quarters of Tiflis, there were evidences of plenty of riot and revolt in all sections of the town. Whole blocks of houses sometimes, with windows broken, as a result of a recent bomb. Telegraph lines down. Traffic interrupted. Streets torn up, and day by day reports came in of clashes between the peoples, and sometimes between the populace and the authorities and never a day without murder or assassination. The streets of the town were never safe. A bomb was liable to drop in the vicinity of any official at any time, and robbery was a commonplace of the night. In Tiflis I found a state of actual and continuous guerrilla war. Nothing spectacular or dramatic happened, but every day someone was killed, a building wrecked, a consignment of government money stolen. Political arrests were hourly scenes. Workmen were taken from their work. Private citizens were snatched from their homes. Newspapers that appeared one day were suppressed the next. Officials who had to move from place to place were accompanied by heavy escorts. The atmosphere was electric with unrest. Tiflis quivers and cowers through miserable days and hideous nights all because Russia's civil policy is as it is, often in open violation of the usual customs of nations and of humanity. Tiflis, olden capital of ancient Georgia, Tiflis the lovely, the beautiful, the fair. I found a city of inquisition, of fire and blood, of despair. Yet through it all, we, my officers and I, were established in the comfortable Hôtel de Lange. At night we were merry and oblivious to everything about us. Sometimes we went to a café chantant called the Bellevue, where lovely Georgian girls sang brisk American songs done into Russian, and painted Armenian maidens danced languorous, lascivious dances. For a time I was fascinated by this paradoxical life. How human beings could drink champagne through long nights when horrible starvation besieged every window and door. How the officers of the busiest army in the world could squander hours and days and weeks when mutiny and sedition were daily eating into the ranks. How men of such excellent camaraderie spirit could look upon suffering with a cool shrug all this was new to me, and made me wonder greatly. But after a time the reports coming in from Coutet to the west of Tiflis were so startling that I grew more and more impatient to witness what an army of pacification reveals. There in Coutet the dreaded and hated General Alinkhanov was pushing forward the grim work of repression. 
my good friend prince andronikov secured for me the necessary permission and one memorable monday evening i ordered ivan to be ready to start for kute that evening kute lies to the west of tiflis about eight hours journey on the railroad the train i planned to take left tiflis a little before midnight ivan insisted that we leave the hotel more than an hour before train time i thought this an unreasonable margin of time but before we reach the station i realized that it is always safe to allow ample time for the unexpected in caucasia we had crossed the bridge spanning the Kerr, and had turned into a dark unlighted street running toward the station when suddenly the cries of stoy stoy halt halt rang out in the darkness five soldiers sprang out of the shadow and stopped our carriage while a sixth leveled a bayonet at my breast so close that when i threw open my burqa a long hairy cape extending from the shoulders to the ground and reached for my passport and credentials it brushed against the steel point my uniform was only distinguishable under the burqa the officer in charge of the search party spoke french and upon examining my credentials promptly permitted us to continue on our way we had not proceeded two blocks however when once more the imperative shout of stoy stoy stopped us this time a larger party of soldiers surrounded us two infantrymen sprang to the heads of the horses bringing them to an immediate standstill the officer in command of the second party proved an ignorant fellow and we found it somewhat difficult to satisfy him as to our legality for a man wearing the uniform of a cossack officer provided with an american passport was an unusual phenomenon even in tiflis the very centre of strange and mysterious men and circumstances at last however he appeared satisfied that we were known to the authorities and that our credentials were genuine and once more we started for the still distant station we were nicely settled and on our way when once again the cry of stoy stoy startled us this time however it came from behind impatient at these repeated delays and fearful lest after all we miss the train ivan giving one quick glance behind foolishly thought to take a long chance at escape the soldiers were twenty yards or more to the rear so ivan called to the driver to go on quickly the driver cracked his whip and the horses strained forward to a gallop a perfect volley of stoys followed us I looked back to see how the soldiers would take this, just in time to see the men raising their guns to their shoulders to fire. Springing to my feet, I shouted in Russian, All right, all right, my arms raised to signify that we were in their hands. The sound of my voice warned the driver to stop the horses. The soldiers rushed upon us, and at first were inclined to be rough, for they naturally thought we had tried to elude them. The officer was exasperatingly deliberate in examining our papers, and he was so persistent in his questions that had he delayed us two minutes longer than he actually did, we would have lost our train, in spite of the hour to spare that Ivan had insisted upon. On the train we found many passengers relating their experience with the search parties. Nearly all had been stopped at least once, and many twice so we knew that the city was being searched with extraordinary thoroughness that night for weapons, bombs, and contraband of war that continuously and mysteriously find their way into Tiflis to enable the people to maintain their perpetual fight against their oppressors. End of Section 5《The True Story of a Year in Russia》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rita Boutros. The Red Rain — The True Story of a Year in Russia — by Kellogg Durland. Chapter 5 — Part 1 With the Army of Pacification — Ivan called me at daybreak. At seven o'clock we alighted at Kute's station. 
Besides ourselves, only officers left the train. A small force of infantry held and guarded this station. The early morning air was heavy with the odor of charred wood. Opposite the platform, the debris of two buildings was smoldering. We found a lone cab to convey us to the local hotel. A comfortable inn, in normal times, kept, strangely enough, by two old Swiss ladies. In places the streets were almost impassable. Telegraph wires lay in tangled profusion where they had curled when the great poles were felled. The poles, too, lay as they had fallen. Obstacles of every description lay in heaps at intervals. Reinforced sentries guarded each corner. Once we met a patrol of fifty Cossacks riding by twos behind the scarlet standard of their regiment. The town was a veritable siege city. Walls of grim ruins faced rows of battered houses. There is a clause in the terms of agreement between nations concerning the conduct of international wars which reads, the attack or bombardment of towns villages habitations or buildings which are not defended is prohibited Kute town was undefended it was defenseless but russian troops had attacked it with rifle fire and light artillery on the short ride from the station to the hotel i saw many instances of shell fire and infantry volleys at the hotel entrance a cossack stood guard Ivan presently brought to my room an employee of the hotel, whom he introduced as a friend of his of twelve years' standing. Good, I replied, thinking the man might prove a source of information. Get him to tell us what is going on here. After a moment's hesitation, the man answered, Ivan, I have known you long, and would tell you everything if I dared, but whoever speaks in Kute even to a friend, is put in prison and his house burned. I dare not tell you anything. That is nonsense, I replied. There is no one in this room but ourselves. He can speak with utter frankness. But the man only shook his head and replied, Even the walls of Kute have ears. Ivan himself yielded to the suspicious atmosphere and added, as if to quiet me, That is true, sir. One dare not speak in his own room. No amount of persuasion, not even the persuasion of money, which the man doubtless needed, would induce him to say more. After breakfast, I ventured out for a survey of the town, much to Ivan's disgust. Ivan was a brave fellow in the mountains, but he had seen the Cossacks of this same General Alikhanov, who now commanded Kute, hack off the fingers of fine ladies for the rings they wore, in Tiflis only a few months before. During the first hour we were out, I must have seen twenty political arrests. Demolished houses were in every block. Occasionally an entire block had been swept away by fire. That afternoon, when I talked with General Alikhanov, he explained to me that when his soldiers were ordered to burn down a certain house, they do not always have time to see that other houses do not burn also. Toward noon, we came upon a group of Cossack barracks, and I proposed to Ivan that we run through them. Not for a thousand rubles, replied the redoubtable Ivan, but I finally persuaded him. No soldier above a rank of what we would call corporal was anywhere in evidence. Near a thousand lawless, undisciplined, unrestrained men lounged about the barn-like halls, singing boisterous songs, smoking and relating stories. Months of service had hardened them, and apparently developed traits that lie dormant when they are at home in their own villages. At all events, these fellows seemed much more brutalized than any I saw on my expedition from Vladikavkaz. In one room I found a pile of new blankets more than ten feet high, blankets of a quality and texture never before supplied to an army. In this same room, twelve or fourteen men were amusing themselves with as many brand-new American sewing machines. "'Where did you get these?' I asked in amazement. We bought them, replied a hulking fellow of at least six feet three, and pointing to a large shop up the street added, Go up there and learn about it. 
when first i entered these barracks i refrained from much conversation but as the mood of the men was jovial and amiable i told ivan to explain to them that i was in circassian dress only by courtesy and that in reality i was an american correspondent at the beginning i entertained some doubt as to the wisdom of this frankness but as soon as my position was made clear to them they were friendlier than ever and took it as a great compliment and honour that i should wear their costume they took me all over the barracks allowed me to photograph them and even invited me to lunch with them i was anxious however to learn more about the fine blankets and the american sewing machines the shop pointed out to me from the barracks windows proved to have been a small department store. I find it decidedly a had been. The floor space was a vast heap of merchandise that might have been tossed up by a cyclone. The shelves were stripped. The fittings of the store were twisted and broken. The proprietor, a sorrowful bankrupt Armenian, was perched on an upset counter contemplating his ruin. His nationality was an advantage to me, for Ivan was able easily to satisfy him as to my status, and he opened up readily. The previous evening, just after he had closed his place for the night, a crowd of Cossacks, the same whom I had visited in their barracks, had come along with pushcarts. They had smashed in his doors and windows, ransacked the whole shop, taken what they wanted of trinkets, blankets, and sewing machines and carried off their loot in the hand-carts leaving behind them the pile of wreckage i saw article forty eight of the above-mentioned proceedings of the hague conference reads pillage is absolutely prohibited but under russian military rule each commander is a law unto himself and under commanders like general alikhanov each soldier is a law unto himself the laws laid down and accepted by nations for the conduct of international wars do not, strictly and technically, apply to wars between a government and its people. But the laws of nations are merely civilized standards, and Russia, in its war against its own people, falls leagues short of these. The same grim sights met my eyes on every hand, the same tear-bringing tales were poured into my ears, wherever Ivan was successful in convincing the people that I was trustworthy. General Alikhanov, bloody Alikhanov, the people called him, was ever and always held responsible for the misery and sufferings, the cruelties, the tortures, the inhumanities. During that one day I heard more deeds of monstrous wrong laid at this man's door than I had ever heard of any living mortal. I determined to see him, to tell him fairly and squarely of the things the people of Kute were saying about him, and give him an opportunity to deny them if he cared to do so, before I repeated them to a wider world outside of Russia or, if they were true, I would have his justification of them. Ivan described General Alinkanov as a Persian Turk, which was by no means an inappropriate description. He was a Muslim, born within the region of olden Russian domination. Originally his name was Ali Khan, which name he Russianized by putting the two words together and adding off. Alikhanov has a unique record in the Russian army. Some years ago he was sent to Turkestan, where his ruthless pacification methods won for him the title of Bloody Alikhanov. Three times he had been reduced to the ranks for his excesses, and on one of these occasions because of his corruption. Drastic punishment of this character is rarely applied in Russia, and indicates the monstrous misuse of power of which this man had been guilty. In the spring of 1905, General Alikhanov was sent to Nakhichivan, where he remained until Prince Napoleon was appointed Governor-General of Erevan, when he was recalled. The pacification of Georgia was placed entirely in the hands of Alikhanov, 
who, as governor-general of the district, was in supreme command, responsible only to the Tsar. Kute, where I found him, is the central and most important province of Georgia. Kute is on the southern slope of the central Caucasus, and a little more than midway between Tiflis and the Black Sea. The population of the city of Kute is made up of Georgians, Mingrelians, Armenians, Kurds, and Jews. A polyglot population with diverse traditions, with but one thing in common, a wholesome and heartfelt dislike for Russia. The hillsides of the province are spattered with miserable hamlets. Valleys that should have been beautiful are unlovely, marred by desolation, where excessive taxation and endless government impositions have produced a condition of ugliest poverty. The taxes levied upon these people were so far in excess of the prosperity in the region that in the autumn of 1905 and the spring of 1906 the people ceased to pay any taxes at all, mostly because they could not. And so General Alikhanov was sent with a force of about 18,000 troops into the district to collect the taxes and to restore order. At five o'clock, Ivan and I drove to the official residence of the military governor-general. As I stepped out of the carriage at the door, Ivan naively remarked that he would await me in the carriage. It took considerable persistence to persuade him to follow me. The general was asleep, we were told, but we might wait for him if we chose. "'Come to-morrow,' pleaded Ivan." but I knew it would not be safe for me to retreat, having once got successfully over the threshold of the official residence with him, for I already realized that the sense of insecurity and fear which possessed the entire population was taking fast hold on my interpreter, and as his services were essential to the success of my interview, I dared not risk losing him. We took seats in the outer hall to abide the time when the general should awake and be ready to receive us. Several times the outer door was opened to officers of the household. As each drew off his overcoat, he took from his right-hand pocket a revolver, and usually, with the revolver in his hand, disappeared through one of the three doors leading from the main hall or upstairs. The general's nap proved a long one, for it was after seven when an orderly appeared to announce the general as ready to attend to business. I sent up my card. An aide-de-camp of the rank of colonel presently came down to inquire the purport of my business. To him I explained carefully my relations with the officers of the regiment with whom I had been travelling, and presented my letters and credentials. The colonel reported to the general, and returned to me with the message that four days from then, at three o'clock in the afternoon, General Alikhanov would receive me for two hours. I do not desire two hours of his time, but two minutes, I replied. But it is most important that I have those two minutes with him to-day. It was only after considerable insistence that the colonel consented to again intrude upon the general but when he did, word was immediately brought back that I would be received at once. During the second disappearance of the colonel, a farcical scene was enacted between Ivan and myself. The aide-de-camp had scarcely disappeared upstairs when Ivan, apparently overcome by the fear of seeing General Alikhanov face to face, started toward the door. "'Now that it is arranged, sir,' he said, "'I will return to the hotel, sir, and wait for you.' "'No, no, Ivan,' I said, "'you must come with me, "'for if General Alikhanov speaks nothing but Russian and Tartar, "'I shall be in a hopeless predicament with him. "'You want me to go into the room with Alikhanov, sir? "'Bloody Alikhanov? "'No, sir.' "'Yes, you must. "'I need you,' I replied.' He glowered at me in a fright palpably real, and started doggedly toward the door. I stepped in front of him so as to prevent his escape. "'No, sir,' he argued, "'not to a Likhanov. 
I took Baron de Hirsch to the top of Casbeck, sir, and I have hunted with the Duke d'Orléans for a month in the high mountains, sir, and I was with the correspondent of the London Times in the bad days, but I never had to do anything like this, sir. I shall go back to Tiflis to-night. There was determination in his voice, and for the first time I became seriously alarmed, for as I had no way of knowing whether the general spoke French, I could not risk going alone into his presence. But Ivan pushed steadily to the door. At the threshold I felt that I must act instantly, or lose him, for he was forcing his way past me, in spite of all I could do. So, drawing my revolver, I said very quietly, Ivan, the officers coming back from Manchuria tell of how the Japanese placed machine guns behind their regiments when they were sent into battle, and at the first indication of retreat these guns opened fire. Now, you know that General Alikhanov probably will not harm you. No, not now, sir, he interrupted, but after you are away, sir, he will send his soldiers to Tiflis for me. Nonsense, I answered, I am responsible here, and I will tell him that I made you come with me. He shook his head and once more started past me. Ivan, I said determinately, you may get by Alinkhanov, but you cannot get by me, and I shook the revolver menacingly before him. The poor man was almost beside himself, and I suffered for him, but it was the only thing I could do. He looked at the revolver in my hand, then scrutinized my face, and shaking his head despairingly, he slowly returned to near the front of the stairs and folded his arms in dumb resignation. Two guards were standing in the hall and witnessed this little scene, but they evinced no other sign than of amused interest. The fact that they did not understand our conversation did not arouse their suspicions or their fears. End of chapter 5, part 1section 7 of the Red Rain The True Story of a Year in Russia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rita Boutros. The Red Rain, The True Story of a Year in Russia, by Kellogg Durland. Chapter 5, Part 2. When the colonel returned with the word that I was to be presented to the general at once, Ivan and I were conducted upstairs. At the door of the anteroom, a guard stepped up, and a second aide-de-camp apologetically asked me to leave my arms outside. I drew my sabre and dagger from their sheaths, my revolver from its holster, and handed them to an orderly. Ivan here saw another opportunity to avoid meeting bloody Alikhanov. "'I will stand by them,' he exclaimed eagerly. "'No, thank you, Ivan,' I replied. "'You must come with me.' But now that I had been stripped of my arms, I had not the same means of impressing him as before, and in spite of me he started to slink away. Fearful lest I lose him after all, I clutched at him firmly by the coat-sleeve. He realized that there was no escape, and so, with the expression of a man who accepts the worst when it is the inevitable, he yielded. A sentry stood upon the threshold of the chamber— we passed by him and entered a large salon with highly polished hardwood floor a small room led off from the farther end into which the general was just stepping he was a tall man and heavily built though his back was towards us i could see that he wore the undressed jacket of a russian officer highly polished riding boots and spurs which clanked as he walked his head was inclined slightly forward but i noted that he pulled impatiently at his long heavy moustache now partly grey we paused for a second long enough for him to disappear into the smaller room and then at a signal from the colonel followed him there were others in the smaller room but at the moment i did not notice them particularly for general alikhanov received me at once with cold courtesy I was pleasantly surprised when he greeted me in French, and I briefly explained to him who I was and why I had come to see him. 
after a brief introduction i asked his indulgence that i might address him through my interpreter but why he asked you speak french very badly i answered and it is most important that i understand you precisely i did this chiefly because i wanted the opportunity of studying his features and expression as i could better do when he was addressing the interpreter than when he was speaking directly to me he acquiesced and motioned me to a chair before his desk at this point an officer took his stand by my right side a little behind me and another at my left a third man in civil dress evidently an officer stood immediately behind the general a cossack guard rifle in hand stood by the door it was evident that in spite of my credentials the general had decided to keep an eye upon me he knew full well that sooner or later his life would be attempted as indeed it was a few weeks after this interview without further preliminary i came abruptly to the point upon which i desired light your excellency i said i have come to you on a strange errand i have heard worse stories about you than i have ever heard about any living human being as an american i do not wish to repeat these stories to my countrymen if they are not true on the other hand if they are true i want to hear your side of the case your justification if such there be the general was somewhat surprised by my abruptness but inquired as to the nature of these stories the people of this province i replied tell me that your soldiers are burning the homes of the people indiscriminately at your order the homes of people against whom there is no legal evidence only suspicion that your soldiers are encouraged to loot and to pillage the shops that not only the women and the girls but also little children fare very badly at their hands the general received these words quietly but answered with some heat the people of this province are bad all bad very bad there is no other way to repress them than as my soldiers are now doing there are many people here i added many different tribes and races are none good no they are all bad the georgians are the worst but they are all against the government and must be put down by putting down do you mean arresting them and burning their homes or are these stories false the general showed slight irritation at this and replied there are more than one hundred thousand houses in this province one hundred and twenty have been ordered burned since i came to coutay what are one hundred and twenty out of so many then flashing his eyes directly upon me he added in excellent french these people are terrorists they are socialists and revolutionists when i hear that a man is a socialist or revolutionist i order my soldiers to burn down his house it is the only way one hundred and twenty houses general i replied i have been only a short time in coutay but i have seen the ashes of far more than one hundred and twenty houses oh yes replied the general that may be explained my soldiers are ordered to burn down a certain house but of course they do not always have time to see that other houses do not catch fire and so burn also later i had opportunity to verify the truth of this explanation the soldiers would apply the torch to a particular house and if a wind chanced to be blowing up the valley of the rion the flames would spread from house to house and leap from street to street and perhaps the whole village would be destroyed pursuing the interview further i told the general of the rumours which i heard on every hand concerning the treatment of the women and the girls by the soldiers i spoke specially of a rumour concerning five little girls of tender years the oldest i believe thirteen who had within a few days been sent from coutay to a hospital in a neighboring city as a result of the outrages perpetrated upon them by the soldiers he denied any knowledge of this incident but he admitted that officers have their headquarters in the hotels and were frequently ignorant of the whereabouts of their soldiers and of course not responsible for single acts of violence which might occur from the hands of the soldiers any officer he maintained would prevent such gross outrages as that of which i had spoken 
he added that his soldiers were frequently forced to shoot women but that was because women were often revolutionists just here ivan could scarcely contain his wrath at the general a flush of angry resentment crossed his face but as soon as he realized that he was showing his incredulity he became almost paralyzed with fear his anguish was almost pain to look upon he suddenly went pallid when he tried to speak his tongue cleaved to the roof of his mouth and refused to act i motioned him to cease trying and for the rest of the interview i talked directly with the general in french in regard to the looting of shops the general made no attempt to deny the fact merely explaining that the pillaged stores were owned invariably by revolutionists and socialists inasmuch as the general had already called all of the people in the district socialists and revolutionists and bad this classification and explanation was rather sweeping further conversation with him merely emphasized his position he was on the spot to pacify the people to suppress all signs of revolutionary activity even of passive resistance in other words to restore the province to normal conditions and the policy employed to do this was the only policy which general alikhanov believed could be crowned with success namely the policy of repression or extermination as we talked he leaned both arms on the desk before him and his fingers toyed quietly with a box of cigarettes a bright jewel in a large ring on one of his fingers constantly caught the glint from a nearby light and flashed its rainbow colors. The cold, hard flash of the jewel was no brighter than that of the general's gray eyes, which flashed fire as he spoke, and reflected the indomitable will of a man who is accustomed to fight against odds, and who lives in constant expectation, though not in fear of assassination." When I had questioned him as fully as I desired, and was fully convinced that he had no further justification for his extreme policy than that which he so frankly offered me, I thanked him for his courtesy and candor, and retired with Ivan. At the head of the stairs my arms were returned to me, and as we descended to the main hall I took from my pocket a small gold coin and dropped it into the hands of Ivan, with a remark that never before in his life had he earned so much money in so short a time. "'That is true, sir,' he answered. "'But if I had to do it again to-morrow, sir, I would put myself in the river to-night, sir.' It was eight o'clock when we started to leave the residence of the Governor-General, and night had settled over Kute. Ivan and I took our places in our little droshki, and as we started away, the Colonel, who had been present throughout the interview, called after us, bringing us to a standstill. "'Have you no escort?' he asked. "'Why, no,' I replied. "'I think none is necessary.' We cannot even permit you to return to your hotel without an escort. You must never go from one street to another unaccompanied. One moment, please. The colonel disappeared, returning in a moment with a Cossack soldier, who, at the command of the colonel, took his place on the box next to our driver, his unslung rifle resting loosely across his lap. Once more the carriage started, and once more the colonel stopped us. "'Where is your revolver?' he asked. "'It is here, sir,' I replied, "'in my belt.' "'In your belt? But of what use is it there? "'In your hand, if you please, sir.' I laughed outright at this. I had seen officers going through the streets with their revolvers in their hands, but I had always looked upon this as an affectation or the result of an absurd timidity. In Vladikavkaz, where I was about to drive out with the chief of police, I had been asked to put my revolver in my outside overcoat pocket, in order to have it ready for immediate use. But I had at no time dreamed of carrying my revolver in my hand. However, since the colonel commanded, rather than suggested it, I drew my browning from its holster, only adding that it seemed unnecessary with a Cossack on the box, and only eight o'clock in the evening— "'Pardon me,' answered the colonel in excellent French. "'No precaution is unnecessary just now. "'Your revolver in your hand, please, your ungloved hand.' And so we drove to the hotel. 
Once a man slunk back into the shadow of a building as we approached. He might have been a curd tramp. I could not see clearly. At every corner stood soldiers, and several times we passed a mounted patrol. Not another sign, not a store open, not a human voice, nor footstep. Deserted streets, as of a city of the dead, literally a city of dreadful night. For here was a Likhanov, bloody Alikhanov, who was pushing forward the repression, and all Kute knew that Alikhanov's peace was obtained through a policy of pacification, which, if resisted, meant extermination. When we were once more in the hotel, Ivan, forgetting that his friend had sworn in that very room a few hours before that, even the walls have ears, burst forth into a perfect frenzy at what he called the bad things Alikhanov had told me. I told Ivan that I thought the general had been exceedingly frank in admitting that he burned the homes of the people, and that his soldiers looted and pillaged at their own will and pleasure, without restraint. "'But he did not admit to you, sir,' said Ivan, "'what beastly things they do to our women and little girls.' Early next morning Ivan awoke me. He appeared to be much excited, and asked me to come immediately downstairs, to talk with a man whom he had brought to me. He would not explain, but merely urged me to haste. When I went below, Ivan confronted me with a working man, a carpenter, I think, a man of ordinary intelligence. Ivan told me that I must listen to this man's story. Briefly it was this. In the dead of night, twelve soldiers, with no officer to restrain them, had entered his home. They had pinned him in a corner, and then each of the twelve soldiers had violated his wife before his eyes. About the time I was here, an official commission was collecting testimony to put on authoritative record the things that happened under bloody Alikhanov. Here is a single page from a volume of evidence collected. The village of Tug, number one, Takui Kushlians, thirty to thirty-five years old. When the detachment arrived and the women ran away, I also ran. The Cossacks were chasing us. Being pregnant and frightened, I gave birth to a child who died on the spot. Number three, Mathusan Pulieva, thirty-five years old. I could not run away because I have a baby at the breast, and my other children are also small. Three Cossacks broke into our house, beat and bruised my husband, and all three violated me. My husband was beaten so mercilessly that he is still sick. The traces of the assault are still evident. Number four, Mariam Ovanesians, sixty years old, married. Being an old woman, I did not run away, thinking that they would not touch me. The Cossacks were given freedom. All rushed into the house. They began to beat, rob, and assault. Throughout the village cries for help were heard, but the authorities paid no attention to that. In our house the locks were broken from the doors of the rooms, and they took silver, dresses, and various other things, and then they violated me. There were three or four Cossacks in our house. Number 5 Balak Hanuma Chechens, twenty-five years old. Having a nursling and other small children, I could not run away. The most terrible assaults were committed by the Cossacks in my house. The Cossacks broke into our house several times, in separate groups. My little girl, Nadiezda, four years old, died for fright. She was healthy before. And my boy, Armenak, is still lying in bed, sick from fright. Each group entered and violated me. There were about six or seven such groups. I don't remember exactly how many, because I lay almost unconscious, and after they left I was very sick in bed, and am still sick. Number six, my beau Sarkis Jans, sixteen or seventeen years old. I have been married for two years. I did not succeed in running away in time. Two Cossacks broke into our house, beat my husband, drove him out, and both of them violated me. Then, gathering together all valuable things, they went away. Number 9. Shoganata Chakmizyants, 14 years old. I was among those women that did not succeed to hide in time. 
on monday morning two cossacks came up our staircase i ran into the room and was about to hide myself but they broke into the room and one after another violated me i was a virgin i became unconscious why continue this revolting story during the length of my stay in this region each day added to the weight of tragedies i was more than five weeks all told in the caucasus time enough for me to see what russian administration there means time enough to learn of and to witness the terrible inhumanities of an army of pacification under a general alikhanov the hours i spent with my officer companions were pleasant hours bright with song and laughter they were good fellows and yet i could not but understand through them and through other officers and officials with whom i came in contact why assassination is deemed a legitimate weapon of warfare by the people of the caucasus i am a thorough-going american in spirit as such revolution is my most sacred heritage if i lived in the caucasus suffering and bleeding under russian misrule i would be a revolutionist if my home were invaded and burned by an alikhanov before any legal evidence were gathered against me if members of my household were abused by cossacks precisely as hundreds of girls and women there are abused i think i might reply to these barbarous weapons sanctioned and approved by the czar's government with the most effective weapons i could command possibly even the revolver the knife and the bomb it is easy enough to talk restraint when one has not been wronged to look upon the things i looked upon in the caucasus with one's own eyes brings the awfulness of the regime home with overwhelming force and if one is not actually driven to take up arms in defence of helpless outraged human beings one is at least forced to charity and forbearance in passing judgment upon the methods of these wronged people in their efforts to defend themselves and to correct by every means they know the cruel and inhuman regime under which they live and suffer End of chapter five part two Section 8 of The Red Rain, The True Story of an Adventurous Year in Russia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Red Rain, The True Story of an Adventurous Year in Russia by Kellogg Durland. Chapter 6, Courting Arrest. Occasional massacres of Jews, of Armenians, of Tartars, of intellectuals in interior towns, these the world knows about. Massacres are instituted to accomplish certain definite results, such as the terrorizing of a section of the population into passivity, or to coerce popular opinion in a given direction. But these occur only at intervals and in widely different sections of the empire police misrule on the other hand is constant and exists everywhere the tourist in russia is met by the police at the frontier his books are liable to confiscation his private papers to minute examination once settled in st petersburg or moscow his letters are very likely opened and frequently parts of them extracted i remember that at one time all of my letters were regularly opened by the police before they were delivered to me and more than once a page or two or perhaps a whole sheet would be missing when my letter was finally delivered the power of the police is as omniscient as it is omnipresent it is the one authority in tsardom that can descend upon the tsar himself about the time of the convocation of the duma a moscow publisher brought out a complete set of the emperor's speeches the volume was small and it was not edited nor annotated in any way yet the police confiscated the whole edition and forbade its circulation the weakness and true character of nicholas the second was so plainly revealed in the collection that this step was held to be justifiable to meet this police power casually or to read about it is one matter to live under its absolute domination is quite another 
the so-called agrarian revolts are often insurrections against the intolerable will of the police after leaving the caucasus i travelled to the town of saratov the capital of the province of the same name there to begin a journey of a few hundred miles through the peasant country spring was fast approaching at which times the ravages of hunger with greater or less rigor sweep over the peasant villages of central russia year after year incidentally i saw rather more than i anticipated particularly of the rural police you will not be permitted to travel through the district i was told in saratov city every correspondent who attempts it is arrested or turned back for one reason or another i had come more than one thousand miles to make this journey and consequently i was not of a mind to be unofficially turned aside i procured an interpreter and arranged for horses and a peculiarly russian wagon with a body of wicker like a great basket called a tarantas a troika with loud jingling bells carried us out of saratov city and straight away to the north away from all railroads and towns of size the fast greening steppe rolled to hillocks on the east and the hillocks mounted to hills higher and higher farther and farther to the east till the heights of the urals seemed to loom vaguely in the purple distance two hours out from saratov houses became fewer as far as the eye could reach to the west and north was the boundless lone steppe now and then we passed a miserable village with ugly houses of stone and mud and crumbling thatched roofs twice during the ride we passed the ruins of a landlord's house reduced to ashes by infuriated peasantry telegraph poles lay felled along the roadside saratov government borders on the majestic volga no mightier or lovelier river winds through the dominions of the czar fields which might be fertile and deschetines with wonderful possibilities for rich production roll backwards from its banks many miles yet here men faint from hunger women sink beneath the burden of days and little children waste to shadows and die the ugliest of diseases root among the people and flourish like weeds in a pasture not because nature has been scant in her provision of resources but because all development of agricultural lands is still unknown dry farming has never been heard of and irrigation projects which could so easily be carried out have never been thought of but more than all the rest perhaps is the iniquitous system of land holding that still continues where one man owns one hundred thousand deschetines two thousand men possess one deschetine each the man with the hundred thousand is rich and lives in moscow in st petersburg or paris and only occasionally visits his estates here in the interior the two thousand are born fret through their weary lives and die on the little patch of once good but now exhausted land which originally their fathers held when serfdom was abolished or their fathers fathers of many generations ago bought when colonization was encouraged by catherine or elizabeth or peter and as the demands of life to-day have multiplied since the time of catherine or even alexander i while the peasant holdings have remained the same the impossible condition which so extensively prevails throughout central and eastern russia is easy to understand when serfdom was abolished in eighteen sixty one a certain patch of land was given to each village and the village council called the mirror parcelled out this land to the individual villagers reallotting the parcels every three five or seven years according to the vote of each village since eighteen sixty one the population of many villages has doubled and some have trebled but the aggregate land holdings have remained what they were at the beginning a tract of land that was barely enough for the maintenance of say two thousand souls in eighteen sixty one is entirely inadequate in nineteen o seven for four or five thousand hence throughout this vast district of central and eastern russia life has death for neighbor the pall of famine descends upon the region in years when the crops are yielding most plentifully 
years when a frost comes or a drought or a blight the situation attains the proportions of a calamity dusk was gathering when we rumbled heavily into tsaritsyn a village of eighteen hundred inhabitants fifty-five versts from saratov our driver pulled up before a square cottage no better than the average and to all appearances like the rest in the village before we had lifted our cramped and much shaken limbs from the springless wagon which had brought us all the distance two young men strangers to us both but bursting with cordiality and pleasure at our arrival rushed out to greet us they were two medical students from the temporarily closed university of moscow come here to direct the distribution of famine relief we were their first visitors in several months and as we were soon able to see their existence is dreary enough in this remote place they come to serve the peasants to administer famine relief to look after their physical ailments and to teach them all they can of the rudiments of education at every turn they are hampered and harassed by the local police the glamour that was wont to shine round the young men and women who inaugurated the settlement movement in england and america young people of education and culture who took up their living in the midst of the darkest corners of great cities to share the results of their larger opportunities with tenement dwellers pales before the life and works of intellectual young russia the government closed the universities for they were centres of revolt but the students who have lived however briefly in the blaze of active idealism and who have been touched by the fire of enthusiasm to hasten the coming of russia's better day are not content to return simply to their homes to await the opening of their universities at the will and pleasure of a reactionary timid government the free life the glad life for russia and all her people is their goal the movement tending toward that goal is their cause we sat down with our delighted hosts to a simple evening meal and were still lingering over a companionable samovar when a clock in an adjoining room struck ten the striking had scarcely ceased when a series of heavy blows descended upon the shutters of one of the windows and a voice bawled out open open to the police one of our hosts groped through the adjoining room to light a small oil lamp near the door we in our room heard the crude rear door crack on its rusty hinges as it was swung wide the tramp of heavy feet crossed the uneven floor accompanied by the clank of spurs and the rattle of a dangling sabre a young officer of police swaggered into the room where we sat at the threshold he paused partly turned and bawled an order to the men behind him the grounding of arms echoed his words your passports demanded the officer without preliminary how many soldiers have you with you asked my companion you may count replied the officer one two three five seven ten good there are two of us the officer betrayed his impatience we handed him our american passports which we naively thought would be sufficient to induce him to respect us at that time i had not yet learned that in the heart of russia to be an american citizen means no more than to belong to one of the tribes of the iroquois indians we were possessed of other credentials in addition to our passports however and these were finally accepted though with evident reluctance during the examination our student hosts sat nonchalantly by smoking cigarettes the ceremony was familiar enough to them their quarters were searched by this same officer and his men sometimes two or three times a week and any book pamphlet or piece of handwriting that he took a fancy to declare dangerous was confiscated when the officer and his ten soldiers withdrew we could hear other feet outside the window curiosity prompted me to look out so we unbarred the shutter and let the lamplight flood the yard thirty more brown-coated soldiers were drawn up in two phalanxes later we wondered my companion and i why this search officer brought forty soldiers with him 
thirty-six hours later when we were really arrested and carried off to prison the work was done by one police officer and one rural guard toward midnight we rolled ourselves in our blankets and lay down on the floor to sleep this is the common thing in peasants houses the children and the very old sleep over the square brick stove on a little platform designed for the purpose but the rest of the family and strangers are content with the floor all that night we heard the slow tread of feet outside the windows two soldiers were keeping guard not till the larks had been up an hour in the adjoining fields and day was fairly come did these sentinels retire early next morning peasants from the village began to wait upon us we were friends of their friends and that was enough they unbared the hardness of their lives with perfect freedom one old man told us that he had been in jail no less than eight times because he had repeatedly volunteered to carry to the czar their little father the petition of the village setting forth their wrongs it seemed still to be the firm belief of these peasants that their condition was as it was because the czar had never come to know of their plight it was a striking fact throughout russia that often among the most revolutionary peasants there was even down to the spring of nineteen o six strong loyalty to the czar their revolt was against the government hedged round the czar and barring the little father from his people the first duma dispelled this belief almost universally but the first duma was at this time a month away three old musiques with long white beards and clear blue eyes told the story of how they and five others had gone as a deputation to the then governor of the province hoping that he would open the way to the czar for them as a result of their faith they were stripped to the waist and flogged another was of a much larger deputation more than sixty thirty of these were sent to prison for a short time and thirty-six received one hundred blows each when they found that we were sympathetic listeners they begged us to come and see the roofs of some of their houses which were being daily torn away to feed the horses as the roofs were largely composed of straw thatch there was a certain amount of nourishment in them a last resource in the fight against the universal hunger do you have big landowners in america one man asked eagerly are people prevented from earning enough to live on year after year all of the questions asked us were vital they were frank enough about owning to revolt what's to be done they said the mere renting of land is eighteen roubles nine dollars a deshatine for a season where's the money to come from to pay for this the land is ours we do the work and we should have it that very week a cossack officer and a police officer had summoned all the people of the village together and warned them that if any of the land belonging to the landlords was touched that the village would be fired from the four corners and they would not be responsible for what happened to the people in the village the land referred to belonged to two vast estates whose owners had not even seen them for years several hundred thousand acres lying absolutely idle the welcome we received at pesky our next stopping place was if possible more demonstrative than at tsaritsyn the group of intellectuals here numbered four two women and two men they had gathered there in early november and in six months we were their first visitors one of the students was acting as the village schoolmaster the other was devoting himself entirely to the famine relief work the women were both remarkable personalities they had first met each other in a st petersburg prison where they had both been confined for political offences one a woman of twenty-five large and strong and fearless still carried the mark of a cossack nagaika across her forearm and in one of her shoulders was a cossack bullet her husband at the time of my visit was in prison she had received an ordinary finishing school education and begun the study of medicine during the war she volunteered as a nurse in the red cross organization and was sent to manchuria but she was returned home for scattering seeds of sedition among the army 
pesky we found to be in an even more serious condition than tsaritsyn the total population was about twenty one hundred and the number of meals dispersed each day was more than eighteen hundred in other words only three hundred souls or less than seventy-five families were self-supporting one who passes through this district well understands how the peasants have come to feel that it is better to chance the bullets and the cossack nagaika than endure passively the long-drawn sufferings of the life on their inadequate deshetines they are almost without hope and the hopeless are ever fearless industry intensified and lengthened to most cruel drudgery has little reward severest toil early and late and desperately constant while the season lasts still is not productive of sufficient recompense to supply bread through the months when the fields lie buried under snowdrifts there was no mistaking the attitude of the peasants toward the young relief workers as we walked through the village streets with them children ran beside them or called out to them old women addressed the women as sister to the men they were comrades we entered many homes during the two days that we remained in this village in each hut however small in every cottage no matter how keen the distress we were welcomed with obvious gladness in one cramped hovel we found a young mother prostrate upon a pile of rags on the floor very low with typhoid fever immediately beside her lay a child of three with scarlatina and suspended from the ceiling over both their heads a crude cradle in which lay an unweaned baby which the mother was still nursing in another we found a girl of eight wasted to a skeleton with inherited syphilis an older sister had died of the same disease two months before a boy lay at death's door with scurvy and so from house to house we went looking upon scenes too dreadful to portray yet everywhere a smile greeted our entrance in one house we found a very young girl about to become a mother the russian peasant is very strict in his attitude toward young girls and sad and heavy is the lot of any peasant girl who sins this girl dared not show herself out of her hut for fear of being publicly hooted she was much exercised over the fate of her child for she told us that the priest would not bless it at birth her mother then begged one of our party to come and offer some little prayer which would save the child from the damnation which should justly fall upon the child mother an old man with a long white beard rushed out from another house as we passed and exhibited a wounded foot which he begged us to bandage finally we were taken to the local duma building a town hall where all the males of twenty-one years of age and over gather from time to time to discuss the affairs of the community about forty men followed us there and at the first opportunity began pouring out questions almost without exception these queries had to do with the land in america did all the people starve half the year unless given food by the government or by some other agency what did we do with landlords in america who could not possibly work or use the land and yet would not allow the people to use it these and other questions were put to us with great directness at last i asked them what they proposed to do for themselves there was silence for a minute then one man more outspoken than the rest said we look to the duma to give the land to us we feel that it belongs to us and we have confidence in the duma and if you do not get it the men stirred uneasily then the soldiers have robbed us of our guns said one at last but we have left to us our wood axes and our scythes we cannot endure starvation any longer this is the spirit that led to something over sixteen hundred agrarian disturbances during the year nineteen o six incipient jacquerie foreshadowing i believe greater uprisings soon to overtake russia that night about ten o'clock as we sat in the house of our friends we heard the soft tinkling of a balalaika outside the windows and presently the sound of many voices singing they were low and restrained but the words were clear 
the music fairly thrilled us as we sat round the oil lamp in our last samovar it was the stirring marche funebre with words by gorky at midnight we left pesky our friends feared that perhaps they had been indiscreet in allowing the discussion in the little duma building to continue so long free speech is a dangerous thing in russia even under the constitution my companion and i in our eagerness to grasp the actual state of mind of the peasants had encouraged plain speaking we had even spoken with more frankness than discretion ourselves there had been forty or more men in the room when we began our interview and the number had soon swelled we were hopeful that all were friendly but in russia one never knows the night was wonderful moonless but starried as we drove out of the yard our friends the four who were feeding tending and revolutionizing pesky took up the refrain the peasants had sung in serenade two hours before the last sounds we heard were the voices of this brave little band singing ever so softly but with oh so much feeling the refrain of the peasants marseillaise our road turned out to be terribly rough in places it ran to a mere trail which more than once we lost then we had to retrace our way or circle about till we found it again the wagon in which we rode was springless and every jolt became painful a little after three o'clock the larks began to sing with the earliest light in the east we could see them quivering high in air joyously hailing the day the dawn wind came up chill and struck us to the marrow we shivered and drew our blankets closer round us five o'clock had sounded when we drove into a post-station village where we were to change horses we told the men to make ready the fresh troika quickly in the meantime we would order a samovar and eggs at the post-house the aged mistress of the place was already stirring when we entered and she promised us the tea and eggs directly but before the water had come to the boil we were placed under arrest and our plans for the remainder of our trip altered in the name of the czar end of chapter six section nine of the red rain the true story of an adventurous year in russia this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. The Red Rain, The True Story of an Adventurous Year in Russia by Kellogg Durland Chapter 7 In Prison Sleep laid siege to us. Instantly we entered the warm room of the station house. I noticed two girls asleep in a bed in one corner of the room and a young man, rolled in an overcoat, on the bare floor, snoring loudly in the opposite corner. More than twenty hours had passed since we had slept, and our painful night ride had wearied me excessively. Furthermore, I was faint with hunger and eager for a glass of hot tea. I dropped into a chair by the table and lolled back into it, nodding miserably, while the old woman of the station polished her samovar. When I opened my eyes, a rural policeman stood before me, and with him was the chief of the local police. We submitted gracefully to his long and searching examination. Who were we? What were we? What were we doing in that place? Where had we come from? Why did we go there? By whose authority were we traveling through the country? These and many other questions were rapidly put to us, and as promptly answered. We produced our American passports, our Russian credentials, our photographic permit, Still, this officer persisted in trying to discover a flaw in one of our papers. Suddenly, he pointed to the Saratov stamp on the back of our passports. It is customary for travelers in Russia to send their passports to the police to be examined and stamped immediately upon arrival in every town of any size. This is almost invariably done through the hotel office. A few days before, when we had arrived in Saratov, we had followed the custom and surrendered our passports to the hotel. In due course, they had come back to us, properly stamped, as we had reason to believe. The chief of police put his finger on these Saratov stamps and declared that they had not been put there by the police. We asked him how we accounted for them, and he replied, You probably put them on yourselves. The tea and eggs had now been set on the table. 
and I called for two extra glasses and chairs and begged the police master and the Strajnik to join us at our modest breakfast, adding that we would all feel more like continuing conversation after we had drunk hot tea. The police master wavered, but we pressed him until he and the Strajnik both fell to upon the eggs and tea with as much apparent relish as my companion and I, who had been on the road since midnight. I have been pacing that road all night, remarked the Strajnik. What for? I asked politely. You. We changed the topic for a few minutes and talked pleasantly of the weather, the spring plowing, and other safe topics, hoping to bring out the friendly side of the men in order that we might find out what we were in for. The other day at Alexanderburg, you photographed the priest, at last said the chief of police. We looked at him and laughed. What of it? we asked. Antichrist, he replied. Ah, that was interesting. Several days before, when passing through Alexanderburg, we had found a village priest, in the midst of a quaint Easter-time ceremony, going from house to house, blessing the bread, which was to be eaten immediately after the close of the Lenten fast. He had with him several acolytes and assistants, and the picture they presented was full of color and quaint interest. We asked the priest if he objected to being photographed, and he not only readily consented, but expressed his pleasure at the suggestion. When we had taken several photographs of him and his followers, we put a shining silver ruble on the plate he carried. Such unwanted liberality evidently had excited his suspicions, to the extent that he had reported the matter to the police. You paid one ruble and a half, seventy-five cents, for two dinners at Mordois, went on the police master impressively. What else? we asked. At Sir Ritson, you visited the free dining rooms and photographed the village baths. We now realize that we have been followed every step of the way, or else a report had been received from each place we had passed through. The only village which the chief failed to mention was Pesky, from which we had just come. This was the one place where we had been indiscreet. The report of a spy upon the informal meeting, which we had quite without forethought been instrumental in gathering the night before, might easily have been construed to our serious disadvantage. Certainly, we would be convicted for propaganda, possibly of a yet more serious offense, which would mean expulsion from the country, or worse. We chatted with the two men in uniform, with all the nonchalance we could muster. We plied them with tea and boiled eggs. At last, the police master, in a sudden burst of frankness, exclaimed, It's all a mistake. The man's a fool. The man took from his pocket a paper and spread it on the table before us. I have no right to do it, he said, but I want to convince you that I am not responsible. The Starshina wrote to the Zemsvo Nechelnik, who has ordered your arrest. We have had men posted on all the roads all night waiting for you. A Starshina is a man of the people, elected by the people every three years, to preside over the meetings of several villages in a given district, which are called to consider matters of local interest. The Zemsvo Nechelnik is a superior officer who presides over a larger district, a section of a government. Read this for yourselves, said the police master. We read. The general charge against us was propaganda, but when we read the specific charges, they were all so ridiculous that we sat back in dumb amazement. 1. We had photographed a priest, therefore we were antichrist. 2. We had paid one ruble and a half for two meals. The comment to this was to the effect that no one would throw away money like this who did not have an ulterior motive for winning the goodwill of the people. 3. One of us, namely myself, had a small pointed beard and looked like a Jew. 4. This man, namely myself, had false hair. 5. This same man smoked a gold pipe. The first two clauses were understandable. We had photographed the priest asked his permission, and then given him a ruble. And we had paid 75 cents for our meals, and were willing to admit that we might properly have paid less. But the woman who had prepared these meals was very old, and her abject poverty aroused our pity. The other charges were less clear. I have been mistaken for French, German, Swedish, and Russian at one time or another. But never before has anyone suggested I might be Jewish. As for my hair being false, I have worn it since birth. I never saw a gold pipe that I can recall. I certainly never owned one.
There must be something back of all this, said my companion when we had read the paper to the end. The conclusion drawn from these charges, as penned at the bottom of the page, was that all these strange and unusual things about us made us suspicious persons, and probably we were propagandists. The fact that there was no reference to Pesky only added to our fears, and forced us to the conclusion that this preliminary and seemingly slight report against us was merely as a blind and an excuse for taking us into custody the more serious charges would be forthcoming at the proper moment, we were convinced. However, we agreed to assume nothing, and to shake free of the threatening entanglement as speedily as possible. It soon developed that we were anticipating without reckoning with our captors. Any little man of brief authority may order an arrest. But as we were destined to learn, only a governor or a governor-general can order a release and the way from a remote village Starshina to the governor is long and tedious. Since we must appear before a magistrate, or whatever corresponds to a magistrate, let us go and have it over with him, I said, when the last egg was eaten and our samovar exhausted. We can leave the luggage here. But it is eighteen verst, answered the police master. Eighteen versts? I had supposed we were to be taken across the road or around the corner. You may as well pay your driver, the police master went on. We reluctantly dismissed our man and sadly watched the fresh horses, which had been made ready for us unharnessed and returned to their stable. Prisoners we literally were, despite the good will of the police master that we had been at such pains to win. The soldier, who had first intruded upon us, was left to guard us, while the police master retired to write his report to his superior, to whom we were to be delivered in the next village, eighteen versts away. We were not permitted to leave the room, but several men about the station joined us and freely sympathized with us. One took occasion to warn us that we would surely be thoroughly searched at some near period, and if we had any compromising letters or papers about us, we had better get rid of them. It so happened that I had in my portfolio a letter from a friend in New York, in which was described a scheme which had been launched in America in aid of free Russia. This scheme included the issuance of a series of facsimile greenbacks stamped The United States of Russia. I knew well enough that the letter would unquestionably incriminate us under the present circumstances. By stealth, I succeeded in extracting the letter from its place and tearing it into small pieces. But how to get rid of it was a puzzle. I carried the torn pieces in the palm of my hand for a long time. Nor did I see a chance to drop them until the wagon was being made ready which was to carry us on our way. While the police master and the soldier were talking together, I succeeded in dropping the little ball of torn paper unnoticed into a hole in the ground. Then, as I turned around, I tripped over a peat brick. A discussion arose as to the number of horses we should have. The government furnished only one, the police master told us. But we might have two more by paying for them ourselves. The idea of paying to be carried to prison did not appeal to either of us. So it was finally decided to give us two, inasmuch as there would be four men in the wagon, including our guard and the driver. The wagon was a kind of basket on trucks. There were no seats. An armful of straw was placed in the bottom, and on this we sat. There was a simple seat for the driver, and the Strachnik who was to accompany us shared the driver's seat. Only his back was to the horses, and his feet in the wagon, his legs so spread apart that mine stretched between his. His rifle lay across his knees, and his saber rested against his side. Fearsome prisoners you have, I ventured. Every man who has two legs and uses them is liable to arrest these days, he replied. By the time Liskey was reached, we were on fairly friendly terms with our guard. We were taken directly to the local gendarmerie, which was all the jail the town possessed. The room we were led to was of moderate size, containing two benches, a table, and a bed. An armed guard was placed in our room with us, and periodically changed every few hours, up to the time of our leaving the following day. A priest of, and indeed, every official of authority was away, and we were informed that we must await the return of either the priest of or Zemsto Nachalnik. Toward evening, we grew very hungry. For since early morning we had had nothing to eat, and then only the inevitable tea and boiled eggs. We must feed you, we are bound to do that, said the gracious chief of the gendarmes. 
But at seven o'clock, there was still no food forthcoming. Can you not find us some bread and cheese? We asked. Cheese. People here do not know how to hold their mouth for cheese, replied our guard. Plain bread, then, we said. Any food would be better than none. The gendarme told us that he had had nothing since morning either, and that when the famine was on, they all had become accustomed to living on next to nothing. He was most philosophical about it. The milk, he explained, was not good, and all food, except black bread and eggs and tea, was scarce. We did not relish the idea of being detained long in that kind of a place, so we begged our guards to hurry us on to Saratov that night, for we were told that the return of the proper authorities was a matter of complete uncertainty, and if we wished, we might be transferred to Saratov. This we did desire most ardently. The distance to Saratov was fifty-eight firsts, and we were promised an immediate start if fresh horses could be procured in the village. Two gendarmes were commissioned to secure these horses. For a long time they did not return, and when they did it was with the report that there were not two horses in the village in condition to start that night. So we reluctantly abandoned all hope of pushing on before the following day, and then turned our attention once again to the food question which was becoming serious. A samovar was promised us directly. Earlier in the day, we had attempted to send a message to friends in Saratov, but were prevented. We now learned that telegraphic communication between this place and Saratov had been temporarily resumed, whereupon we thought to inform friends of our plight. In case the situation developed, the serious aspect which we had reason to believe it might. My companion broached the matter to our guard, who called another guard, who said he would go with one of us to the telegraph office. My companion started. At the very door of the office, they were overtaken by a messenger from the chief of the gendarmes, forbidding us to send any message by telegraph or otherwise. This made us feel more than ever that we had been acquainted with only part of the report concerning us. Furthermore, our guards were extremely watchful of us. Their attitude clearly indicated that they were impressed with our importance, or possible importance. In the meantime, I grew restless in the stuffy room where we were confined, and asked that I might go out for a breath of air. My request was granted, but a guard with a gun accompanied me. Some small boys were at play in the road. Their game was the ball game played with a miniature catapult. I watched them a little while, and then made to join them. This seemed to please them, and until dark stopped us, I continued to play with the boys. My guard standing by, all the while, amused and ever watchful. On his way back from the telegraph office, my companion succeeded in negotiating with someone for four eggs, which were boiled for us, and served when the samovar was at last ready. Weary and worn with our long journey, without sleep and still very hungry, we stretched out on the narrow wooden benches shortly after nine o'clock, and I, at least, slept soundly till five o'clock in the morning. The only bed in the room was used by our guards. They did not lie down, but reclined against the pillows, their rifles always in their hands, ready for instant use. A little before seven o'clock the following morning, we were en route for Saratov. As on the previous day, we had two horses and a wagon without seats. Our driver proved to be an out-and-out -out revolutionist. He freely damned the army, the police, and every representative of the government. He even rebelled at sharing his seat with our guard and tried to make him walk. He sympathized with all who fell under the finger of the authorities, whether for political or criminal offenses. Such recklessness of speech is unusual and is accounted for by the fact that this uncouth lout felt physically superior to the guard and had little terror of his authority. A few versts out of town, he held the horses to a slow walk. Why don't you go faster? we asked. You'll soon enough be under lock and key, he answered cheerfully. Make the most of the sunshine while you have it. God knows when you'll get more of it. Midway, my interpreter suddenly remembered a letter in his pocketbook, which contained the names and addresses of several prominent revolutionists. His tardy recollection of this document startled us both for there seemed to be no way of disposing of it. Our guard was so painfully watchful. We succeeded in transferring it under our coats from his hand to mine, and I slowly and patiently tore it to small bits, 
and, as often as seemed possible, dropped one bit at a time out of the wagon. This was a long and delicate business, for if we had been discovered, it would have added one more embarrassing charge against us. From the point where we effected the transfer of the paper from his hands to mine to the point where the last scrap was dropped was twelve versts. The long, dusty ride to Saratov came to an end early in the afternoon. At the edge of the town, we asked our guard to permit us to stop at a fruit store and purchase oranges, but this he curtly refused. We found a sweet revenge for this in a moment. The axle of our wagon suddenly broke and threw us all out into the street. When it was found that it would be impossible to immediately repair the damage, our guard ordered us to pick up our luggage and march on. This we politely declined to do. Go with him we would. There was no alternative. But carry our luggage we certainly would not. We also reminded him that he was responsible for it as well as ourselves. Whereupon he gathered our bags and blankets under his arm and struggled on with them, sweating like a stevedore, his gun and saber very much in the way. That we made an unusual spectacle was evident from the attention bestowed upon us by the townspeople. First, we were marched to the office of the Priestov, but he was out of town. Then to the office of the Espravnik, and he was out of town. Then you must go somewhere, said the guard. Do you mean to prison? Yes, until the Priestov comes. Again, we made an effort to communicate with friends. Take the dogs away. Don't stand there talking. We turned at these words and looked upon the watchman. He, at least, had not been impressed with our importance from our appearance. The prison to which we were conducted was nearby, and a messenger had evidently announced her coming, for we were led immediately and without ceremony to a cell about ten feet long by five feet broad, one of a row each one just like the next. The face of an old man with gray beard was pressed against the peephole of the adjoining cell. We entered the one to which we were assigned, both of us in one, and the heavy timber door banged shut behind us. The cell was mostly below the ground. Flush with the ceiling was a small window, which looked out level with the ground. At one end of the cell was a bare wooden platform, like a wide shelf. This was the only bed provided. In a corner near to the ceiling was a small icon. Other furniture there was none. Many initials and names were inscribed on the walls, most of them cut with a knife or other sharp instrument. We settled ourselves as best we could and tried to devise a plan of release. The vermin, which always swarm in Russian prisons, were not slow in discovering us, and it became evident that we must sooner or later submit to their persistent attacks. It was, indeed, several weeks before I entirely got rid of the effects of those pestiferous creatures. In due time, a keeper came to inform us we might send for any food or drink we desired. This was an improvement over the gendarmerie where we had passed the previous night, but we were now bent on getting out rather than making ourselves permanently comfortable. We put a few questions to the guard, which he answered readily. What kind of prisoners are usually put into this cell? Anybody. Civil and criminal prisoners, as well as political? Yes, anybody. How long are we to remain here? Till the Priestov comes. Where is he? I don't know. When will he be here? I don't know. Have you no idea what time he will arrive? Will it be in an hour, or not until night? Oh, he is away. He may be back in a week, or he may not be here for a month. And we must wait for him? Perhaps a month? Yes. We then explained to him at length that we were American citizens, that we should be taken immediately before some authority and given ample satisfaction for such treatment. After much argument, he consented to take a message for us to a certain superior officer's assistant. The answer came back. The prisoners must wait till the Priestov comes. We sent a more imperative message, demanding that someone be sent to us without delay. Nothing's to be done, keep still, was the answer returned. A story had recently been told us of a German subject who had been arrested in that very province and all trace of him lost. The German government had pressed its inquiries, but to no end. The man had disappeared as completely 
as if the earth had swallowed him. At last, after two years, he was found in a prison like ours. He had been locked up there and forgotten. Our arrest might work out in the same way. A most discouraging thought. In the first place, the real charges against us might be serious in themselves, and whether they were or not, we were in prison. No one in the world knew of our whereabouts, and we might lie there till we rotted, without discovering any means of escape or rescue. It is this absolute uncertainty of the outcome that makes arrest in Russia so distinctly unpleasant. After reflecting upon thoughts like these for a time, my companion and I began to feel a bit desperate. The plan we finally adopted was a simple one. In the door of our cell was a small window looking into the corridor. Every time we heard a footstep up or down the corridor, we placed our faces close to the little window and raised our voices right lustily in a prolonged miserere. We fairly yelled ourselves hoarse. At last, an officer had come to see who the two disturbers were. By this man, we sent a third appeal to the commanding officer of the prison, and a third message was brought back to us. I command the prisoners to be silent. The third day of our arrest, we were paroled pending an investigation by order of the governor, who, by the way, was M. Stolipin, soon to be introduced to the world as the Prime Minister of Russia. Nothing of a serious nature was discovered against us, and in due time we were released. There was no apology, no explanation. The Espravnik ventured to congratulate us that we were not flogged by some of the gendarmes. This often happens, he told us, and we were lucky to have escaped. We had evidently run amok of the utterly stupid police administration, which the peasants are finding intolerable. During the year 1906, I was arrested five times, and this instance is thoroughly characteristic of each performance. A traveler like myself finds it inconvenient and annoying. The peasants find it brutal and not infrequently cruel. Whatever of faith has been lost in the Tsar, the direct aim of the jackery of the next few years will be the landlords and the police administration. End of chapter 7 Section 10 of The Red Rain The True Story of a Year in Russia This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rita Boutros The Red Rain, The True Story of a Year in Russia by Kellogg Durland Chapter 8, Part 1 A Visit to Marie Spiridonova Adjoining the province of Saratov, where I was arrested, is Tambov, another government within the famine belt, where the long northern winters are more bitter because of the cruel ravages of starvation and hideous disease, and where there is, worst of all, the living, stalking dread of inhuman officialdom, martial law, which means Cossack excesses, police brutality, and governmental impositions that warrant the maddest crimes of men. Here lived a young woman of twenty-one, a modern Charlotte Corday, who, early in the year 1906, killed the lieutenant governor of the province. When her ghastly deed had been noised abroad, and the penalty she paid, the peasants gathered in their churches to offer thanksgiving and praise for using this girl as an instrument of his divine justice. At the moment that I emerged from my Saratov experience, Marie Spirodinova was the most talked-of person in Russia, and perhaps the most notable prisoner in the world. The grim, whitewashed walls of Tambov prison held her securely, while newspapers in Russia that dared to set forth the facts of her deed and the treatment she afterward received were confiscated by the police, and a Spiridonova League in France rolled up a lengthy list of subscribers. Correspondents from Germany, from France, from England, were sent to Tambov to penetrate those stern walls and gather from the girl's own lips the tragic story that was then thrilling a nation and interesting a continent. But for once neither diplomacy nor influence were of avail. Marie's isolation was absolute, 
and no one save her mother was privileged to so much as see her. In the meantime, alarming reports of her precarious condition were emanating from Tambov, and in many sections there was intense excitement concerning her. It seemed well-nigh hopeless for me to reach her. Yet I greatly desire to interview this daring spirit, and to verify the extraordinary details of her ill-treatment that had kindled such intense feeling throughout Russia. Through the merest chance I succeeded. No one else has seen her or talked with her, even up to the present time. She is now at hard labor in the mines of Akatui in central Siberia. The story of Marie Spiradinova, which I set out to examine, was as follows. The lieutenant-governor of the province of Tambov, one Luchanovsky, was one of the most tyrannical administrators in all Russia. His systematic cruelty and excessive severity spread terror throughout all the district where his power extended. He ordered the flogging of peasants and the burning of homes, it was said that he did not rebuke, if he did not actually and openly encourage, Cossack outrages, and all who knew of the inhumanities he practiced and encouraged declared that for so wicked a man this world had no place. One day Luchanovsky was in a village where some Cossacks captured a young peasant girl, and kept her a while for their sport. When they had done with her, they threw her dishonored body into a nearby lake. Marie Spiridonova chanced to be in the village when this happened, and she knew that Luchanovsky was aware of this incident, and that he took no steps either to punish or to prevent further outrage. A few days later, Luchanovsky stood on a railroad station platform, waiting for a coming train. With a browning revolver in her hand, Marie Spiridonova, from a longish range, took careful aim and fired five shots, each shot taking effect, though Luchinovsky did not die till a month afterward. During the time of his lingering death, Marie wrote from her prison cell to her sister, I gave him five bullets. I did not know he was so thick as to need a cannon. She turned the sixth bullet toward her own breast, but not before a crowd, mostly soldiers, closed round her, tore the revolver from her hand, and began to beat her. They tore her clothing from her body. A Cossack officer seized her by the plate of her hair, brown hair, dark and wavy, and threw her forcibly to the ground. Consciousness left her. Eyewitnesses told how the officer then grasped one of her ankles and dragged her along the ground to a carriage in which she was conveyed to a nearby gendarmerie. In this temporary prison she was in charge of two men, the same Cossack officer Zidanov, who had dragged her away, and a police officer of the rank of Pristov named Abramov. These two men remained with their prisoner, and began drinking heavily of vodka. Then they stripped their prisoner, stark naked, and even at the sight of her bruised and bleeding body, did not stop their hellish inquisition of sensuous debauchery and torture. They scarred her quivering flesh with the lighted ends of their cigarettes. They caressed and they pounded her by turns. Immediately afterward, all of these revolting details were given to the world, yet no steps were taken by the officials or by the government to in any way reprove or censure these two men, one an officer of the police, the other an army officer. A writer in a prominent Moscow paper dared to speak out against this shame and declared fearlessly that this girl had deliberately and thoughtfully staked her life against the life of a tyrant, in order that her people might be saved from his administration of blood and suffering. For this temerity the paper was at once suppressed, and not only the writer, but the whole editorial staff was forced to flee into hiding. Marie Spiridonova was an assassin, therefore the military court decreed that she should die. Such was the situation when I visited Tambov. 
The outcry which went up against taking the life of this girl eventually became so loud that her sentence was commuted to twenty years at hard labor. But at the time of my visit she was still under sentence of death, before presenting my request for an interview to any official in Tamboff, I decided to cultivate the acquaintance of the governor of the province, to discover what manner of man I had to deal with. With this in view, I called at the official residence the morning after my arrival in the city, and in due time was presented to His Excellency, Governor Zanugovich. For an hour we discussed the agrarian situation, the famine, the Duma elections, and other topics pertinent to the hour, but never a word of the real object of my visit. The governor proved most affable and hospitable, and he extended a cordial invitation to me to dine with him. At dinner we toasted the Tsar, President Roosevelt, the Duma, and ourselves. We talked politics, art, literature, travel, and epicureanism. My host was a charmingly cultivated man, and he impressed me as a much more competent and conscientious administrator than other governors whom I had met. The next man below me at table was the police master of Tamboff. Casually he asked me if I knew about Marie Spiradinova. I was startled by the abruptness with which he introduced the subject that was giving me so much concern, but I answered carelessly, I have seen her name in the papers. The papers say terrible things about our treatment of her, he added. Newspapers are the same the world over, I responded diplomatically. After a pause, the police master went on. It is very hard on an official like myself. You see, she is in a prison in my city, and many people, revolutionists and fanatics, believe I am responsible for all the cruelties that the newspapers say she has suffered. Did you know the man she shot? I asked. Yes, and while I cannot countenance assassination, I must say that he was a very bad man and deserved all he got. This was the first time an official had ever been so outspoken, and I was surprised. The next thing he said fairly made my heart thump. So many lies have been told about this girl, that I wish someone who would tell the literal truth would interview her, and give the facts to the world. Up to now no one has seen her at all. I should think you could easily find someone to do that, I replied. No, said he, it is not easy to find someone you can trust. With all the nonchalance I could command, I then said, If you care to arrange for me to see her, I will not only report truthfully, but I will show you my report before I publish it. The man looked deeply grateful, and at once petitioned the governor to grant me permission to visit the much-talked-of prisoner in her cell. The governor hesitated at first, but finally consented. Thus, before I had really begun the difficult task of securing entrance to the prison, the whole matter seemed settled for me. In the light of the revelations that followed, I can only explain the attitude of the police master and the governor in one way. Both of them are honest men, and neither had, up to that time, I really believe, a true version of the story. No attempt was made to prejudice me against Spirodonova. I will grant you permission to see her, and I shall be interested in learning your opinion, was all the governor said. The police master offered to escort us to the prison himself. I was to be accompanied by Mr. Nahum Lubushitz of London, a photographer and interpreter. The rendezvous was at the prison gate at three o'clock in the afternoon. We arrived first, Lubushitz and I. A soldier in a long brown coat, with a gun over his shoulder, paced slowly before the great iron gate that joined the strong walls. "'Please don't look so intently, sir,' he said, approaching. "'Why?' "'The superior officer is very severe,' he answered. "'He will punish me if you look so sharply at the prison.' As if mortal eye could penetrate those walls, as the clock struck three, a carriage drove up, and the police master joined us. 
a peephole cut in the small door of the huge gate was slipped back in response to the heavy knock sounded by the chief of police a pair of eyes surveyed us and the small door was thrown open the chief bowed his head to escape the low portal and stepped in we followed several soldiers stood in the breach between the outer wall and the prison proper these saluted we went directly to the contora or office where we found the prison master a burly blue-eyed sandy-bearded fellow who looked the bully now the rank of prison master is equal with the rank of police master and between these two men as also with the commander of the military forces in and about the prison who again is of equal rank is a constant clash and friction the police master presented us to the prison master and told him we had come to see spiridonova the prison master greeted us pleasantly enough surveyed us with obvious and open suspicion and replied that this we might not do without a written order from the governor the chief told him that the governor had sanctioned our coming and asked him to escort us this made little impression upon the little czar whose kingdom is encircled with iron bars and strong walls it took a good deal of persuasion to get him to yield even to the extent of telephoning to the governor to learn if it was his wish that we should see Spirodonova. This was finally done, however, and an affirmative answer received. The prison master, from the moment we entered the prison, put every obstacle in our way that he could, and took advantage of every opportunity to thwart our purpose, which was to get the true story of the girl from her own lips. When the governor telephoned that he had asked the police master to accompany us, to see that every courtesy was extended to us, and to ensure that we saw Marie Spiridonova in her own cell, there seemed nothing else for the prison master to do but to yield. Shackles, clamped round human ankles, clanked and rattled in the dark, damp corridors down which we were led. At a turning stood a group of politicals, beardless college boys in their student jackets we crossed a yard past the windows of a workshop where busy looms rattled a long low workshop from which issued noises of the forge of iron welting and hammer strokes stood in the centre of the yard we passed round it and entered a court at the end of which stood a similar but smaller building of whitewashed stone and low roof with iron grated windows the door stood to one side and was approached by a small wooden porch we entered the outer door and turned abruptly to the left and stood before a barred door with a small peephole crossed by iron cut at eye level the chief of police headed our file i followed and at my heels mr lubushitz behind him the prison master a military officer several soldiers and three prison officials the chief threw open the door and held it wide with extended arm for me to pass in first i stepped over the threshold and stood face to face with the most famous terrorist in russia end of chapter eight part one Section 11 of The Red Rain The True Story of a Year in Russia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rita Boutros. The Red Rain The True Story of a Year in Russia by Kellogg Durland. Chapter 8, Part 2. She was a delicate girl, with soft blue eyes that deepened to violet, as the pink in her clear cheeks deepened to a hectic red as she talked. Her wavy brown hair was parted in the middle, and draped over her temples to hide hideous scars left by the kicks of the Cossacks. Her costume was a simple blue prison dress. She stood quietly, awaiting our approach, a little mystified, apparently. The chief of police was the first to speak. 
mademoiselle he said removing his hat and addressing her with all the courtesy of a gentleman approaching any lady in his wife's drawing-room mademoiselle these gentlemen are from america they would like to talk with you for a few minutes if you feel equal to it certainly she replied and turned with a grateful smile toward me with characteristic delicacy the very polite chief of police at once withdrew and as long as we remained with her he continued to pace the outer court not so the prison master soldiers and other officials do you speak french mademoiselle i asked yes monsieur a little or german what about english a little she answered laughing nervously she was still standing there was but one chair in the room a wooden chair this i drew toward her and she sat down as she did so her handkerchief dropped from her hand we all noticed it for it was wet and stained with blood Lubushitz picked it up and handed it to her as he turned away i saw beads of cold sweat standing on his brow and he told me afterward that he thought he was on the point of fainting once i knew all the languages monsieur she went on but since my head was hurt i find it difficult to remember her voice was soft and rich even melodious are you comfortable and well i asked with awkwardness i must confess je suis très malade the prison master interrupted speak only in russian he said we knew it would be difficult to talk freely in a language which he and the soldiers understood and so lubushitz began at once to photograph her while he was doing this i stood near her and as frequently as seemed expedient we exchanged sentences in french did you come to tamboff expressly to see me monsieur yes mademoiselle of course then people are talking about me they are indeed and not in russia only but in other countries in france there is a spira de nova league speak russian commanded the prison master as she leaned against the white wall near her barred window she said that is what i mind most monsieur that soldier who is always looking in at me her head rested against the cold plaster and a half shadow fell across her face her delicate mouth was drawn tight but her eyes shot bright glances toward us she was so pathetically glad at our coming probably the first bit of cheerful change since her incarceration in the room was a dingy bed and a shaky table which with the one chair comprised all of the furniture as she talked a beautiful expression played over her regular features and i thought of the word applied to her by the police master exalté to see you mademoiselle i ventured again in french one would think that you looked upon your situation here as if it were the hour of your greatest happiness ah monsieur in a way i am happy but a hand rested on my shoulder once too often had we defied the authorities very well i answered let her tell her story in russian from the very beginning she may not speak further added the prison master but we came here to listen to her story that is impossible but we have the governor's permission have you it in writing the police master is our cicerone we called to him and asked him if it was not his understanding that we were to hear her story from her own lips assuredly it was the governor's express wish he answered i cannot permit it sternly returned the prison master you must that is why i came with them to see that they got every word from her i am the responsible man here and i cannot permit her to speak the parley continued but the prison master was obdurate at last spiro de nova spoke believe absolutely nothing unless you hear it from me she uttered the words slowly distinctly each syllable weighted with meaning the situation was most uncomfortable. The police master was deeply embarrassed and annoyed. The prison master grim. Spiro de Nova cool, contained, and, in her attitude toward the prison master, defiant and scornful. Turning to me, the police master said, The man is a fool, a beast. 
does he not see that here is his opportunity to clear away those awful charges what story can you report now that he would not let you talk to her fool the prison master was determined that the story of marie spiradonova should not be told us by her recognizing the futility of further parleying i finally asked her if the letter she had succeeded in smuggling out to a friend a little while before was true in every detail yes she answered in every word when the interview was forced to a conclusion i extended my hand toward her her fingers closed round mine with a firm and certain grip she looked me fairly in the eyes I felt that I stood in the presence of one whose inner calm was strong and whose motives were as noble as pure. It was Napoleon who said, One may be deceived in a face, but in a hand never. The hand of Spirodinova is large and full. Her fingers are slightly tapering, but strong. The hand of a strong woman. Monsieur, she called as I stepped over the threshold, take my greetings to France to england and to america her letter describing the incidents which followed her shooting of lushanovsky is a remarkable transcript of a present-day inquisition here is the body of the letter when i had fired five times at him the escort recovered themselves the platform was crowded with cossacks and there were shouts of strike slash fire and swords were drawn when I saw this, I thought my end had come, and I decided not to give myself up alive. With this in view, I pointed my revolver at my head, when I was stunned by several blows, and fell flat on the platform. Further blows on the face and head sent a thrill of pain through my whole body. I tried to say, leave me, to be shot, but blows fell continuously. I tried to protect my face with my hands, but they were pushed away with the butts of the rifles. Then the Cossack officers seized me by my braid of hair, lifted me up bodily, and with a great swing threw me down on the platform. I lost my senses. My hands were unclasped, and the blows fell on my face and head. Then they dragged me by one leg down the staircase, my head bumping on each step. Then they took me again by the braid and lifted me on to the vehicle of the Isvostchik. They took me to a house, and the Cossack officer asked me my name. When making the attempt, I had decided not to hide my name, but at this moment I forgot my name. They beat me again on the face and breast. When I was taken to the police station, they undressed me and searched me, and took me to a cold cell with a wet, dirty stone floor. At about noon or one o'clock, the assistant chief of police, Zidanov, and a Cossack officer, Abramov, came. They stayed in my cell with short intervals till eleven at night. They examined me with refined methods of torture that Ivan the Terrible might have envied. Zidanov would kick me into the corner of the cell, and then the Cossack would throw me back to Zidanov, who put his foot on my neck. They ordered me to be stripped at the same time preventing the cold cell from being warmed. They flogged me with the nagega, with terrible oaths, saying, Now then, deliver us a thrilling speech. One of my eyes was quite closed at that time, and the right side of my face terribly bruised. Pressing on that sore place, they would ask, Painful, dear? with a sardonic smile. Now tell us, who are your comrades? I was often delirious, but had a sense of dread of saying anything, and I am sure there was nothing in what I said but unconnected nonsense. When I came to, I told them that I would answer the questions put to me by the proper officials, also that I belonged to the town of Tambov, and that Procurer Kamenev and other gendarmes could testify to this. This provoked quite a storm of indignation. They pulled hairs out of my head one by one, and asked where other revolutionists could be found. They pressed their lighted cigarettes on my bare body, saying, "'Cry out then, you wretch!' They stamped on my feet with their heavy boots, pressed them as if in a vice, and shouted, "'Scream then, you!' 
we have made whole villages bellow but you miserable little girl haven't screamed once either at the station or here but we will make you scream we will amuse ourselves with your sufferings we will give you to the cossacks for the night no said abramov we will have you for ourselves first and then give you to the cossacks brutal hugging followed with shouts of scream then but i am positive that i did not scream once either at the station or police office i only talked half consciously at eleven o'clock they had recorded my disposition but they declined to produce it in tambov because i was delirious all the time then i was taken by train to tambov the train is moving slowly it is cold and dark the air is thick with abramov's brutal oaths he swears at me terribly i felt the breath of death even the cossacks felt uneasy why are you silent men sing let those wretches die with our merriment then shouting and whistling began passions ran high eyes and teeth glittered and the singing was disgusting i was raving water no water then the officer takes me to the second class he is drunk and very amiable his arms embrace me he unbuttons my dress his drunken lips mutter in a beastly way what a velvet breast what a magnificent body i have no more strength to repulse him no voice to call out and what use if i had i would willingly dash my head against something if there were anything but this brutalized scoundrel will not allow it he kicks me in order to disable me i call upon the police officer who is asleep the cossack officer murmurs caressing my chin why do you clench your little teeth look out you may break them i could not get a moment of sleep that night in the daytime he offers me wine and chocolate and when people go away he caresses me again just before reaching tambov i fell asleep for an hour i awoke because the officer's arm was upon me while taking me to the prison he said after all i am embracing you in tambov i was delirious again and fell terribly ill when marie was brought to trial her judges looked upon her youth and listened to the terrible recital of her tortures unmoved she had killed a man an official of the bureaucracy therefore she must die an opportunity was given her to speak and she rose up and quietly said gentlemen judges look around you where do you see the light faces of the happy and contented there are no such faces even those who seem now to have the victorious hand are afflicted by grief they know their hour of triumph is brief i am about to be sent from this life you may kill me you may kill me over and over again as you already have done you may subject me to the most terrible penalties but you can add nothing to what i have already endured i do not fear death you may now kill my body but you cannot destroy my belief that the time of the people's happiness and freedom is surely coming a time when the life of the people will express itself in forms in which truth and justice will be realized when the ideas of brotherhood and freedom will be no more empty sounds but part of our everyday real life if this is truth it is no grief to lay down one's life i have finished a few days later the following letter was received from her by some friends in tambov smuggled out through a chain of civil criminals my dear comrades turn over my money partly to jenny the balance the greatest turn over to t i often pass sleepless nights but i feel courageously and i know how to save my energy which has accumulated owing to idleness i dream of the time to hand my wish is growing stronger and i fear that i will commit suicide if the autocracy will show me clemency my death appears to me of such a value to my people that i will receive any act of clemency from the czar as an act of revenge and insult if it will be possible and if they will not kill me soon i will try to be useful by gathering new followers i would like to know how things are in tambov 
have you sufficient books for the peasants now in prison do your duty it is important that they should leave prison as revolutionists or near that i embrace all my old comrades and shake the hands of the new ones send me your postals with your handwriting they will be dear to me my greetings to all yours m p s the treatment is good my health fever cough headache i forgot to say my comradeship in the party of the revolutionists is taken by me not only as an acceptance of its program and tactics but much higher it means to me sacrifice of life of hopes of sentiments for the realization of its ideas it means to dispose of each minute of life in such a way that the cause shall gain m luchinovsky was succeeded by a wise and humane man who valued human life even that of simple peasants in the province of tambov cossacks ceased to riot through the villages looting at will and preying upon the helpless inhabitants the taking of this one life at the sacrifice of her own ended for the time at least an era of darkness in tambov and saved the honor of untold women and the lives of many the two officers who so foully abused her went unpunished so far as the russian authorities were concerned but after a lapse of a few weeks abramov was found dead in the street one night and several weeks later zidanov's lifeless body was also discovered hundreds of men in tambov had wished and prayed for the death of luchanovsky but only a girl dared whether that girl had hysteria as some asserted or not is of small consequence joan of arc was a neurasthenic that night after my visit to spirodinova when dark had settled over tambov i stumbled down a littered street not more than a hundred yards from the prison to a poor little cottage once painted red now weather-worn and shabby within sat a middle-aged woman with large dark eyes and creased anxious face i found her in an inner room sitting with folded arms by a low-burning lamp yes marie spirodinova is my daughter she said then with quiet voice not untouched with pride she told me about the childhood days of the girl now shut apart from her by prison walls she told me how from an early age marie was studious and thought to study medicine her three sisters all turned toward medicine and two are dentists marie's ambition was to be a doctor she studied very hard but when her country fell under deeper and darker oppressions, she could think of nothing but the sufferings of her people, so she gave up everything to serve the movement that was making for freedom. I knew that two of Marie's sisters were also in prison at that time, one for merely having received a letter from Marie, and the other had been taken as a suspected propagandist. There was no direct charge against her. Madame, I said to the mother, how does it make you feel to have three of your daughters in prison at one time on political charges? The old lady was thoughtful for a moment, and then, in a voice fervent and earnest, a voice I shall never forget, she replied, It makes me the proudest mother in all Russia. Shortly after my return to St. Petersburg, I received the following letter. Like the others, it had been smuggled out of the prison, as I afterward learned, through a chain of civil criminals. I am very sorry that I could not speak more with you. The conditions of my arrest are heavy, because I am isolated, and the soldiers are always at my window. During the three months of my arrest, I have not once slept without my clothes. The soldiers keep looking in upon me all the time. I am embarrassed at each movement. You can understand how such constant scrutiny amounts to torture, for I cannot get rid of civilized customs to the extent of undressing before the eyes of men. The physicians find it necessary that I should be quiet, and to walk continuously in the fresh air for one hour each day. The government gives me this hour of freedom, but under disagreeable conditions owing to the curiosity of the soldiers. If the people of America are interested in the fate of this Russian girl, 
tell them that they must rather interest themselves in the fatherland of this girl. The revolutionary movement here is now making for liberty. I want for nothing personally, because for a long time I have not existed personally. My heart and my soul are given to this movement, the movement which is in the service of the people. There is no basis for comparison, this solitude of the soul. The feeling of shame makes me shudder. It will not leave my memory, and can never be effaced. There is nothing with which to liken this torture of the pride, of the self-respect. This suffering is as poignant as the blows of my tormentors. The same hands that beat the hungering peasants caressed and slapped me. Still, the government, with all its experience and lies, and its permission of illegal actions among its servants, will not succeed in rehabilitating these two men. They are condemned beyond recall, branded with the scorn of the people. I was glad to see free people from a quiet, liberty-loving land to receive their salutations. My spirit is now strong, and without fear I await deportation and categora. If the government does not succeed in killing me with tortures during these years, I believe I shall be free. Goodbye. I give you both my hands. Signed, Marie Spiridonova. End of Chapter 8, Part 2《セクション12 of The Red Rain: The True Story of an Adventurous Year in Russia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Patrick Wallace.《The Red Rain: The True Story of an Adventurous Year in Russia by Kellogg Durland. Chapter 9. Watching the Duma at Work, Part One. The famous manifesto granting representative government to the Russian people was issued October thirtieth, nineteen o five. After brief delays and one postponement, the date for the meeting of the first parliament, to be called Duma, which is to say Think, was set for May tenth, nineteen o six. Forty days of freedom followed the manifesto. When the world at large accepted the promise contained in the October Manifesto as genuine, then black reaction shut down over all Russia, and the people began to understand that all is not gold that glitters, even when moulded into royal insignia. Prince B, a well-known courtier, told me a month before the day appointed for the convocation that he knew absolutely there would be no parliament in Russia for many years to come. The Tsar had been coerced into promising representative government by Count Vitter, at a time when a wave of revolt, mutiny, and rebellion had caught the imperial camp napping. And to stay this tide for the nonce, the manifesto was issued. One week before the meeting, a general in command of one of the most important branches of the army said, "In my hearing, Duma, there will be no Duma." Or if it meets, it will merely be that we may capture the members on our bayonets. The people themselves had but little more faith in the royal pledge. Both of the revolutionary parties, the social democrats and the social revolutionaries, openly mocked the gullibility of the intellectual constitutionalists who pretended to believe in the manifesto, and boycotted the elections. The elections, therefore, were often farcical. The situation was not improved by the discriminating rules governing the voting issued by the government, nor by the menacing attitude of the military and police authorities on balloting days. I was in Rostov-on-Don, for example, on the day set for the voting, and the guard of Cossacks stationed at the polling places was so large, and the men were so hostile in their attitude, that the Rostov citizens could not be hired to approach the voting booths. About noon, a proclamation was issued setting another day for the elections. When a local governor was displeased with the electors chosen or with the deputy finally selected to go to the imperial duma, he sometimes declared the entire election illegal, or found a slender and often ridiculous pretext for annulling the vote cast for the man actually chosen, 
or even for exiling the candidate, to the north or to Siberia. Two months later, when this Duma had been dissolved, the Tsar said in the presence of Prince T, a good friend of mine, I believe Russia can run for twenty years more, without a parliament, and I intend to do all I can to guide my country back to where we were before the October Manifesto. These are the words of the Tsar. They attain a special significance in the light of later events, and it is evident to every thoughtful observer that the Tsar had already determined upon his policy before the Duma had met at all. Every act of his indicates this. The promulgation of the fundamental laws on May 8th, his false and empty speech from the throne, his refusal to receive the Duma's response to the throne speech, the dissolution, the dissolution of succeeding Dumas, and the gradual retrenchment and curtailment of every liberty he had ever promised. It is highly important to interpret the history of Russia's parliamentary beginnings in the light of the attitude of the Tsar. On the eve of the meeting of the Duma, the government issued a lengthy list of so-called fundamental and exceptional laws, which prenatally devitalized and emasculated the new Duma. These laws were declared unalterable by the Duma. The powers of the Tsar as autocrat were defined to include the sole right of proposing changes in the fundamental laws to the Council of Empire and the Duma, the right of veto, the appointment of executive, the ministers, the judges the decisions of peace and war, the control and command of the army and navy. The Council of Empire was the upper house composed of an equal number of elected and appointed members. The elected members were to represent the Tsemsvors, the Holy Synod, the universities, the Bors, the nobility, and the landowners of Poland. Nominally, this Council of Empire, like the Duma, would be convoked and prorogued annually and have equal powers. Every measure must have the sanction of both houses before it went to the Tsar. As a matter of fact, the composition of the Council of Empire was so carefully made up that every liberal measure passed by the Duma was certain of veto in the upper chamber, and throughout the term of the first Duma the Council of Empire had practically nothing to do. Indeed, it did not meet above four or five times. Ordinary laws could not be passed without the consent of both houses and the Tsar, but the Tsar might promulgate special laws, and under the cloak of martial law, any number or any kind of special laws might be established. The Council of Ministers, too, might promulgate temporary laws with the consent of the Tsar. Temporary special legislation against the Jews enacted fifty years ago still remains. While the Parliament was to meet annually, the Tsar reserved the right to dismiss it at any time. The Parliament was to have no control over the public debt or the expenses of the court or ministry. War taxes and foreign loans might be made without the advice or consent of the Duma. The ministers were to remain responsible to the Tsar and not to the Duma. Thus Russia's first Parliament was left a mere shell, empty of power and authority. In spite of the doubting attitude of the people at large toward the good faith of the emperor and the government, in spite of the restrictions of the elections, a remarkably sane and liberal body of men returned to the Duma. On May 1st, Count Vitter ceased to be premier, and an impotent little gentleman named Gorimikin succeeded him. On May 2nd, M. Dunovo, the unscrupulous and reactionary minister of interior, notified the governors of the provinces that they were to prevent peasant deputies from travelling to St. Petersburg with constitutional democrats, the constitutional democrats being composed almost entirely of university professors, professional men and other intellectuals. It was evidently feared that the unlettered peasants might be contaminated. Two days later, M. Dornevo relinquished his portfolio, but became Secretary of State and retain the dignity of senator. Thus, with a new and untried cabinet, Russia awaited the assembling of her first Duma. All through the night of May 9th, troops were poured into St. Petersburg. The sun rose the morning of the 10th upon a miniature army in possession of the capital. From dawn the streets were aflutter with excitement, 
Flags were extended from myriad windows. Squadrons of cavalry and regiments of infantry were moving hither and yon, mostly in the direction of the Winter Palace. All streets tending that way were early blockaded. Orderlies and aides-de-camp galloped through the most crowded thoroughfares. Officers in their most splendid uniforms filled the hotel lobbies. The spacious square before the Winter Palace was occupied by more troops than on any occasion since that Sunday, fifteen months before, when Father Capon headed a certain procession of working men who sought to wait upon the Tsar, their little father, and was shot down like an enemy on a battle plain. On both occasions the shadow of the statue of an angel of peace supporting a cross, symbol of surpassing love and infinite compassion, fell across the square. Cossacks of the Royal Guard in coats of scarlet and dashing lances were quartered about that beautiful figure, and the slender shadow cast by the towering column touched them as with a warning finger. The privileges of the balcony and the throne room were extended to the foreign correspondents whose credentials had satisfied the police and palace authorities. Arrayed in evening clothes since mid-forenoon, we sweltered with the soldiers in the piping hot square before the palace. Shortly after one o'clock the doors were thrown open to us, and we filed past various and sundry officials who scrutinised our passes, each one of which bore the authenticated photograph of the bearer. And we passed in more haste than dignity to our several coins of vantage around the marble gallery. Presently the privileged of the bureaucracy who had been commanded to appear in full court dress, began to take their places. The senators and councillors of state, the generals and admirals, the foreign ambassadors, and lastly, the Duma deputies. With mild interest we watched these groups gather. These were but the spectacular background for an intense, though brief, drama about to be enacted. How significant, how tragic, no one knew nor cared to guess. It was not yet two o'clock when the strains of the national anthem were heard in a distant chamber, heralding royalty's approach. The magnificent procession advanced with measured steps. A strained hush spread over the room. Twelve hundred eyes turned toward the portal, and neither the dazzling glitter of imperial insignia nor the splendour of the royal standard caused a quiver of distraction. Neither Grand Dukes nor Grand Duchesses, Empress or Dowager Empress, not even Trepov himself, commanded a single glance. Eagerly every eye in the room sought one figure. The Tsar. The first view of him spoke only of pathos. Unutterably lonely he appeared, a slight shuffling figure with a pale set face. Three paces into the room his feet strayed out from the line of procession, his head jerked awkwardly, his breast heaved markedly, and his shoulders were squared with an effort. There was timidity in his glance, and his step was never sure. Those of us who were to his right and near enough saw him fumble for his trousers' pocket as he stood before the prelates of the church to receive the holy blessing. He drew out a small, blue-tinted handkerchief and wiped his eyes. Then, for the first time, he fairly raised his head to survey the assemblage about him. Surely the strangest phalanxes ever monarch walked between were those on his either side. To his left was massed all the brilliance and pomp of empire. To his right, the plainest body of men ever got together on this planet to deliberate the destiny of a nation. France, in her most radical days, adhered less rigidly to the forms and appearances of democracy. The ceremonials of the church lasted a short twenty minutes, yet each Te Deum seemed an agony of protracted suspense, and royalty suffered. Several times I heard a clucking sound in the throat of the emperor as he fought hard with terrible nervousness. Thrice he wiped his eyes. His left hand, which was gloved, was held before him, and his fingers twitched incessantly. 
the empress and dowager empress alone in all the cortege gave no sign of strain theirs was supreme poise the grand dukes who stood in the ranks next behind throughout the ceremonial continued to cross themselves with most extraordinary determination their vigorous piety far exceeded that of the gold-mantled ecclesiastics themselves when the last chant was sung and the last blessing bestowed the royal suite took its place the ladies to the left of the throne the men close to the representatives of the army the tsar remained standing in the centre of the room a single silhouette against an infinite skyline could not be more solitary again his breast heaved and his shoulders twitched more noticeable now than at any previous time this was the final effort for self-command in the supreme trial which he now faced the effort was successful from that moment until the end the tsar looked acted and spoke with a degree of manliness even kingliness when all were in place and at rest he stepped forward vita towering above all who stood near him swayed indifferently backward and forward in the front row of the bureaucrats his shrewd face was touched with a supercilious smile as the tsar walked past him not two yards away seven steps approached the throne these the emperor ascended lightly but with rare dignity a mantle of ermine lay across the throne draped with careful carelessness with tolerable ease the emperor sat briefly on his throne four stools stood near the four corners of the dais on those to the emperor's right hand were the crown and orb to his left the sceptre and seal of state an aide advanced and handed him his speech a single broad page pasted on cardboard this he took standing quietly and firmly he assumed position left foot slightly forward the paper held easily with both hands there was naught of haste in his actions his head lifted but not for speech he merely looked over the throng the positions of the respective sides were now reversed the bureaucracy was to the right and the duma to his left nearest the throne to the right the empresses grand duchesses and other grand ladies of the court then followed in successive groups whose stations were indicated by crimson palings the several classes of court official military and naval dignitaries next to the ladies were the senators ministers and members of the council of the empire in emblazoned uniforms of scarlet and gold below them adjutant ministers dignitaries from other cities and the second rank of the court officials then the emperor's aide de camp and personal attendants next the most gorgeous group of all the army and navy stout old generals with twenty and even twenty-five medals bedecking their breasts broad sashes of scarlet light blue and cardinal some worn over the left shoulder others over the right as if the wonderful uniforms of every blazing colour known to fabric makers were not in themselves sufficiently striking the slightly quieter though equally magnificent uniforms of the admirals alternated with the army there were cossack commanders in circassian dress of cassock effect and stately hussars with fur burdened capes and yards of gold and silver cord draped and tasselled uniforms as fantastic as dazzling last of all in the section farthest from the throne the foreign ambassadors not the diplomatic corps only the ambassadors for each individual standing place was at a premium the throne was the only chair in the room the emperor the only one permitted even momentary repose these bureaucratic groups were solidly packed the space seemed to have been measured off to the inch and invitations issued accordingly on the opposite side of the salon in looser order stood the duma contrast of contrasts 
no gilt or tinsel there, simply men. Men from the workaday world. The Roman Catholic bishop elected from Vilna wore his ecclesiastic robes of purple, and the Greek priests wore theirs of dark, coarse stuffs. The Mussulmen were turbaned, and the Polish peasants wore their national cloaks of homespun white, traced with homely embroidery in red and black. Some of the university professors wore regulation evening clothes, and some of the lawyers appeared in ordinary frock coats. The working men wore short jackets, while the peasants were in their simple peasant dress, long blue coats of coarse material, and boots knee-high. A few had pinned on war medals, indicating that they had served their country on the battlefield. The mud and dust of the fields still clung to their boots. The two sides of the room glared and stared one at the other. The Duma evinced a curious interest in the spectacle the bureaucracy presented. Most of them seemed to wonder what all that display had to do with the business in hand. The bureaucrats, on the other hand, were much more moved. Some laughed with obvious scorn and derision. Others were sad and depressed. Others were merely amused. Only here and there was a face whose seriousness indicated a complete appreciation of the full portent of the scene. It may have been fancy, but to me it seemed that Count Witter alone understood. At all events, he was the only man among all the bureaucrats who, at the close of the ceremony, spoke to any of the members on the Duma side of the room. The open avenue through the room from the door to the throne was like a yawning chasm across which no word might pass, even of formal courtesy. To us it is like letting the revolution into the palace, said one lady of the court to me. So the whole bureaucratic side seemed to view it. No enemy could have viewed another with more open and keener suspicion. The Duma, it must be added, was the better behaved. The members were quiet dignified and obviously patient through the extraordinarily long religious ceremony and a tedious hour of waiting in the first three months of the year over seventy thousand men and women had been snatched from their homes and placed in prison or sent into exile the release of all of these people against many of whom there was no known charge certainly no evidence was what the country at large awaited with ill-suppressed eagerness the emperor will grant an amnesty in his speech from the throne, said popular rumour. And it was for this that the Duma listened, when the emperor stood before the throne, speech in hand, about to utter the first words. The attitude of an empire hung on the temper of that address. The quiet that fell over the assembly was the quiet of a mountain midnight. Not a dress rustled, not a foot scraped, not a sword jangled, no breath was audible. The eyes of the emperor returned from their survey of the room and riveted on the paper he held. His lips parted, and the first syllable rang clearly to the farthest corners of the room. The right given me by divine authority to care for the fatherland has prompted me to call upon representatives elected by the people to aid me in legislative work. With the ardent belief in the bright future of Russia, I greet you here as the best people whom I have commanded my beloved subjects to elect. Hard and complicated is the work before you. I trust, however, that your love for the fatherland and your ardent desire to serve her will inspire and unite you, and I will guard the liberties given by me with the firm belief that you will not spare your power and effort to faithfully serve the fatherland, in giving relief to the peasants, so dear to my heart, in educating the people, in helping them to prosperity, remembering at the same time that for moral greatness and the prosperity of the country, not freedom only is necessary, but also order, resting upon right. It is my ardent desire to see my people happy and to leave to my son a powerful, prosperous, and civilized country. 
God shall bless the labour that is before us, in union with the Council of the Empire and the Duma. And let this day signify also the great event of the moral renovation of Russia. Let this be the day of regeneration of her best forces. Get devotedly to the work to which I have called you, and justify worthily the trust of the Emperor and the people. God help me and you. Both hands dropped to his sides as the last words were spoken, and he remained where he stood as though to watch the effect of the speech upon the assemblage. The military band in a balcony at the rear struck up the national anthem, most beautiful and magnificent of national anthems. Hundreds of voices from the side of the bureaucrats rose as one with a cheer and a shout of bravo, bravo. The roar was bewildering. Bravo, bravo. However could one room hold such volumes of sound? But the emperor's ears were not deceived, nor his eyes. The shout in all its mightiness came from one side of the room. The emperor looked long and earnestly at the Duma. Not a voice was raised, not a cheer echoed from that entire side. They were not even swayed by the prolonged cheering of the bureaucrats. Generals, old and decrepit, court cavaliers and ministers, yelled themselves into a frenzy. The simple, ignorant peasants, of whom it had been said a thousand times, Ugh! They'll lose their heads first thing. These men stood like stone, absolutely impassive. They knew in the first place that the right given me by divine authority which prompted me to call upon representatives of the people was merely an aggregation of words. Revolution prompted the Duma, nothing more nor less, uprisings and disturbances all over the country. And no word of amnesty. Nothing. End of chapter 9, part 1 Recording by Patrick Wallace Section 13 of The Red Rain The True Story of an Adventurous Year in Russia This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Patrick Wallace The Red Rain The True Story of an Adventurous Year in Russia by Kellogg Durland Chapter 9 Watching the Duma at Work Part 2 The Emperor slowly descended from the throne, and the royal procession formed for exit. The band played its loudest. The courtiers and bureaucrats kept up their shouts of Bravo! Bravo! Whatever of spontaneity there may have been in the first outburst was now gone, and the words were pronounced in a unison which became rhythmic. Before the emperor had reached the door, even these shouts had subsided. His own aide-de-camp and the generals alone maintained the noise. A paid clerk could not have been more marked. At first, the emperor bowed to the Duma, but his bow was chill and formal, his eye cold and severe. To his right he turned with warmth. Generally he recognised a face and smiled but to the left his expression was statuesque. The ladies in his train did much better. Several of them quite ignored the glittering array on the right, and bowed and smiled most graciously to the Duma members, and with more seeming spontaneity and sincerity. After the imperial cortege, the bureaucracy filed out in a brilliant pageant, and last of all the Duma. The spectacle had surely been in entire keeping with the ostentatious traditions of Tsardom. But to the most reactionary bureaucrats it was patent that the simple peasants had not been impressed as had been expected. They had enjoyed it, as they would have enjoyed a military manoeuvre. They had watched it as a passing show, and were quite at a loss as to the reason for it, or the connection between it and their business. 
Many freely expressed their amazement at the gowns of the ladies. There were scores among the Duma members who had never before set eyes on grand ladies, and they could not repress their surprise at their décolleté cut. "'Why did the Emperor bring us here?' asked one naively. "'Was it to show us his women?' "'I thought the Emperor's house would be full of holy pictures,' said another sorrowfully, in the first blush of disillusionment. "'If the government tells us again that they have no money for famine, we can tell them where they might get a few kopecks,' added another, with a significant shake of his peasant head. The magnificent ceremony, with all its brilliant pageantry, the most gorgeous spectacle of a traditionally spectacular court, completely failed to inspire the confidence of the working men and peasants in their olden rulers. On the contrary, it inspired amazement, discontent and distrust. The Tsar, who is probably the greatest living genius for missing opportunities, read his empty speech, read it well, eloquently, and for the first time in his life saw face to face real men who were not fawning sycophants, and who dared express their true feelings when those were not of admiration or of approbation. To facilitate the transportation of the Duma members from the Winter Palace to the Torid Palace, where the sessions were to be held, they were loaded into boats and conveyed most of the way by water. Near the Torid Palace, looking on the River Neva, is a frowning prison in which are many political prisoners. As the boats were passing this grim place, handkerchiefs began to appear, shoved out between the iron bars, and frantically waved in greeting. Across the water rang the cry of amnesty. Some of the peasants who had stood stolid and unmoved through all the winter palace function were deeply touched by the appeals from behind the prison gratings, and not a few among them wept. The first sitting was of necessity brief. There was an ecclesiastic ceremony, the administration of the oath, and the election of a president. The hum of amnesty was in the air, but the demands of formal procedure would not permit of the taking hold of actual business until the president had announced himself at Peterhof. Therefore amnesty, by unofficial but unanimous understanding, was scheduled for the first business of the next sitting. But short as this session was, one hour and twenty minutes, the first shot was fired by the Duma when a group of bureaucratic intruders were ejected. The staunch old liberal, Petrunkevich, climbed to the tribunal and shouted, Let freedom, liberty and amnesty be the words of Russia's first parliament. The Duma echoed the words, and cries of liberty, amnesty, were sent ringing through the chamber. M. Muromsev, a sturdy collegiate of liberal traditions, was elected president. Prince Dolgorukov, of ancient lineage, first vice-president. Twenty-two distinct peoples were represented in the Duma, divided by religion as follows. Russian Orthodox, 339, Catholics, 63, Protestants, 13, Old Believers, 4, Baptists, 1, Jews, 11, Mohammedan, 14, Buddhists one, no religion one. With regard to education, a large proportion, 184 in number, never attended any kind of schools. 111 went through the lower grades, 61 through the middle, and 189 either finished or partially finished university courses. In spite of the large number who never attended school, only two were unable to read or write. By parties, the members were classified as follows. Constitutional Democrats, 153. Group of Toil, 107. Autonomous, 63. Party of Democratic Reforms, 4. Octoberists, 13. Moderates, 2. Trade and Industry, 1. Unclassified, 105. The average age of the members was 39. At this time, the Siberian and Central Asia deputies had not yet reached St. Petersburg. These added nine to the group of toil, and the remainder went chiefly to the Constitutional Democrats and to the Social Democrats, who at the outset were not directly represented in the Duma. The first business session began with the reading of many congratulatory telegrams, from the Diet of Finland, the Municipality of Prague, 
the Prince of Montenegro, and the large cities of the empire. Toward the last were several from political exiles and prisoners. The spontaneous applause which broke from practically the entire Duma when these telegrams were read was louder and more sustained than for all the others put together. The president was obliged to read them a second, then a third time, and then at the suggestion of someone on the floor, another round of applause was given standing. I counted only eight men who remained in their seats. Amnesty was made the first demand of the Duma. Not a partial amnesty, but a full and complete amnesty to all political prisoners, including terrorists. Telegrams, letters, petitions began daily to come from all parts of the country to the deputies, urging this and other demands. If we fail to get the things we have come for, we dare not return to our homes, said many deputies. The general feeling at the time was that if the Duma failed or was suppressed, it would be not the Duma merely that was put down, but the country. For in a degree difficult to appreciate, the Duma was the country. It was the most absolutely representative organization ever brought together. Not of people merely, but of professionals and classes. The United States House of Representatives is largely composed of lawyers and professional politicians. The House of Commons of gentlemen. The French Chambre of journalists and men of letters. Not so the Duma. An analysis of the personnel and professions of the members showed that 23 were lawyers, 15 university professors, 6 high school teachers, 15 doctors, 9 authors, 75 Zemstvo specialists, that is to say, men who have devoted themselves to the work of local governing bodies, men of means generally, 12 rich landowners, 10 marshals of nobility, 2 engineers, 9 functionaries, men appointed by favour to positions of sinecure in connection with public offices, seven common school teachers, four Greek priests, three Roman Catholic priests, three Mohammedan mullahs, one Jewish rabbi, one Romanist bishop, fifteen workmen, four merchants, two manufacturers, two students, and one hundred and sixty-six peasants. The atmosphere of the ensemble was at first glance intellectual but the peasants and workmen together formed a powerful block to any step proposed by the intellectuals that did not meet with their approval. They were the real radicals, the extreme left of the Duma. The intellectuals mostly belonged to the Constitutional Democratic Party. The programme of this party was not a bad one if it had only worked. But most of the members were over-cautious and inclined to be humble and mild in their language to crave the emperor's grace, for example, for the political amnesty, while the peasants and the workmen said, We ask nothing, we demand, not grace and pardon, but justice. The right formed so small a group that they were entirely without influence. The sessions of this remarkable body were characterised by orderliness, clearness, and real eloquence. An interesting scene was witnessed when the question came up should the Duma attend the reception given in its honour by the city of St. Petersburg? The workmen replied, If the city of St. Petersburg has money to spend in banqueting us, let them give it to the unemployed of the city, of whom there are so many. The intellectuals said, We can attend no banquets or festivities while so many of our former colleagues are in prison or in exile. Until the amnesty is declared, we will not make merry. And so the Duma continued sitting on the night of the banquet and reception. The reply to the throne speech, see Appendix B for the reply in full, was carried without one dissenting voice. The eight reactionaries who did not care to sign it left the hall rather than vote against it. Those who believe the Russian people too much split into parties and factions ever to accomplish definite results might recall this unanimity, which indicated the ability to get together and stand together in time of crisis. Despite the orderliness which characterised the Duma from the start, the authorities continued to maintain a great show of force everywhere. The Simeonovsky regiment, which had put down the Moscow insurrection, 
was quartered in barracks adjoining the Duma building, and the following secret order was issued to the soldiers. How to act in case of alarm and in the suppression of armed uprising of the population. At the first call from the police for help, sergeants must immediately notify the officers, who must in their turn order the troops to make immediately ready for action. Upon leaving the barracks, battalions should march through the entire width of the streets, so as to protect the rear and keep it free for reinforcements, should such be required. Troops should move with all possible rapidity, sending ahead an advance guard for determining positions. In the event of shots being fired from windows into a marching battalion, fire from several rifles should immediately be opened upon such windows. Troops should not approach a mob nearer than 100 paces, so as to conveniently open fire while avoiding injury likely to come from hand bombs being thrown from the crowd. Avoid action with bayonets and try to remain at a distance, because a bullet at a short distance works with greater effect than a bayonet. One bullet may kill two or three men in a crowd. In the event of a collision with armed rebels, soldiers must conduct themselves as upon a field of battle, remembering that the end will be attained only when the enemy is crushed or annihilated. Therefore, before leaving barracks, substitutes should be chosen to take the places of commanding officers killed. There was no need for this order, however, and the Duma continued on to its peaceful end two months after its convocation. It wrestled with the amnesty question, and sent a bill up to the Council of Empire abolishing capital punishment. When the Bielostok massacre occurred, it appointed a commission of investigation, and attempted to inaugurate the interpellation of ministers. Prince Urosov made his world-famous speech, revealing the complicity of the government in massacres, and the government wires carried the report of this speech to every part of the empire. The Duma became the greatest propaganda and educating influence Russia ever saw, simply because every word spoken within its walls was repeated throughout the land. The government continued its policy of obstruction, contempt, scorn and insult. No other legislative body in the world would have tolerated what the first Duma bore in silence. Finally, the Duma attacked that most serious of all serious problems in Russia, the agrarian question, and sought to solve it through the establishment of the principle of expropriation. Then came dissolution. One Sunday morning in early July, the people of St. Petersburg read an official announcement bearing the signature of the Tsar that the Duma had ceased to exist. There was no disturbance, no demonstration, although the announcement came at an unexpected moment. A story was circulated in St. Petersburg of how the American ambassador was surprised by the dissolution. According to report, the ambassador's family were at a European watering place where he expected presently to join them. Just previous to his departure from St. Petersburg, he received a cablegram from Washington to the effect that, owing to the unsettled condition of Russia, the President would suggest that the ambassador remain in Russia through the summer. The ambassador and one of the secretaries of the embassy sat down on Sunday morning and framed a long cipher message to Washington, setting forth reasons for assurance that Russia would remain tranquil for the present. They finished writing the message early in the afternoon and started out together to deposit it at the central telegraph office. On the way, they learned that the Duma had been dissolved that morning before they had so much as begun their telegram to Washington. Some of the members, mostly constitutional Democrats, remembered the tennis court oath of French history and had timid ambitions to do likewise. So they hastened to Viborg in Finland where, safe from being dispersed by Cossacks or police, they argued, deliberated, and wrangled for a week. Then the Governor-General of Finland announced a state of martial law, and warned the ex-deputies that the hospitality of Finland could no longer be extended to them. Eager to do something, yet not knowing what to do, they proceeded to issue a proclamation known as the Viborg Manifesto, in which they called upon the people of Russia to cease paying taxes and to refrain from sending recruits to the army and navy. 
in other words to become utterly disregardful of all law emanating from any other source than a representative body chosen by the people the viborg manifesto was a silly blunder and no more effective than a blank shell it showed that eminent academicians brilliant writers and earnest patriots do not always make clever statesmen the government forbade the circulation of the viborg manifesto but otherwise paid little attention to the step every signer was put under the ban and it was only a short time after that of the members of the first duma one had been murdered one gone insane two cruelly beaten ten were in hiding five were exiled twenty-four in prison thirty-three had been arrested and searched and one hundred and eighty-two placed under indictment on the charge of treason shortly after the dissolution a second duma was announced to be chosen under very much more restricted voting conditions and to meet early in the following year thus the day of democratic government dawned in russia it was like a burst of sunlight through the rift of a stormy sky and soon shut in again i asked mr william jennings bryan who was a visitor to the duma previous to the dissolution how he was impressed by the assembly it is the most remarkable body of men on earth to-day was his reply and i believe it was on the whole the conduct of the duma was admirable i submit that this is true in spite of a good deal of amateurishness and crudeness in spite of the enthusiasm of a few zealots in spite even of the blunder of the viborg manifesto which after all was the mistake of one party indeed the mistake of one man above all else the men in the duma were transparently honest sincerely striving to serve the people they represented and in russia as in more civilized lands honesty in political life does not necessarily spell success the conduct of the government toward it was unworthy insincere and false the brief career of this duma demonstrated the ability of the russian people to govern themselves provided they are given reasonable freedom in selecting whom they like for their representatives it is not fair to ask are the people of russia ready for self-government it is not fair because we know that ability to do anything successfully must rest on experience we do know this however that a government of the russian people by the people would not be a government whose power rested on terrorism whose methods included outrage and massacre it would be parliamentary in every sense its mistakes would be parliamentary mistakes which would be corrected by parliamentary methods the peril lies in increased restrictions and the gradual weeding out of most of the strong promising men the promise of the future is that permanent democratic government in russia will first have to be fought for precisely as all liberty is battled for the key to the present situation is in the words of the tsar i believe russia can run for twenty years more without a parliament and i shall do all i can to guide my country back to where we were before the october manifesto End of chapter 9 Recording by Patrick Wallace Section 14 of The Red Rain The True Story of an Adventurous Year in Russia This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Rita Boutros. The Red Rain, The True Story of an Adventurous Year in Russia by Kellogg Darland. Chapter 10 A Conspirative Meeting. There the gallows rope and hooks, and the hangman's beard is red. People round and poisoned looks, nothing new and nothing dread. I am breath, do all resources after fifty hangings why would you hang me save your forces why kill me who cannot die nietzsche
Pasha belonged to the military organization, so called because the members work exclusively among the soldiers and sailors. In other words, Pasha mounted the gallows steps every time she left the comparative security of her home for her work. Pasha was a veritable Nathan Hale in spirit. She loved liberty. She loved her country. She was sad only when she remembered that she could live but once for Russia. I try to live each day, she said to me on a certain occasion, so that every day will justify my whole life. Today she rests her head against the iron bars that shut her apart from the blue of heaven, the warming sun, and God's sweet fields. And across the melancholy wastes of Siberia, in a far settlement of half-wild men called Ostiaks, Pasha's comrade Paul Ivanovitch toils in iron shackles, dreaming, no doubt, of the days when Russia shall be free. But this is anticipating. The Duma had groped falteringly through six weeks' existence, and was at last emerging toward the light. At least so most of the deputies believed. In the meanwhile, the military organization was working with an arduousness that was often stupidly reckless. The revolutionists had small faith in the first parliament. They preferred to count on the disloyalty of the army and navy, and their willingness to join the army of the revolution. Zweiborg, Rival, Sebastopol, Kronstadt were all invaded by preachers and teachers, propagandists of the military organization, to whom the Duma was but a short-lived thing at best. Insurrection, mutiny, open revolt, these were the only forces they thought that could overcome the present regime. Therefore, while the Duma talked, the members of the military organization prepared quietly for what they expected would follow a dissolution. Some of the prettiest girls attacked the guard regiments. They not only cultivated the soldiers, they also made love to the officers, who are notoriously susceptible to the enticing glances of lovely eyes and the flounce of lingerie. This is one of the most remarkable features of propaganda work in Russia. Young women of finest sensibilities and strong character deliberately enter a life of prostitution among officers in order to win them to the cause. A man of my acquaintance in Helsingfors told me of a beautiful girl whom he knew intimately, who took up this work in precisely the same spirit that a woman enters a religious order. To officers whom she felt she must convert to the revolution, she was ready to sell herself, or give herself, according as seemed diplomatic to the circumstances but toward all others, her own comrades and near acquaintances, she was absolutely chaste and virtuous. From one standpoint she shrank and despised what she did. On the other hand, she believed that what she did in this way bore rich fruit for the movement, and to this movement she was not merely devoted, she was consecrated." This extraordinary state of affairs, of course, cannot be understood by Americans, but I give these details as an interesting phase of a great movement, and to illustrate the degree of self-sacrifice that is sometimes attained by ardent devotees of this work. Individual propaganda of this nature, while less likely to lead to the gallows or to Siberia, is slower in aggregating results than other methods, and Pasha was one of the impatient ones, who preferred to dare greatly in the hope of gaining much. Individual work accomplishes much with the officers, but to revolutionize the rank and file there must be a wholesale means. At considerable risk to herself and her co-workers, Pasha permitted me to go with her and Paul on a propagandist trip to Kronstadt. Kronstadt lies fourteen verse below St. Petersburg on an island in the Gulf of Finland. It is the most important naval station in the empire, commanding the entrance to St. Petersburg and the residence of the Tsar called Peterhof. 
like most military stations it is a miserable little town that subsists chiefly on the garrison the barracks are scattered close to the fortifications there is a small park near the centre of the town but even the garrison doesn't enjoy its monotonous greensward and unkempt walks four or five boats a day ply between the capital and kronstadt pasha told me the night before to board the first boat in the morning we would meet there pasha and i arrived at the landing almost simultaneously from different directions while paul appeared just before the gangplank was pulled away pasha and paul represented to me the whole rank and file of the revolution they were so utterly different yet so absolutely united in purpose Pasha was a beautiful girl of noble family, educated abroad, fluent in five languages, and even in everyday garb she suggested boudoirs and drawing-rooms, just as lilacs suggest summer, or the tinkle of mandolins suggest soft moonlight, rippling water, and romance. Paul was a Jew. He fairly exuded intellectuality. His hair was tousled, his linen vile, his fingernails long and black, and his clothes spotted and stained with the feasts of other days. Two personalities could not be more absolutely different, yet they called each other comrade, and together shared the perils of this, the most dangerous work of the revolution. The little boat rose and dipped upon the waves, and Pasha rested languidly against the deck-house, delighting in the beauty of the sunlight on the water. Paul was like a live wire, a foul of other live wires. Pasha's warm cheeks were fresh with the color of youth, and pink with the flush of morning. Paul's were dead white. Pasha's eyes were mild and sometimes languorous. Paul's were abnormally bright at all times, shining like burnished metal. An hour after we left the capital, we were bouncing over the crude cobbles of Kronstadt streets, in a rickety carriage which left us at a corner near a group of barracks. Several warships were riding at anchor in the bay. We watched them a few minutes, and Paul told us how many men of each ship were in the organization. Then we walked two blocks west, turned a corner, and entered a courtyard with several stairways leading off to the different apartments in the building. Paul led us to one of these inner entrances, and up two flights. A girl opened a door to us, and we all filed into a wide room which looked like the comfortable parlor of a small tradesman. There were ferns and rubber plants in the windows, and a canary bird singing lustily in the warm sunlight that streamed in from the sea. The developments of the next hour added momentarily to my mystification. Paul inquired for a certain man, whom we were informed was away. A brief parley ensued, during which I could see that the door of a room leading off was ajar and behind this door was someone who seemed to be listening to what was said. The door was presently opened, and he whom we sought appeared. We had not been long in this house when there came another ring at the door. A girl not yet out of her teens entered. To all appearances she was a factory girl, or perhaps a servant. She wore a slatternly cotton dress and a grey shawl over her head, a message, I wondered. The girl shook hands with us all, without uttering a word, till she sat down. Then, as she spoke, I was struck with her expression, which was far too keenly intelligent for a girl of her apparent class. Suddenly she got up, and left us without a word. The abruptness of her departure aroused my wonder. It was so un-Russian." Five minutes later, Pasha started for the front door, nodding to me to follow. I turned to see if Paul was coming too, but he shook his head. Not a word passed between us as we threaded our way through devious alleys' turnings, and finally stepped into the doorway of a dark and dingy building. We mounted four flights of stairs to what looked to me an unfinished attic, divided by rough partitions into two large storerooms. 
at one end of this attic was a closet or what i took for a closet pasha went straight to this closet stopped gave two quick knocks upon the door a pause and then another the door was immediately opened by the factory girl who had left us so abruptly a quarter of an hour before as I stepped through the closet into a broad room, she addressed me in exquisite French. Beyond her, in a big bare room, I could see many soldiers and sailors, fifteen or twenty or more. Small attention was paid to us while I stood in open-mouthed wonder at the scene. The rooms were scantily furnished, but in the corners were towering piles of pamphlets, proclamations, and other forbidden literature. Near the door, a great hulking sailor was stuffing his high bootlegs with dozens of proclamations. Another was wrapping scores of brochures about his body, much as I had carried a certain book across the frontier. In the inner room, the men were standing in little groups, earnestly talking to one another in subdued voices. Again someone knocked on the door, and my factory girl admitted two soldiers, who went straight to a pile of leaflets, which proved to be revolutionary songs printed on thin sheets of paper. These fellows stuffed quantities of the leaflets under their trousers, pulled their belts tight, and went out. Pasha, in the meantime, had thrown off her street clothes and had taken from a cupboard a loaf of black bread and a dish of butter and was making herself a sandwich with a most unconcerned air. A shining nickel samovar was steaming merrily on a kitchen table nearby, and from time to time some soldier or sailor would prepare himself a glass of tea. I tried to look as unconcerned as the rest of them acted, but I felt a cold chill go up and down my spine every time a footstep sounded outside, or a knock resounded on the door. I was, of course, keenly alive to the constant danger of detection that hung over this little band, and my nervous dread, though largely vicarious, was none the less demoralizing. In an endeavor to keep my nerve, I began to ply Pasha with questions. In the first place, who was the girl dressed like a factory worker? Pasha finished her sandwich, smiling at my bewilderment, then told me that she was the daughter of one of the largest landholders in South Russia. Her family name is older than the name of Romanov, and for generations her fathers have been dignitaries of the court. This girl was supposed to be studying music in St. Petersburg. Her family was aware of her liberal sympathies, but no one had ever suspected her of being active, much less a leader, in the military organization. There were two or three other young women in the room, all of them from cultivated families. But how do you prevent the Dvornik, the house doorkeeper, from reporting these meetings, I asked, for I knew that as a rule the Dwarniks are police agents. Pasha called to a young man in a dark blue blouse. This is our Dwarnik, she said. The man was a student from Moscow University, who, as a member of the military organization, had come to Kronstadt and secured a job as a doorkeeper, simply that conspirative headquarters might be established as I saw them there. We were still talking to this Dwarnik when the now familiar knock was wrapped out on the door. This time an officer of the rank of surgeon entered. He shook hands with everyone, then called Pasha and the other women one side. The gist of his errand was that he wanted to induce Pasha to come into his home to live, ostensibly as governess to his children. He occupied a cottage within the fortress, and Pasha, living there, would be in daily contact with many soldiers and sailors. To Pasha it seemed a wonderful opportunity for establishing a headquarters in the very heart of Kronstadt. As always with these revolutionists, Pasha thought only of the opportunity and nothing at all of the risks involved. Nearly an hour had passed since we had left Paul, and I had begun to wonder about him, when again the countersign rap was heard on the door. 
a soldier sauntered in and directly over to one of the windows which he raised and tossed a cigarette into the street this proved a signal to a group who were waiting below and who presently joined us with them was paul but so marvellously changed that i caught my breath as my eye fell upon him his long tousled hair of an hour before was now closely clipped his face shaved clean and he wore the uniform of a sailor a round pancake hat sitting jauntily over one ear under his arm he carried a bundle done up in a newspaper coming toward me he handed me the bundle and said go into the next room and put on these things the spirit of the game filled me when i cut the string and tore the newspapers off a russian sailor suit in the caucasus i had worn the uniform of a cossack officer and hobnobbed with the loyalist supporters of the czar now i was to wear the costume of an ordinary seaman and conspire with the arch enemies of tsardom i made the change quickly and reappeared a sailor laddie with the name of a proud man-o-war stamped in gilt letters around my cap as i pressed into the crowd of bona fide sailors in the room i was conscious of feeling distinctly less at ease than when first i donned my cossack outfit but perhaps conscience made the difference there is no doubt about it loyal revolutionists though these people be and imbued with the martyr spirit they yet find a fascination in intrigue and masquerading that is not altogether without its pleasurable thrill and has in it the element of the childish love of dressing up the comrades hailed my coming with louder glee than discretion and i was viewed from all points by critical eyes paul then disclosed to me the plan i was next to be shaved and shorn during the afternoon we would attend a conspirative meeting and at sunset he and i would join a boatload of sailors returning to their ship from shore leave and be smuggled aboard the cruiser whose name we both wore on our caps he and i would be stowed away below and late at night when the ever suspicious officers would be less watchful we would hold a meeting for the sailors at least paul would hold the meeting and i would stand by and encourage the cause by my presence right here i set my foot down i was courting arrest as it was but such an adventure as paul proposed was only too likely to end by having our heads shot off and no questions asked and even a paternal government would hardly protest the chances of discovery were infinite and capture under these circumstances would mean prompt execution i declined paul's invitation with thanks just then pasha came up she too had changed her part like the girl who watched the door of the room pasha was now a mill girl her pretty summer shirtwaist was exchanged for a soiled and torn calico print affair and a grey shawl was thrown over her head and shoulders. Through one torn shoe, a white stockinged foot protruded. "'What are you up to now?' I asked. "'I go to hold a meeting in the barracks. I'm a soldier's sweetheart, don't you see?' she laughed, hooking her arm around the arm of a soldier who stood by, to his very evident embarrassment. "'Why can't I go with you?' "'You can. Why not?' only it will be more interesting on the ship i did not doubt that i would find it more of an adventure to accompany paul but i wasn't seeking that kind of adventure i wanted to study the methods of army and navy propaganda and the barracks meetings were quite as important as the meetings on the ships so i elected to stick by pasha paul handed me a key which he said unlocked a certain box in his room in st petersburg if i did not hear from him by ten o'clock the next morning i was to go to his room unlock the box and burn the papers he then shook hands with pasha and myself and went out behind an orderly who carried a large black portfolio supposedly containing official documents but as i knew now filled with official proclamations of the revolution 
Pasha and I remained at headquarters till early afternoon, and then started forth upon our enterprise, she a plain mill girl, and I a sailor boy. A sailor led us to a small park near the barracks, and left us sitting on a bench while he reconnoitred. In a few minutes he returned with the word that all was well. Only we must hurry. The barracks' courtyard entrance was guarded by a soldier. Hurrying across the court, we entered the barracks. It was a long, low building of brick. At one end was a room evidently used for storage purposes, though originally intended for sleeping quarters. The windows were set high in the walls and crossed by iron bars as in a prison. The darkness obscured my vision for the first minute, but I was aware that many men were already in the room, soldiers and sailors all. They made way for us as we were led to the far end of the hall. I noticed that there was no other door in the room than the one by which we had entered. Within a quarter of an hour the room was crowded. Nearly one hundred men in uniform stood compactly within the four walls. Someone near the front started the Marseillaise in a low key, in a minute the atmosphere of the room seemed charged with electricity. My blood tingled to my fingertips as that deep-throated chorus in subdued tones repeated the refrain of the most soul-stirring hymn ever written. At the close the sailor who had been our guide to the place leaned over to Pasha and said, "'Shall we begin?' Without formality of any kind, Pasha mounted a box which had been brought in for the purpose, and gathered herself for her address. My eyes were accustomed to the dimness now, and as her shawl had fallen away from her head, and was caught over her shoulders, I could see the delicate flush on her cheeks. The hush that fell over the gathering was deep, like the emptiness of a nautilus. At the beginning she spoke very quietly— she talked simply and directly. She appealed to the soldiers and sailors as men who had been peasants and working men, who were to be again peasants and working men. There was fervor in her voice. She spoke not for party, not for section, but for Russia, unhappy Russia. Bleeding from border to border, her people oppressed by rulers who should be guardians of her peace and happiness. Without the support of the army and navy, the overthrow of the present regime is quite impossible. With the support of the army and navy, it would be simple. "'What are we to do with our officers when we rise?' asked a sailor, when an opportunity for questions was given. That was a leading question, and I awaited her answer with as breathless interest as did the men." I cannot agree to the shedding of innocent blood, she began. I am a terrorist because the terror strikes down only the guilty. But if we do not kill our officers, we would all suffer. We might indeed lose the fight. Wise members of our liberty movement believe that when we are actually in armed insurrection, we should cling to war methods. The government kills our leaders first. Perhaps we should kill the officers. I must leave that to you. I would not hold you back. I would not argue against your doing it, but I cannot sanction it. I would prefer you bound them hand and foot and store them away until you could consign them to a prison. A very ingenious answer, this, and so womanlike. After something more than an hour, the cooler ones reminded the meeting that to prolong the discussion unnecessarily was tempting discovery. The speaker then closed the meeting with a few earnest words of warning not to be premature in rising. The policy of the whole country, then, was to wait so that all Russia might rise simultaneously. Occasional tilts with the government only result in excessive blood spilling and do not materially further the cause. When the next uprising comes, it must be the death grapple. There was a distribution of leaflets, and the meeting closed as it had opened with the guarded singing of the Marseillaise. Pasha and I left the room first. We retraced our steps through the court, and as we passed the sentry, he again saluted smilingly, and I breathed freely once more. Lightheartedly we retraced our steps to the attic headquarters, which were now deserted. 
The samovar was still steaming, however, invitingly. We sat and discussed the meeting over our tea, before laying off our respective disguises. We left the house together, meaning to take the six o'clock boat back to the capital. Following the usual conspirative methods, we did not proceed on our way directly, but turned two or three corners before setting out for the boat. As we neared the main street leading to the pier, we decided to call an Isvostchik cab. As I turned to look for one, I felt Pasha tugging at my arm. I turned toward her quickly. Her gaze was fixed on a man who appeared to be hurrying off across the little garden over the way. The fox, she murmured. Then I knew that probably we were shadowed. The fox was a member of the secret police, whose recent arrests of revolutionists had wrought great havoc among the leaders of certain conspirative groups. He had formerly called himself a revolutionist, and as such had mingled freely among them. Though not long known to them, he had quickly established himself through his outspoken bitterness toward the government and the daring coups he was always ready to take part in. His cleverness was exceptional. That was why, conspiratively, he was called the Fox. Many revolutionists are known by similar names, the Beaver, the Hare, the Boar, etc. The adoption of the names of animals is a matter of common practice. The Fox had been one of the group that had set up a miniature republic in one of the Baltic provinces' towns the previous January. Pasha had been another of the same group. Through the betrayals of the fox, several of that circle had been taken by the police. Pasha had fancied herself safe from him at least, and consequently safe from the charge upon which she was then sought, because in St. Petersburg she was far from the scene of her former activities. Perhaps he did not see us, she said at last, hopefully. Just then he glanced back quickly towards us, and then increased his pace. I looked at my watch. We had only six minutes to catch the boat. The sooner we get out of this, the better. With that man running around loose, I said, rather flippantly. I summoned a cab and told the driver I would give him twice his fare if he caught the boat. He drove furiously, but with only a couple of minutes we were not within sight of the quay, and I began to fear that we would be too late. "'Get us there, and you shall have three times your fee,' I shouted. He laid on his whip. The horse bounded forward. We heard the boat whistle. We might make it. The carriage clattered over the wooden pier and stopped with a jerk just as the boat was pulling out. We dared not show the disappointment we felt. A group of soldiers eyed us with evident interest. The fox did not appear.' Apparently he had not recognized Pasha, or he was not yet prepared to strike, or he would telephone to the mainland to have us captured upon the arrival of the boat. Pasha looked up at me and laughed. That laugh was reassuring. It steadied me like a stimulant. Across the landing was another steamer on the point of departure. Quick! I exclaimed, and hurried her aboard. This steamer was due to sail at the same moment as the other, but a minute's delay had proved our salvation. "'But where is it going?' she asked. "'I haven't the dimmest idea,' I replied. "'It is leaving Kronstadt, and that's enough for us.' "'It may be going to another island in the Gulf of Finland,' she went on, "'and then we are nicely trapped.' This was a disquieting thought, so I left her in the cabin, and went above to negotiate for tickets and ascertain where we were going. At all events we were now steaming away from Kronstadt. "'What is the first stopping place?' I asked casually of a deckhand. He looked queerly at me for a moment, but from my bad Russian he knew me to be a stranger. "'Orion Baum,' he answered. "'Orion Baum is on the mainland, above Peterhof, and one hour by train from Petersburg.' so by that we were reassured. In the cabin we were fortunately the only passengers, although many others were on the decks. Our plan was quickly arranged. In Kronstadt, Pasha had worn a golf cape over her jacket. She now planned to leave it on the steamer. 
she had in her pocket a veil of a different color and style from the one she had been wearing. With this outward change she was much altered. Then we separated. We would meet casually on the train. If any description had been wired to Orienbaum, it would certainly not tally with her present appearance, and we would not be together when we left the boat. At Orienbaum there were fifty minutes to wait for a train. Where my companions spent that time I don't know. I went into a summer garden where there was music, and impatiently tried to listen to Russian songs badly sung. On the train I caught a glimpse of Pasha in the car behind the one I entered, so I knew that all was still well with her. After a few stations I joined her. She was not in the least agitated, though perfectly aware that she would have to flee the country for the time being. That the fox might know where she was living made it perilous for her to return there, even for her necessary clothing. We also knew that she might not obtain her passport, which was in the hands of the concierge of her house. Without a passport she could not cross the frontier. Obviously there was but one thing to do. When we reached St. Petersburg, she would go to the house of a friend, where she would remain in hiding until I had made the necessary arrangements for her escape, and this might mean several days. As soon as we were agreed on this plan, I again left her, nor did I see her again until I returned with a passport which I knew would carry her to safety. Thus ended our trip to Kronstadt, quite without climax, and I might almost have persuaded myself that our danger at the time was more fancied than real, but for what happened shortly after. A few weeks later, Pasha was captured on another count, not nearly so serious as conspirative work in the military organization, but serious enough to send her to prison on an indeterminate sentence. As for Paul, he turned up the next morning at my rooms behind the Kazan Cathedral while I was breakfasting. He was excited over Pasha's close shave at Kronstadt, but continued to work there until the night Kronstadt rose after the dissolution of the Duma, when Paul was one of the captured. But these incidents belong to other chapters. End of section 14《セクション15 of the Red Rain》The True Story of an Adventurous Year in Russia。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Red Rain》The True Story of an Adventurous Year in Russia by Kellogg Durland. Chapter 11 The Kronstadt Uprising. The Kronstadt fiasco revealed the value to the government of the agent provocateur. During the entire year 1906, there was no shrewder nor cleverer piece of work executed. It must be said at the same time, however, that the revolutionists themselves were somewhat to blame. They generally are. Someone is stupid, hesitating in the crisis, or recklessly premature, and the psychological moment is lost. This is the deepest tragedy of the revolution. There is always consolation in the wake of the inevitable, but when disasters are precipitated by unnecessary or preventable causes, by carelessness or inefficiency, there is only black regret. At the Kronstadt Rising, scores of lives were sacrificed, the careful preparatory work of months was undone, and the current of the revolution itself, for the moment, arrested. When I attended a revolutionary meeting and listened to the singing of the Marseillaise within the very walls of the fortress, there was large promise of a successful uprising when the time should come. This was the second week in June. Two days after my visit, a committee of sailors and soldiers of the St. Petersburg and Kronstadt garrisons forwarded to the group of toil in the Duma a telegram of support and appeal, closing with the following sentence though you are in the duma in the minority still you must firmly remember that you express the will of the whole peasantry and laboring class that is 
all of the toilers of the land but if on account of small numbers you are not able to carry through and realize all these reforms which are indispensable and which you are empowered by the people to obtain then you must sound a call to the people in army calling them to rise for the struggle your call will not be a voice in the desert but on the contrary it will sound like thunder through the whole land and all as one will arise all of the enslaved and oppressed for the defence of their trampled rights for land and for freedom coming when they did these were foolish words as subsequent events proved all of the enslaved and oppressed did not rise nor were they in a position to rise at that time the publication of this telegram did not advance the cause one iota but it did put the government on guard kronstadt was doubly watched from that moment the duma was dissolved just one month later and three weeks after the dissolution kronstadt tried to rise a costly futile effort in early june the garrison consisted of about twenty thousand sailors four thousand heavy artillery and two thousand infantry in august the sailors and artillery numbered approximately the same but more infantry had been brought down from peterhof this alone should have been a warning to the military organization but the roster of the revolutionary sympathizers was apparently so long the outlook so encouraging that the force of the loyal men was hopelessly underestimated in this particular bad generalship was to blame the sunday preceding the mutiny i visited kronstadt near the centre of the island is a summer garden in which a military band plays each sunday afternoon ordinarily this garden is crowded with visitors i found it as desolate as a cemetery the band was there playing manfully to deserted groves and empty benches here and there a soldier strolled with his sweetheart but the absence of the usual gala throng was ominous the streets too were still houses were closed veritably it was an evacuated city upon inquiry i was told that a rumor had been circulated during the previous two or three days that all of kronstadt had been mined by the government and a warning issued to the soldiers and sailors that if mutiny did break out the mines would be exploded blowing sailors soldiers ships and town into kingdom come this sounded to me like a ridiculous fiction and i still scout the idea but the russian people have learned by costly experiences that the wildest tales of the government often prove true in russia a panic had therefore possessed the town and all of the townspeople who could had fled extraordinary as this report sounds it would unquestionably have been a safer thing for the government to do than to allow kronstadt to become a revolutionary stronghold wandering about the town i could discover no signs of an imminent uprising i even failed to find any of my acquaintances among the military organization which made me wonder a good deal and indeed as i learned later at this time four days before the actual outbreak there was no thought of attempting the mutiny immediately on the part of the revolutionary leaders in reality it was planned for several weeks later when the peasants would have gathered their scanty harvests and be ready to fight when the railroad postal and telegraph strikes were planned to come off simultaneously then as an adjunct to these national movements the army and navy mutinies were to begin the plan was an elaborate one and looked thrillingly good on paper but as has happened before the agent provocateur of the government had not been taken into account upon signal sveborg near helsingfors was to rise then reval in the baltic provinces then sebastopol on the black sea and finally kronstadt with these four important strongholds captured it would seem that the fight was won the month of september or possibly october was the time selected to set in motion the attacks upon these centres in conjunction with a general strike and multitudinous peasant uprisings jacquerie all over the empire a plan of this magnitude necessarily depended for execution upon a great many different people and 
despite all the care that was supposedly exercised every detail was early reported to the government with the result that the whole thing was not only forestalled but precipitated and at the moment when everything was most favorable to the government violent reaction followed the dissolution of the duma the american mind can scarcely conceive of the degree of suppression employed by the russian government nearly every liberal newspaper in st petersburg was immediately confiscated and many permanently suppressed not only radical journals but moderate newspapers like those edited by professor paul milyukov and professor kovaleski newspapers of dignity and spirit untainted by commercial or ignoble motives such as we in america cannot appreciate foreign newspapers from england from france from germany were so rigidly censored that nothing about russia worth reading escaped elimination this aspect of the censorship was almost farcical the men who wrote the telegrams and articles remained in st petersburg the things they wrote were lamp-blacked in every individual paper that entered the country personal correspondence was demoralized the letters of private individuals were ruthlessly opened and frequently confiscated and as for arrests it seemed as if nine out of every ten men who had ever expressed a liberal opinion were marked for prison it was estimated that six hundred political arrests were made in st petersburg alone during the week of the duma dissolution these wholesale arrests continued for weeks all over russia the governmental troops seemed to be in absolute control everywhere the atmosphere of st petersburg was at first tense with expectancy that some change would come and turn the tables but as days passed and the iron heel of the bureaucracy only pressed the harder over the land liberal sympathizers became utterly discouraged and despairing this was the situation when i went to kronstadt on the sunday of the fatal week on that day all was quiet so was it on monday tuesday there were a score of rumors in the air most of them wild and fantastic yet seeming indicative of something wednesday news of the sveborg mutiny reached st petersburg the reports were hysterical the sveborg fortress was reported fallen and ships sent to recapture the batteries had themselves fallen under mutiny fighting was next reported at rival and at the same time from sebastopol all telegrams were favorable to the revolutionists all eyes turned to kronstadt kronstadt awaited the signal suddenly all communication was cut off between st petersburg and the centers of activity even the railroad to helsingfors was broken the bridge dynamited the last reports that got through were entirely favorable to the mutineers and therefore the assumption was that the telegraph telephone and railroad lines were held by the revolutionists some of the foreign correspondents in st petersburg hastened toward sviborg but i knowing kronstadt so intimately went there to be on hand for the fight which seemed so imminent the regular boats between st petersburg and kronstadt were discontinued wednesday afternoon this seemed an indication of something brewing so i hurried over the course i had so hastily come a few weeks earlier when escaping with pasha i reached oriembaum by train and there secured a boat across the mile-broad stretch of water to the fortress it was just sunset when i reached the island and made my way through the deserted streets of the town a remote hill village could be no lonelier no one seemed to know who had disturbed the connections with st petersburg the first information of importance i gleaned was that nearly all of the ships stationed at kronstadt had just put out to sea and that of those remaining all but one or two had been dismantled that is to say their guns had been dismounted and most of the sailors disarmed the effect of these precautions upon the men was precisely what any reasonable and logical person would have supposed discouragement from immediate action i found a small government boat lying at a quay with about twenty sailors and heavy artillerymen lounging about the decks there was no officer near so i boarded the ship and sat talking with the men for half an hour or more 
after the first few minutes they opened up and told me that they knew almost nothing of what was going on at helsingfors as the government had prevented their seeing any newspapers they admitted that there were plans for a mutiny but not yet all agreed to this not now the artillerymen said if any ship flying a red flag comes along it will not be fired upon by us but we don't want to start the affair i spent the remainder of the evening going from point to point and talking to sailors soldiers and young men about the town nearly all told me the same thing we know we must rise there is no other way but we must not be hasty we will wait and rise together with other garrisons and with the fleet the men seemed all to have learned well their lesson of restraint from the workers of the military organization for i knew absolutely that this was what they had been instilling into the kronstadt garrison for weeks by ten o'clock i was satisfied that kronstadt would remain serene for the present there was no indication whatever of movement anywhere on the part of either sailors or soldiers returning to the quay i found the regular ferry-boat running to oriambom as usual i boarded the one which left at ten thirty we were delayed a few minutes at starting by a brawling sailor this was the only enlivening incident i had witnessed midway to the mainland a searchlight on a warship which had just crept in close to kronstadt began sweeping the water round and round now slowly now fast now near now far once the great white path caught our little boat and fastened upon us then it turned and flashed toward the sea the night was wonderful still and calm with a clear sky and brilliant stars above and a soft summer breeze drifting pleasantly across the distant waters of the gulf perfect peace seemed to brood over kronstadt when the circling searchlight fell upon the grim fortress walls they stood out in frowning silence which seemed set and lasting like eternal verities great hopes of struggling men and all things which endure i vaguely framed the telegrams i had promised to send for other correspondents according to the cooperative arrangements made under the stress of many points of interest simultaneously claiming attention telegrams to london to paris and berlin their substance was kronstadt promises to remain quiet for the present although ships flying red flags will meet with no hostile reception we were twenty minutes in crossing we had not fairly landed when the great guns of kronstadt boomed and the mutiny was on inasmuch as i was nearer to it than any one else i believe i was the most surprised unless perchance the very men who took part in the affair the kronstadt uprising of august nineteen o six was a bolt from the blue to the men who participated to the workers of the military organization and to everyone who was supposedly familiar with the situation there the flashlight from the warship playing on the fortress seemed a sort of confirmation of this the explanation throws a white light on the question why the army does not rise just before the departure of the boat for oriambom a telegram had been received by the central committee of the military organization the wires having been interrupted for some time the arrival of this telegram was accepted as evidence that the lines were in friendly hands the telegram purported to be from helsingfors it stated that sveborg was captured and also rival that sebastopol would presently fall further two warships in the hands of the revolutionists were at that moment on the way from helsingfors to kronstadt and would arrive about daylight in the meantime kronstadt must rise so as to be in the hands of the revolutionists when the ships arrived in the morning this meant immediate action a small number of sappers and miners were gathered together and certain outer batteries captured two heavy shells were fired and these guns signalled the garrison to rise the sappers and miners were soon reinforced by artillerymen and sailors but nearly all of these were unarmed having had their arms taken from them a few days before they therefore advanced upon the arsenal 
on the way the officers quarters were invaded and six officers killed including an admiral the arsenal was captured against small resistance and the men rushed upstairs to where the guns were stored they pulled the doors from the gun cases and then for the first time suspected that the telegram and the whole signal to rise was a hoax the guns were there but the locks had all been removed unarmed sailors are no better than an unarmed mob when the mutineers poured out into the street from the arsenal they were received by a regiment of loyal troops brought down from peterhof that very afternoon and now hurried into action they poured volley after volley into the men coming out of the arsenal there was some bayonet fighting but the rattle of gatling guns speedily forced a surrender the actual casualties of this night will never be known they cannot be reckoned from without and the government will not disclose the figures horrible scenes followed the slaughter bodies of the dead were pitched into the sea and with them some wounded who still lived one or two of these survived being carried by the current across the narrow stretch of water to the mainland and there washed ashore several hundred arrests followed a duma deputy named anipko a member of the group of toil was taken on this occasion and with him my friend paul i could never learn why these two were not executed but instead they were both sent to siberia a few days later there were nineteen men shot twelve sent to hard labor for life one hundred and twenty others to the mines for varying terms and four hundred and twenty-nine to prison these five hundred and eighty men together with those killed outright were supposed to be the leading members of the military organization in kronstadt at the time doubtless they were a regime of repression was naturally promptly established every time there is an incipient mutiny there is a renewal of oppression again and again during the last few years have mutinies like the kronstadt affair been precipitated by the government and always with results as disastrous to the men as satisfactory to the government the fact that the army does not rise is no indication at all that the men are loyal to the czar as a whole they are not the difficulty comes in their not being able to rise simultaneously and in their inability to save their leaders from execution or exile long enough to lead them into battle the failure of kronstadt of sveborg and of rival did not make any appreciable impression upon the men more of the best leaders were taken a few hundred more lives given up but the spirit of unrest remained the hugeness of russia makes the revolutionary movement unwieldy every man or woman who is educated or who shows liberal tendencies is liable to be marked and at the first opportunity reasonable or unreasonable clapped into prison or exiled the best disciplined army in the world would fall asunder if practically all of the officers were suddenly snatched away it is only the great underlying principle of the revolution which now moves the masses on the reign of anarchy which threatens russia today is a far more terrible menace than the bloodiest revolution fought out on a civil war basis when a whole people become utterly lawless each man striking blindly and all striking the result is chaos for the time being the existing weak government is rapidly bringing russia to this for the government while able to demoralize the ranks of revolution is yet unable to administer to rule or to guide the great mass of the people are against the government many especially of the middle classes are silent because they dare not openly fight but the very moment the tide of success turns into the channels of the revolutionists the ranks of the government's enemies will swell enormously the number of people all over the country who are as it were on the fence who will join the revolution as soon as the propitious moment seems to have arrived is inestimably large so it is with the army the percentage of the men favorable to revolution is large but for their own neck's sake they refrain from premature revolt 
when the wave of success finally sweeps high over the existing order the army will turn by regiments and brigades the officers know this perfectly well and are straining every resource to put off the day when this cataclysm will overtake them but it is coming as surely as night follows day discipline in the army is such that it can be stayed but it cannot be ultimately avoided men now have no other alternative than to obey for example when an execution is to take place and there is the slightest doubt about the soldiers who are to do the shooting a file of infantry are ranged at a given spot directly behind the soldiers a file of say marines directly behind these again a file of cossacks the command is given to the front rank to fire every man whose gun doesn't go off is shot by the man behind him if any man in the second rank fails the cossacks in the rear who can always be depended upon shoot paul and pasha and all of the other ardent men and women whom i saw working in kronstadt in june were either killed imprisoned or exiled in august but by september there were other pauls other pashas established in kronstadt working just as earnestly and fearlessly and just as hopeful of the ultimate outcome they all believe in this revolution with the same gloriously blind faith for they recognize revolution as the inevitable result of the anachronous and rotten social economic and political conditions which have for so long sapped the vitality of russia End of chapter 11. Section 16 of The Red Rain The True Story of a Year in Russia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rita Boutros. The Red Rain, The True Story of a Year in Russia, by Kellogg Durland. Chapter 12, Part 1. Governmental Terrorism. The sixth week of the Duma session, a pogrom, or massacre, was instigated in the town of Bielostok in Grodno, on the edge of Poland. I hurried to the scene as fast as I could, arriving shortly after the slaughter had ceased, and before the wreckage and debris had been cleared from the streets my train was late bielostok was wrapped in midnight quiet when i alighted at the station the first impression was that i had been set down in the midst of an armed camp soldiers were bivouacked in and around the station a little bridge a few hundred yards down the line was held by a force of fighting strength sentinels patrolled the deserted streets the station lies a mile or more outside of the town, and as I had not been there before, I at once engaged a man to guide me to the center of the town, where I might find a place to sleep. There was not a cab anywhere. We trudged through arbored, deserted streets, turning out for piles of wreckage, and sometimes jumping over obstructions. Suddenly my escort stopped short with an exclamation. "'What is wrong?' I inquired." the fellow began to blubber. It was not till I had coaxed him several minutes that he was finally able to blurt out, It was at this very spot that they killed our schoolmaster. Who did it? I asked. Three gendarmes. I stood right there. And he pointed to the middle of the road. The teacher was coming along the street, annoying no one. Then three gendarmes appeared and caught hold of him and began pounding nails into his head. The next day I secured a photograph of the man's corpse, with the nails still in the skull. The evening of the first night of the massacre, the police gave to the world the report that a Jew had thrown a bomb into a religious procession, and for the moment the world believed this. As a matter of fact, according to the unanimous testimony of the townspeople and the report of the investigating committee, no bomb was thrown in the whole town on the day of the religious fete, and no Jew in any way disturbed the procession. This was an out-and-out -out fabrication of the police who inaugurated the massacre designed to protect themselves. 
The first man wounded told me with his own lips what actually transpired. He was standing by the bedside of his wife, who had that hour given birth to a child. Hearing a procession passing the house, he stepped to the window to look out. A soldier deliberately raised his rifle and fired at him, the bullet hitting him in the shoulder. That shot was the signal for the beginning of the massacre, which continued in the shape of a murderous riot for three days. Not a hand was raised during these three days to put a stop to the deeds of horror, although the governor of the province knew about it and had at his disposal troops sufficient to quell a dozen such affairs. The police led in the massacre, assisted by the flotsam and jetsam of the town, known as the Black Hundred, while the military acquiesced by refraining from interference. As I passed one cot in the hospital, a voice called to me in broken English, "'You speak English?' I turned in surprise and saw a man of about middle age, almost wholly swathed in bandages. "'How do you come to know English?' I inquired." "'I lived five years in London,' he answered, adding quickly. "'Do you want to know what happened to me?' I told him I did. "'Well, you see, I had worked hard and saved five hundred rubles, two hundred and fifty dollars, and I thought I would take my family to America. I went to Warsaw to buy the tickets. I was coming back with the tickets in my pocket. I got off the train at Bielostok and saw a crowd coming down the street.' I did not know what it was, but I was not frightened. Then, all of a sudden, the man with the cross came at me and began to beat me, and that is all I remember. I wondered what the man with the cross could mean, and the hospital surgeon explained that the man who marched before the religious procession carried a gold cross with an image of the crucified Christ upon it, and that sacred symbol was used as a weapon of butchery and death, among all civilized nations, hospitals are respected, even in war times. But the gendarmes stood before the Bielostok Hospital, and deliberately poured volley after volley into it, with no other object, apparently, than to throw the patients into a panic. Some of them threw themselves under the beds, others climbed up the chimneys. One man remained three days in a chimney and then dropped down through the exhaustion of hunger. When the firing upon the hospital ceased, a gendarme entered the hospital and asked if one of the doctors would come into the street to attend to some wounded men. A felcher, a doctor's assistant, gathered some bandages and antiseptics together and hastened out of the hospital yard. As he passed through the gateway, a gendarme shot him, he lay dead where he fell until night. A young boy of twelve, whose face had been slashed with a sword, told me how the police had carried him to the local gendarmerie after he had been cut down with the saber stroke. He recovered consciousness shortly, and, not being seriously hurt, was perfectly able to walk home. Instead of permitting this, the gendarmes threw him into a cart and then piled a number of corpses above him, and sent him out to where the dead were being buried. The gravediggers were compassionate and allowed him to escape. The story of Bielostok is the story of nearly every massacre of recent years in Russia that has been inaugurated by local authorities, with or without the connivance of higher authorities in St. Petersburg. From Bielostok I ran over to Vilna, the old Lithuanian capital, picturesquely situated on the river Vilia. Immediately after the Bielostok pogrom, the Vilna police circulated the rumor that on Sunday there would be a massacre of the Jews in Vilna. On Sunday the rumor was corrected. The massacre was set for Tuesday. On Tuesday it was put off till Thursday and for two weeks and a half the jews of vilna lived in a state of perpetual panic those who could fled the city but the most were imprisoned there through their poverty governmental terrorism in one form or another is employed by russia to terrify the people of a given locality into submitting to certain impositions 
or to quiet seditious gossip or to coerce the people into voting for a duma deputy whom they disapprove of but who is the representative of the government in russia no official of the government can be prosecuted at law without the approval of his official superiors the prosecution of an official is popularly supposed to threaten the prestige of the emperor consequently any prosecution is very rare the right of the emperor to promulgate exceptional laws which take precedence over all other laws in the empire reduces to an absurdity every form of law-making in russia the right of the emperor to place a certain official in supreme command of a given locality removing him for the time without the pale of all civil and military authority makes possible the greatest abuses which culminate from time to time in organized massacres these massacres are sometimes arranged by the police and the gendarmes as in bielostock sometimes by a single official sometimes by the organization of the black hundred as at odessa there are famous instances when massacres have been secretly planned by local authorities with the knowledge and consent of st petersburg general trepov's attitude of tacit consent and approval is well known the complicity of the russian government in massacres and other barbarities that are periodically visited upon the russian people is familiar to most people in europe but america seems very reluctant to accept the facts we are loath to believe that a government having dealings with civilized nations does condone the monstrous crimes which incontrovertibly do belong to russia a volume of evidence on this issue could easily be prepared my present task is to tell of the things i saw with my own eyes and the things i learned from unimpeachable sources recognizing however the seriousness of these charges i feel justified in appending enough citations to official and authoritative reports to adequately support my most condemnatory statements senator turau an official investigator for the government in reporting upon one of the kiev pogroms stated that for purposes of defense the troops stationed in the city had been assigned to the four quarters of the town yet the pogrom lasted for three days he goes on to state and stopped only when all jewish shops and many jewish houses had been ransacked the police were almost entirely absent the troops walked slowly down the middle of the street while robbery was proceeding on both sides of them when private persons or officials asked for help from the troops the answer was always we have no orders even the vice-governor rafaleski though in uniform had this answer from a squad of cossacks generally a shop already ransacked was guarded by a sentinel who thought it his duty to stand there paying no attention to the pillage which was going on all around him a bystander and a policeman were told by soldiers that they were only ordered to go up and down the street one soldier said to a law official we are ordered not to mix with the crowd a policeman appealed to a patrol which was watching the pillage of a shop they replied we are ordered to see that there is no fighting and that no russians are hurt some cossacks told a policeman we are here that no one may fire on the pillagers from the windows and balconies and that they may not quarrel among themselves a crown lawyer asked some policemen why they did not take stolen goods from the pillagers they answered now it is impossible as the authorities are against it an officer of the reserve saw robbers with knives literally cutting up two jews ten yards away stood a squadron of cavalry looking on quietly and not moving a step to stop the pogrom was possible without special effort the very soldiers who refused to break their oath that is to stop the pogrom on the very next day obeying orders fired on the pillagers and arrested them the pillagers then asked where were you before why didn't you shoot when the emperor's pictures were torn down 
according to numerous eye-witnesses including officials some of the policemen and soldiers joined in the robbing and seized goods many ex-soldiers in uniform took an active part a lieutenant of artillery was leading the robbers on the haymarket police captain lyashchenko and his assistant pirozhkov were in charge of the ward in which most of the sacking took place these two says a lieutenant of the reserves were present during the pillage and took no measures though policemen and patrols were close at hand some say that on october thirty first they shouted hit the jews and rob them two witnesses assert that pirozhkov directed the robbers against a certain shop major general bezonov was in charge of the second district in which nearly all the outrages took place he stood nearly all the time in the square before the town hall quietly looking on and taking no measures you may wreck he said to those near him but you may not rob the pillagers shouted hurrah and cheered the general a shop near the town hall was being sacked a detachment of troops stood looking on bezonov joined them when asked to interfere he remarked that he would not allow force to be used against the pillagers and remained a cold-blooded spectator of the scene evidence of a crown lawyer the chief secretary of the governor-general said to him your excellency there is a pogrom no measures are being taken how will you order me to understand this what pogrom said the general it is a demonstration a woman picked up a cloth thrown from a window do you call that robbery said besonov why it's a find on november first two detectives heard him make a speech to the pillagers boys he said you have already hit the jews enough you have shown that the russian people know how to stand up for its czar enough of rioting if you go on wrecking to-morrow then we will use force the robbers shouted hurrah and set about making the best use of their time on that day general Karas summoned him and warned him for the last time that he must carry out orders and act with decision the next day the pogrom was easily stopped simultaneously with this pogrom in kiev was another in odessa carried out along parallel lines end of chapter twelve part one section seventeen of the red rain the true story of a year in russia this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rita Boutros. The Red Rain, The True Story of a Year in Russia by Kellogg Durland. Chapter 12, Part 2. In both of these cases, the Jews were the chief victims. It must be remembered that the Jewish question in Russia is the greatest governmental red herring in history. Whenever a really vital and serious question comes up, the government diverts public attention to the Jewish question. But the Jews are by no means the only victims. It will be recalled that in the Caucasus the Armenians are the sufferers, while from time to time in the interior of Russia and in Siberia pure Russians have been massacred as in samara on the volga where there was a massacre of intellectuals in the autumn of nineteen o five in january nineteen o six the gomel pogrom occurred in connection with this affair a secret press for the printing of incitements to violence was discovered in the chief gendarme's office a similar press was unearthed in the central police department at st petersburg prince urosov who was assistant minister of interior under wit described this discovery in the course of a speech in the first duma a speech which was probably the most important single speech made during the brief life of russia's first representative assembly he said 
in january nineteen o six one of the persons occupying a subordinate position in the ministry began to receive a large quantity of specimen appeals and also anxious protests against the organizing of massacres in vilna bielstock kiev nikolaev alexandrovsk and other towns he used every means to avert any further massacres which he also succeeded in doing at this time some light though still of an imperfect nature was thrown on the work of the artificers of massacres a group of persons composing a kind of fighting organization of one of our patriotic clubs together with some who were in close touch with the editors of a newspaper not in st petersburg undertook to combat revolution the russian population of the frontiers and in particular russian soldiers were invited to settle accounts with the traders in tens of thousands of appeals with the most agitating contents there were strange results if one thinks of the preservation of the unity of authority an assistant police master i merely give an example circulates the appeals without the knowledge of his chief or again a police captain let us say of the first ward was considered worthy of a confidence which was denied to the police captain of the second ward some one serving in the gendarme's office or in the defence section proved to be supplied with special sums of money to him certain of the lower people began to resort frightened inhabitants went to see the governor telegrams from the ministry spoke of measures to be taken to secure tranquillity and such measures were often taken in some cases the police quite earnestly supposed that the measures were taken simply for show for decency but that they were already acquainted with the real intention of the government they read between the lines and thought that they heard beyond the order of the governor some voice from far off in which they had greater belief in a word the authorities became completely demoralized meanwhile in st petersburg as early as the autumn of nineteen o five and it would seem before the october ministry came into office in number sixteen fontanka in some remote room of the police department a printing press was at work it had been purchased for the department by government money this press was put under the control of an officer of gendarmes in civil dress one commissarov who with a few assistants assiduously prepared the appeals to which i have alluded the secret of the existence of this underground press was so carefully kept and the conduct of its organizers was so conspirative that not only in the ministry but even in the police department there were but few persons who knew about it meanwhile the work of the union of russian men whose organ the press was was already meeting with success for when questioned by a person who happened to come upon the track of this organization Komisarov answered a massacre we can make for you of any kind you please if you like for ten men and if you like for ten thousand i may add that in kiev a massacre for ten thousand was arranged for february twentieth but it was successfully prevented the president of the council of ministers count wit had we are told a serious attack of nervous asthma when the facts i have just narrated were communicated to him he summoned Komisarov, who reported to him on what he had done, and on the full powers which he had received. In a few hours the department no longer contained either the press or the appeals or the staff. There was left only an empty room. Why did not Count Wit expose Komisarov? Who can estimate the value to the government of a good Komisarov trial? but count wit knew that he could not take this line and retain his place he did not dare to combat influences which were more powerful than his own 
M. de Novo, who, reactionary as he was, confessed to Prince Yurosov that this was not his way, was equally impotent. Komisarov, who had received a decoration, was quite recently living at large under an assumed name. Prince Yurosov resigned office to become the assailant of the policy of massacre as a member of the Imperial Duma. The ordinary bureaucratic comment on his speech was that Prince Yurosov had betrayed government secrets. General Tripov said, on July 9th, to a representative of Reuters' agency, Il menti et c'est tout. But the prince did not speak at random. His speech was founded on intimate knowledge, not only of the government reports already quoted, but of other documents equally important. It matters little how much high officials of the Russian government in St. Petersburg and diplomatic representatives abroad deny governmental responsibility in regard to massacres, so long as there is abundant evidence of the guilt of lesser officials, and these are allowed to go unpunished. The maximum rebuke that is usually visited upon any particularly conspicuous pogromchik is temporary suspension, or transfer from one post to another, sometimes with advance in rank, sometimes with advance in pay, sometimes both. Governmental terrorism, however, does not cease with the massacres. Individuals are assassinated at official instigation, precisely as the terrorists select a bureaucrat or official for removal. A notable instance of this was that of Professor Herzenstein, a dignified and honored professor in the University of Moscow. Mr. Herzenstein had given a great deal of attention to the agrarian question in Russia during twenty years or more. His counsel and advice guided the members of the First Duma when they were framing their agrarian program. Late one afternoon, Professor Paul Milyukov, who was then editor of the Wretch, received word from Moscow by telegram that a semi-official Moscow newspaper, just published, contained an account of the mysterious murder of Professor Herzenstein near his summer home in Terioki, Finland. No one could be found in St. Petersburg who knew of it, so Professor Melyukov dispatched a messenger to Finland to investigate. Professor Herzenstein, while walking in his garden with his daughter, was fatally shot that night at a little before nine o'clock, or three hours after the governmental newspaper in Moscow had announced his murder. The next morning, the wretch printed a concise statement of the facts, and the police instantly seized the entire edition. Several weeks later, it developed that the assassin was an ex-gendarme officer who was paid to do away with the one man whom intellectual Russia trusted to bring them through the thicket of the agrarian tangle. Another famous instance was that of a prominent Moscow physician named Vorobiev. About the time of the Moscow insurrection, Vorobiev's house was entered by a party of police commanded by an ex-guards officer called Ermolev. Ermolev accused Vorobiev of treating revolutionaries. "'I am not a politician,' replied the doctor. "'I am a physician, a surgeon, and as such I do what I can for whoever is brought to me without regard to political belief.' "'Have you a revolver in the house?' inquired the police officer. "'Yes,' said the doctor, "'and I also have a government permit to own it and to carry it.' "'Where is it?' demanded the officer. "'In the drawer of my desk. Get it.' The doctor turned to obey, and the officer shot him in the back of the head. "'Oh, what have you done?' cried the doctor's wife as she saw her husband fall. "'Hold your tongue and wipe up that mess on the floor,' retorted the officer, as he turned to withdraw his party. Owing to the outcry that was raised against this wanton murder, the officer was arrested, but after a fortnight's detention he was released. 
The most cruel tortures are applied to prisoners in more than one Russian prison, but I think that during my year in the country I learned of no darker deeds than those perpetrated by the chief of the secret police in Warsaw, a man named Victor Green, a literal translation from the Russian. Green became dissatisfied with the number of arrests that were being made in the old Polish capital, so he ordered the arrest of many innocent men and women, and then had them tortured to wring from them confessions implicating other people. I heard of his applying the most excruciating torture to young girls as well as to mere boys. A Russian writer named Vladimirov went to Warsaw shortly after my visit to investigate the case of a girl of eighteen, concerning whom certain terrible reports were then circulating. The following is a translation of his report on this case. A young man named Rotkopf, a citizen of Riga, went to visit a friend who lived, as most Russians live in the larger cities, in an apartment house containing a number of families. Now, most unfortunately for Rotkopf, just before his visit, a bomb had been found by the police, secreted in one of the flats. Suspicion pointed to Rotkopf's friend, he was promptly arrested, and as a friend of the suspected man, Rotkopf was arrested also. Rotkopf had a sister, a young girl of eighteen. She, one must remember, had committed no crime. No such charge was brought against her, but she was a sister of a friend of a suspected man, and that was enough for the police. The very evening of her brother's arrest, she went out to drink tea with some friends, in company with her younger brother. The police descended upon the house, and she was arrested without even a chance to change her evening clothes, or to take linen along. She did not even know why she was imprisoned, or of what crime the zealous police suspected her. She was put in a solitary cell in a secret apartment of the Warsaw Citadel. A sentinel was placed within— the cell was bare, with the exception of a stool and a small table. There was no bed. The bare stone floor was meant for a sleeping place. The sudden transition from the cheerful company of friends into the severe and gloomy surroundings of the dungeon stunned the girl. She comprehended nothing for quite a while. She sat in a corner of the cell, lost in thought, from this condition she was suddenly awakened by the indifferent voice of the sentinel. "'Wake up! You will soon be taken to be tortured.' Suddenly the cell door opened, the chief inspector entered, said a few words to the guard, and she was led through a number of poorly lit corridors and into a small room, where an oil lamp was feebly flickering. "'Listen attentively, and you will understand,' said the guard rudely, as he left the room, and bolted the door. A deathly silence reigned in the room. She tried to catch the least sound, the least motion, to discern the least token of life, but all was still as the grave. Suddenly she heard some voices in the adjacent room, and through the thin partition she could distinctly hear all that was spoken there. She felt her heart sink within her, as, among many other voices, she recognized her brother's voice. Then there was the sound of a heavy blow, a thud from the falling of a human body, and her brother's outcry. Her heart was beating fast. She understood that she was alongside of the torture chamber, where her brother was brought in to be tortured, and that she was put there in order to be tortured by the pangs and sufferings of her dearly beloved brother. Then fell in quick succession a number of heavy blows, followed by his desperate outcries. The pain must have been unbearable. He seemed to be gasping for breath. His tormentors did not stop, however, but continued beating him for a long time. The blows fell thick and heavy, and his outcries turned into desperate screams, into wild, heartbreaking sounds of one losing his reason under the influence of terrible pain. And the poor girl had to hear it all, and to know that she was powerless to stay the hands of his tormentors. Finally the cries ceased. Were the hangman tired, or was her brother dead? 
her heart full of anguish she pressed her ear against the partition in an effort to catch the least sound of his voice at that moment one of the executioners entered the room and she began begging him to tell her what had become of her brother was he alive why was he tortured what for but it was in vain to expect human feeling in a hangman could the suffering of a young girl touch his heart to her beseeching he replied rudely laughing if you will not inform us all about your brother and the rest of your friends the same will be done to you then you will find out what became of him and whether he is still alive he then ordered her to follow him and she was led back into her former cell where she was left to pass the night on the bare floor but she did not close her eyes the whole night in a dull stupor thoughtless motionless she sat in a corner till morning the guard was all the time within never for a moment leaving her in the morning some black bread and water was brought to her no other food through the whole day but she could not touch a mouthful as soon as night came on she was again taken into the room where she had been the previous night and again she had to live through the same horrors of the past night for many hours of horror she heard almost continually the screams and sobs of her brother these sobs rent the poor girl's soul after her brother's cries she heard others she heard the sobs of another man and instinctively recognized the voice of a dear friend a man whom she knew well and who was very near to her that was the second night the third night she was again taken to listen to the sobs of the tortured but that night she remembers as a horrible nightmare which she could not distinguish from reality she did not hear her brother's cries any more others of her friends were being tortured she felt that she was losing her reason and she wished for death the fourth night she was again taken into this room the chief executioner organizer and director of these tortures green came in and proposed that she inform him about her brother and confess all her own crimes but what crimes she had done nothing criminal she is still so young she knows nothing criminal either of her brother or of her other friends what could she confess upon getting her negative answer she was led into the adjacent room from which those screams had come forth the preceding nights it was a small room with two windows in the centre stood a table on it were wooden and rubber canes there was a gendarme officer ivanov with ten secret police agents many held canes in their hands the young girl was seized and put flat on the table face down four of the detectives grabbed her hands and feet and the others that were armed with canes began to beat her at the command of officer ivanov the blows fell heavily striking over the head back and legs she was beaten till she nearly lost consciousness but not a sound escaped her Getting tired in their monstrous work, the executioners stopped when she became motionless. She looked like a corpse with eyes closed, lips pressed tightly together, not a muscle moving. Nothing betrayed signs of life. She was in a deep faint. Green ordered some cold water to be sprinkled on her, and she began to come to. She was then given a glass of cold water and told to confess and tell about her brother. But for the sake of Christ, what shall I confess? I have done nothing criminal. I am not guilty of anything, feebly murmured the girl. And in answer to that came the command of the officer, Give it to her, boys, give it to her. And they resumed their diabolic work. In moments when the pain was terrible, she would scream aloud. At times she would bite the edge of the wooden table, pressing her teeth hard together in the effort not to cry out. The pains were awful. The executioners had turned into cruel beasts as if they were wild animals instead of human beings possessing heart and soul. That night she was beaten till dawn with interruptions as she fainted frequently. Every time she regained consciousness, the same question was put to her by the officer, whether she was willing to confess, 
and every time that he got her negative answer he became more furious. At dawn she was carried into her cell and dropped on the floor in a semi-conscious condition. During the day she regained consciousness. Every part of her body ached. She could not bend her joints. The bruised parts became pitifully swollen. The red and blue marks began to fester, making the slightest motion very painful. The next night she was again carried into the torture room and stretched out on the table. The executioners were already at their posts awaiting their victim. The subordinate officer Ivanov repeated the question, and getting no answer, ordered his men to strike her, exclaiming in his rage that he would make that obstinate girl confess all. Then Green gave orders to pinch her naked body in the contused spots, which was especially painful because of the festering and swelling. She could not stand the pain any longer, and her wild cries filled the room. The almost unbearable agony seemed to rob her of her senses. Other executioners were, in the meanwhile, striking her with canes over her head, her abdomen, the fingers, and toes. The blows caused blood to ooze out through the skin in some places, and her shirt was stained with it. Some of her teeth were knocked out by blows over her face, and tufts of hair were pulled out by blows on the head, causing indescribable pain. That lasted the whole night long. The third night she was again taken into the torture room, as she stubbornly refused to calumniate anybody and she was beaten as on the previous nights. Then Green bethought himself of new ways of torture, and ordered the eleven men to surround the prostrate girl and beat her over the abdomen. The blows then rained fast, but not very hard on the abdomen exclusively. This immediately caused her to vomit. On the fourth night she was also beaten. She was weak and faint. It seemed to her that she was dying. Had she not been a girl with a splendid constitution, she could never have lived through this long-continued torture. The blows were raining fast. The fiends pinched her and pulled her hair. Suddenly Green ordered his men to stop, and for a few minutes she was left to lie quietly on the table. Then she was dragged on the floor and put on her back. Her executioners began kicking her with their boots. They stamped on her chest, on her abdomen, they trampled on her face. She bled from the mouth. She did not cry out. She had no more strength. She seemed silently dying. End of chapter 12, part 2All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rita Boutros. The Red Rain, The True Story of a Year in Russia by Kellogg Darland. Chapter 12, Part 3. In this condition, she was taken back into her cell, and the prison felcher, nurse and orderly, was called to her. Her face presented a shapeless mass of red and blue bruises. The eyes were closed by an enormous swelling. The cheeks, chin, and mouth were a big bruised mass. For two months she hovered between life and death, but youth conquered, and she slowly began to recover. At the end of two months she began to walk a little. All this time no one was admitted to her, as the government was afraid to let her relatives see her in the condition she was in. That was to be kept a secret, not to escape from the prison walls into the outer world, so it would not cause any stir, as did Spirodinova's case. An acquaintance of the writers met her after six months had elapsed in a northern prison, where she had been taken when she began to walk a little. This acquaintance gave his impression of her. At the first moment he thought that she was an elderly woman with an enormously large face of indefinitely outlined features. The face was pale except where covered with red and bluish spots. But her eyes, her eyes spoke for themselves. 
Looking into them, he was dumbfounded. There was so much suffering, so much sadness in those eyes. He understood that this old woman must have lived through some great calamity in life, something enormous, some disaster that is beyond human endurance. He tried to engage her in conversation. He learned then what this seemingly elderly woman had gone through. She was aged not by years, but by unbelievable tortures. She is not an elderly woman, but a young beautiful girl who has been maimed and broken by suffering. She told with tears in her eyes that her brother was shot after being tortured, without having gone through any form of trial, solely upon the behest of Governor General Scallon. A few months after this, Victor Green was assassinated. If there were any tribunal in Russia to whom appeal against an official of this stamp could be carried, the so-called terrorist would never have been called into existence. In America, I frequently have it said to me, the Russian revolutionists who are guilty of murder and assassination do more than anything else to injure the cause of liberty in their country. Their deeds are veritably the sowing of dragon's teeth of hate and murder. But fairly, on the testimony, who sows the dragon's teeth? Is it the man who checks the career of a monstrous creature like Green? Is it the murderous official himself? Or is it the government and the police and other officials of the Tsar? Pasha was taken one afternoon in July. Her family had persuaded her to go abroad for the summer. So with her mother she started for Switzerland. They traveled to St. Petersburg from Moscow and were to take the Berlin train late one afternoon. About two o'clock that afternoon, Pasha ran over to the office of a certain newspaper to bid a friend good-bye. Suddenly the police appeared. The office was surrounded, and everyone who chanced to be there at the time was marched off to prison. The mother awaited the return of her daughter with impatience that soon became alarm. Train time came and passed. About dusk a party of gendarmes appeared at the house where they had been stopping, and informed Madame of Pasha's arrest. Then they ransacked the house. The only evidence found was a copy of my notes on my interview with Marie Spiridonova, which Pasha had borrowed. Incidentally, during the course of the search, Pasha's gold watch and chain, which had been lying on the bureau, disappeared. While there were really serious charges against Pasha, these were all registered against her conspirative name. Consequently, no definite charge of any kind was known against her at the time of this arrest. Merely on the strength of her having been in the newspaper office, she was kept on suspicion. Later developments in her case are not germane to the moment. She was put into a cell with a number of other women to await trial. One Sunday afternoon an incident occurred in this cell which aroused wide interest, and Pasha, knowing that I would want an accurate account of the affair, managed to write and have smuggled out to me a graphic letter. The only necessary word of explanation concerns the time-worn custom observed in Russian prisons of allowing political prisoners to receive donations of food one day a week from their friends which recipients share with their less fortunate comrades in the particular prison where pasha was incarcerated there was a group of men politicals in a room directly over the women when the women were ready to divide their contributions with the men they generally rapped on the ceiling with a broom or mop handle and the men would drop a cord out of their window so that it would dangle in front of one of the windows of the women's room Pasha's account of what is now known as the Semenova tragedy, Semenova being the name of one of the other women confined in the prison, is as follows. I give her own words. On Sunday after six o'clock, Semenova came to the center window. She tapped on the ceiling with the mop stick for the men of the room above to drop the string, the telephone, they called it. The package with tea, sugar, and tobacco was on the window sill. Some women were standing near Semenova. Others, I among them, were sitting at the table drinking tea. One was walking up and down. We were sixteen in the room, which made it very crowded. 
I saw the string drop, and several hands go through the bars to hold it. But the winds blow it from them, and then suddenly it was jerked up. Samanova sat sideways on the window sill, her left side toward the window, and her left hand supported her head. She seemed to be waiting for the telephone to be dropped for the second time. A few seconds later, a shot rang out. I saw a small puff of yellow smoke. Samanova's head dropped strangely. My heart stood still. Can it be? But I saw that the group at the window moved, and no one seemed wounded. I ran to them in the hope that I was mistaken. Meanwhile, one who was standing near her took Semenova and laid her down on the floor with the words, She is killed. One of the prisoners, who was a felcher, felt her pulse, but with a gesture of hopelessness turned aside. Semenova's eyes were glazed, and blood flowed from her head. I could not desert her. It seemed to me she still felt, and I could not leave her alone. A general uproar arose in the room, and the women cried and shrieked, Doctor! Doctor! Then the room suddenly became empty. Someone poured water on Semenova's head. A felcher came in, examined her, and said, Her skull is fractured. We lifted her up and placed her on a cot. I did not believe her dead, and thought she still suffered. When the doctor came in, he said death had been instantaneous. The bullet entered the left temple and came out through the forehead, because she had been sitting with her head a little bent, leaning it on her left hand. Her back had been turned to the soldier who was pointing at her. When I saw she was dead, I went to the window and cried to the soldier, "'Murderer! You have killed a human being!' He pointed at me, but I jumped back before he had time to fire." The same thing happened to the others who attempted to approach the window. We ran to the gate, which acted as a door between our room and the hallway, and behind which were amassed a pack of overseers and cried, "'Murderers, will you shoot us all?' One of them, with an impudent laugh, said, "'Well, why did she sit on the window sill? Later someone, I don't know who, said that the soldier had received the order not to shoot any more. I learned from others what happened outside of the rooms. The women ran to the gate with cries of, Doctor! A woman overseer opened it because, it seems, she was so bewildered she could not realize what had happened. All ran out into the corridor. There they met the prison director, who was going to our room. A comrade ran up to him and began beating his face with her fists. He was so bewildered that all he could do was to say, I am not guilty, I gave no orders to shoot, and went back, and did not come again to our room. All the officials who came later were without him. The comrade who beat the director was taken by force to the hospital. Later she was allowed back. Our first demand was that Semenova's brother should know what had happened. We gave them his address, but we knew later they did not do it. We asserted that without her brother, and without the court officials, we would not give up the body, and we waited for the coroner and procurer. The prison inspector came, but went away soon. We were seventeen besides the dead in the room now, because two from the hospital had come also. The overseers wanted to drag them back. Imagine a large high room lighted by one lamp. On the cot, the body with bloody head and glazed eyes covered with a sheet. Near the cot, on the floor where she had been lying, was a pool of blood. Many of us had blood on our hands and dresses. Some were annoyed by the light, and the lamp was covered by a piece of dark cloth. Then others were afraid of the darkness, and after sitting some time in a dark corner, would lose consciousness. Hysterical cries, long faintings, hallucinations— all we lived through that night. The table was covered with bromo, Hoffman drops, ice bags, ammonia, etc. We called the doctor every minute. We were afraid it would not end with one death only. After some hours they cleared a little room in the hospital, and the weakest of us were brought there. At last, about eleven o'clock, the judge of the court and procurer came. While the judge and the doctor were examining the wound, we told the procurer that the brother had not yet been notified. But I can do it, he said. 
After the prison procurer came, he said he would leave it to him, and he sneaked away, because a talk with a dozen outraged and fury-like women could not have been agreeable to anyone. You should have seen these gentlemen placed there in our cage, and forced to hear epithets far from flattering, which were addressed against them and the prison director. Of course, any other time we would have had to pay for this, but in sight of the body, which was still warm, they could not bring themselves to call in the overseer and use force. The procurer told me that all the details noted by the judge of inquiry would be handed over to the military procurer, because the murderer was a soldier. When the judge of inquiry left, the prison procurer and prison inspector remained. They told us that the body would be taken by the police to be buried. We replied that we would give it up only to her brother. We received the answer that that was impossible. The procurer promised to influence the police to let the brother know before the burial, and that the brother would be allowed to see one of us, so that we might be assured that he was at the funeral. However, he seemed frightened of his last promise, and he said, I will come myself to you, and I will tell you about everything. You surely believe me. We don't believe you at all, and we demand to see the brother. They were forced to consent, and one of us was promised to see him. A bear was brought. We put her on it ourselves, and carried her out along the corridor. We wanted to keep her as long as possible from their unclean hands. Someone proposed to sing the funeral march, but our hearts were too heavy. Quietly, quietly, we carried her through the corridor, then downstairs, and there we put her in her coffin. There were packs of overseers in the upper and lower corridors. The scoundrels were waiting for a disturbance. They could not understand that that was far from our hearts. Through the open doorway we saw the police waiting for the coffin. There, too, the ugly face of the prison director hiding from us flashed by. It was about one o'clock at night. We came back to the same room where all that remained of her was a pool of blood. We became terribly depressed, as if we had behaved badly toward her, to give her up without a fight. And no one will know where her grave will be, for we could not believe their promises. However, the next day one of us was called to see the brother. Expecting a lie, she asked him from where he comes, for she knew from Semenova where her birthplace was. He answered correctly. Then she told him the details of the shooting. "'You can't expect justice from them,' he replied. However, he promised to talk with a lawyer about the case. He said that about ten o'clock in the morning he was told to go to the police station. There they told him to go to the monastery of the Alexander Nevsky. He called for a girlfriend of his sister's to go along with him. They were hardly given time to take leave of his sister. He came about ten minutes before the internment. There was an order from the chief of police to hurry with the funeral. At the funeral was a police captain, a sergeant, a gendarme, the brother, and the girl's friend. We brought to the notice of the procurer, number one, that the administration knew for a long time about the existence of the telephone and had never objected, and when we disobeyed a rule of the administration we were always punished. As, for instance, for singing, we were deprived of seeing visitors and receiving things from them. Number two, that at the time of the shooting she was sitting still, which gave the soldier an opportunity to make a good shot. Number three, that he shot into a crowded room, and it was a miracle that others were not killed also. To the last statement the procurer interposed, what might have happened has no importance. Altogether he was impossible. To our demand to give a definite promise that the appointment with the brother would be given, he answered prudently, if nothing particular will interfere. That means... That means if he won't be arrested before, we are all in the hands of God. Do you mean because they killed the sister you will arrest the brother? You did not understand me. I was only speaking of a possibility. I was presupposing. Why do you insist on misunderstanding me? 
we came to such a good understanding that next day the brother was still free. A considerable uproar followed this incident. St. Petersburg newspapers clamored for the court-martial of the soldier who had fired the shot. The man was eventually tried and acquitted. Then the newspapers, echoing public sentiment, declared that the trial was a farce. The matter was not allowed to drop out of sight. One day the regiment to which the soldier belonged was ordered out on parade, and this man's name was called. The letter was then read from the Tsar, announcing that the soldier be rewarded with ten roubles, or five dollars, for having so nobly done his duty. This closed the incident. Governmental terrorism exists throughout the whole gamut of the Russian bureaucracy. Petty police and gendarme officers plan and execute massacres. Soldiers are called upon to stand one side or to assist in the slaughter. Knowledge of these massacres is often known in advance in St. Petersburg, and sometimes they are actually arranged in the offices of the central administration. Premier Stolypin, with his field courts marshal, described in detail in another chapter, has shown himself no more of a humanitarian than Trepov. And in the Semanova incident, the Tsar revealed to the world his intimate familiarity with small incidents. I have no sympathy whatever with the belief that the Tsar does not know what his ministers and officials are doing. If there are details that do not reach him, he alone is at fault. The present emperor is a traditional autocrat. It is my conviction that he acquiesces in, if he does not instigate, massacre and occasional assassination. However much one may deplore terrorism, white or red, one thing stands out clear and true to my mind. Namely, the burden of responsibility lies not with the terrorists of the revolution. Their acts are human, if to be deplored but rather with the infinitely more heinous assassins of the government, who are distinctly inhuman, and most of all upon him who is the ultimate head of the whole governmental terroristic organization, the arch-assassin who, by a word, could end for all time massacre and murder in the Russian Empire, Tsar Nicholas II. End of chapter 12, part 3